Okay, it's generating.
All right. Um, thanks everyone for uh, coming to the workshop on interaction and decision making in autonomous driving. Um, we've got a pretty big day today, um, quite a few speakers, um, with Dorsa, uh, Dorsa, Dorsa kicking it off at uh, nine thirty five. Uh, the the workshop is uh, co-organized um, by Igor and Litting as well in the Zoom session. So if you have any questions during the day, uh, you can ask um, any of us and we'll do our best to um, uh, respond. Uh, we, um, we, we, also, um, uh, we also have some um, sponsorship today for a, a best paper. So uh, NVIDIA Corporation um was uh was happily was, was happy enough to sponsor us so uh there's a there's a best paper pr a prize a titan rtx um which will which litting will announce at the end of the day um the way the way in which uh, uh it'll work today is uh speakers will um present for about 30 minutes and then there'll be about 10 minutes of questions if you have any questions uh during their talk just enter them into the Zoom chat, um, and then we will then go through that Zoom chat um, after the um, after the speaker um, uh, presents their material um, and select uh, select uh, questions from there. Uh, so feel free to write away um, in the Zoom chat questions as the speaker um, uh, maybe says something that you want to ask a question about. Okay, so I think I think we're almost ready to start. Um, I also want to draw your attention to um, so we have the website um, the website here. Um, so we've got the schedule. Something we were going to try during the breaks um, was a little bit of an experiment, but if you scroll down here there's a break room. Um, and so here, what you'll be able to see is a virtual environment uh, with everyone's uh, videos. And it can be a little bit noisy, but if you follow the instructions at the top, uh, you should be able to hear videos that you're interested in and uh, be able to interact with other people. Okay, I think I am going to stop share screening. So um, our first speaker, Dorsa. Will be able to um, share screen. Dorsa, whenever you're ready, um, you are able to share screen. No. Hello. Uh, oh, I am unmuted now. Okay, I couldn't unmute myself. Sorry. <laughs> uh, all right, so perfect. Let me just share a screen then. Uh, great. Yeah, uh, we can we can hear you great. Okay, perfect. Uh, can you guys see my screen too? Yes. Yeah, it looks great. Okay, so let me start. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for inviting me and I'm really excited to be here. This, this sounds like a really fun workshop. So today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk a little bit about planning, learning and prediction in, in near accident driving scenarios. So 
Um, so I really want to focus on these settings where some of our assumptions about human modeling or assumptions in the environment actually fails in specifically in near the end of the risk spectrum or near accident settings and how we should go about planning, learning and predictions in, in those settings. So let me just jump into it. So, so I'm going to focus this talk mainly on autonomous driving. And if you think about the field of autonomous driving, over the past decade, we have seen a lot of advances uh, in, in driving. We like even like a few years back, we didn't have we didn't see any like cars, like autonomous cars on on normal city roads, right? Like they would mostly work on, on highway driving and things of those forms. So it's really exciting to see that these vehicles are finally out there interacting with real people. And, and this was actually something that I was pretty excited about during my PhD too. So, so the way I started working in this domain was from a perspective of control and formal methods. So what I really cared about back in the day was autonomous driving was just becoming a thing at the time. And this was actually the time that people were saying we're going to have autonomous cars by 2020 because 2020 was so far ahead that it was okay to say that. But, but at the time I was thinking, well, if you're going to have autonomous cars by 2020, then there should be a way of giving guarantees about these autonomous cars because we can't put them on a road if, if we don't have any guarantees or if we can't, how, how are we going to like insure them? Like how do insurance companies work if, if they don't have any sort of guarantees of how well these autonomous cars work? So this is like old Dorsa thinking that. And uh, the way I started formalizing this problem was more of a control and reactive synthesis problem, thinking about starting with an objective, thinking about like I need to write out a formal specification, writing out what the objective is and what the environment model is. And then once I have that formal specification, then the question is, can I go ahead and directly synthesize a controller that is guaranteed to satisfy the specification? Can I come up with a provably correct controller for my autonomous car? And I know that sounds really strong and rigid, but would we actually try to attempt this? And then we took different approaches towards it. So one common way of going about it, and we did some work in this domain was starting with a temporal logic specification, then translating that to a bookie automaton and determinizing it. And at the end of the day, you have a game. You have a game between your system, which is your autonomous car, and the environment and everything else that's going on in the environment. And you solve that game. And at the end, you have, you have a strategy and you have a proof with it. That, that's definitely correct. And it is policy that is definitely correct for your autonomous car. So definitely sounds very rigid. Lots of assumptions that go in this box that I'm pushing under the rug in order to like give any sort of guarantees. And one of those assumptions that was bugging me so much was, was basically this idea of there is a human model out there. So, so the way we approached this was we said, well, we have an objective, we have an environment model. We got to have some sort of model of how other cars around us thrive. And with that model, I can give a guarantee. So I like explicitly remember this, we talked to some car companies and they were like, well, you can assume that if your car is driving 60 miles per hour, it's going to stay like with 60 miles per hour. So keep that velocity. That is the model we're going to use for how cars around us are actually going to work. And once you put that model in, then you can give all sorts of guarantees, right? Like then you can say, well, my car is safe because this other car is still going 60 miles per hour and doesn't really pay attention to the fact that there's an autonomous car driving right next to it which seemed a little bit silly to me. So I was like, well, if I wanna be safer, maybe I should have a different type of human model. So, so one other way, one other extreme is assume that humans are adversarial and they're trying to like get you. And, and if you assume human driven cars around you are adversarial, then you don't really have any guarantees. Most of the time, like this approach doesn't really come up with any strategy that is safe because that wouldn't exist. And, and both of these, seemed like extremes to me. And, and it kind of felt like human modeling and then thinking about how cars around us uh, act around us and respond to us is, is the core of the problem here. And we're kind of ignoring it. And, and we're kind of assuming someone comes and gives us that human model and everything will be great. This was, this was, I wasn't alone in this actually. Like I think a lot of other people were thinking the same thing. This was around like 2015 where Google started putting out their cars out in the streets. And in only like a few months, they had 11 accidents. And, and all of these accidents, the Google car was being rear-ended. So of course it wasn't their problem. But, but if you think about it, well, 
one reason that one can, one can argue that these accidents happened was that you're putting this vehicle in a road where you think all the other cars around you are acting like robots and, and you're just driving like a robot would do. And, and humans don't really do that, right? Like humans don't necessarily behave by the book or don't follow all the rules and they can easily coordinate and collaborate with each other. And then the Google car at the time was not, was not really like thinking about that. So this was actually a cartoon like back in the day that I really liked and I felt like it explains the problem so well. And unfortunately, this cartoon is still true. I was driving right by my apartment, like two blocks from my place yesterday, and there was a Waymo car and I had this exact interaction with it. And at some point I was like, I'm going to give up. You're not going. I guess I'm crossing. So, so this is still a big problem, like, like interacting with people. Like we, I think in some sense, like at the beginning of the field of autonomous driving, we undermined it because we assumed that well, I just want to build like this, this awesome car that's really good at prediction and perception and is really good at uh, detecting obstacles and things of that form. And we kind of ignored the fact that, hey, this car needs to interact with real people and you can't really eliminate humans, human drivers or, or pedestrians around you and you actually need to interact with them. This is actually a video of um, a Waymo car that kind of deals with the same problem. Um, this video is a little bit old by now. But here, this Waymo car is actually trying to be interactive. It is, it is signaling, so it is trying to be interactive. It wants to change lanes. It's in an exit lane. But in terms of its motions, it's not doing any sort of interactive behavior. So how would these cars know that, like when this car actually wants to change lanes? And because of that, like the Waymo car needs to exit and come back around and then try again, which is not so great. So, what we decided to do is we decided to actually model these human driven cars around us a little bit more carefully. And I think that perspective is a, is a good perspective. So, so we thought about having, let's say an autonomous car, the orange car on the road and a human driven car where there, there's a human inside it. And this human also has some sort of objective, some sort of goals. And, and we shouldn't treat this human driven car just simply as a moving obstacle. And we should actually worry about like this interaction and how we go about this interaction. So, so we modeled this interaction in a game theoretic fashion. What, what we did was this is work at RSS in 2016. It was a joint work with Anka, Shankar, and Sanjit. Actually, Anka might be talking about this a little bit later today because I saw her title. The title of her talk is about game theoretic uh, autonomous driving. And, and actually, this was like one of the first works that was trying to approach the problem from this game theoretic perspective, where we modeled the interaction as an underactuated dynamical system where we say, well, I have an autonomous car, that's the orange car. And the way I'm gonna go about planning for the autonomous car is I'm going to come up with a policy, AR star, which is the maximizer of some sort of objective for the autonomous car. Very good question to ask is, what is that objective? How do you come up with that objective? We, we thought it is simple. It's actually not simple to think about what that objective should be. And then that objective is normally a function of state and actions, but it should also depend on the actions of the human because the robot, the autonomous car can actually influence people. And, and a very good question to ask again is what does the human do or how does the human act and respond in this setting where you have this interactive setting? Like, like how, would it, how would it drive in such settings? And the way we approach this was we assumed humans are approximately optimizing their own reward function RH. And, and we learned that reward function through inverse reinforcement learning. And there was a lot of work in imitation learning and generally trying to figure out what that reward function or what that policy looks like. So a big assumption here, I'll come back to this assumption later in the talk. But in general, once you have this, this human policy and once you have this robot policy, then you can think about this in, interactive game theoretic approach of the robot influencing the human and the human responding back. And we made a lot of approximations to make that work, including solving this problem as a stack break game. And eventually we got really interactive behaviors. So the exciting part was we ended up getting an autonomous car being able to nudge in in front of other cars and actually make them slow down to change lanes. And this is a very interactive behavior. This is how humans change lanes. So like when you're changing lanes, you're not gonna wait for every single car to pass and then wait for them. At some point you cut in front of people, like kind of like what this white car is doing here. And based on this game theoretic modeling, we ended up getting this behavior, which is really exciting. Like we ended up getting very interactive behavior emerging out of the optimization. So that is great. But I would lie to you 
if I say this interactive behavior is the safest thing you can do in the world. Right? The moment you start taking this assertive action, nudging in front of other, this other person, you're putting yourself in danger. You're, you're actually like reducing your safety because you're becoming closer and closer to these other cars around you. So there's a big trade-off that exists here between safety and everything else, efficiency and comfort and everything else. And, and, and I think that trade-off matters a lot when we are in near accident scenarios and also when you're not in near accident scenarios because we have to take those trade-offs uh, if we want to be more efficient, if we want to be more comfortable, if you want to drive, like if you want to actually use these autonomous cars. So let me, let me just give one more example and then I'll jump into what I'd like to really talk about. Another example that this like type, type of trade-off shows up in is, is not necessarily when you're interacting with people, but even when you're interacting with objects and your environment. So, so this is a plastic bag problem. Um, this is a problem that actually one of my friends who was uh, leading one of the driving autonomous driving groups uh, mentioned this to me a couple of years back. And, and basically he was saying, well, this is a problem that I deal with every day. I can't even get this car like driving in a way that I'm, I'm, I'm able to give guarantees about it and be happy about it. Imagine that you have a plastic bag on a road. If you have a plastic bag on a road, what are you going to do with it? So, so, so one thing that you can do is you can say, well, that is an obstacle. I want to be the safest car on the planet. And if I want to be the safest car on the planet, there is a chance that that, that plastic bag is maybe a person holding a plastic bag that, and is covered by that plastic bag. And because of that, I am going to just slow down every single time I see a plastic bag. And well, if you do that, the, the person who is sitting in the car is actually going to feel nauseous, right? Like it, this is not gonna be very comfortable and this is not gonna work out. The other option is to say, well, that's probably a plastic bag. I'm gonna ignore that plastic bag because it is a plastic bag, right? And in the moment you do that, there could be scenarios, there could be near the end of the risk spectrum scenarios where your car didn't detect it correctly. Maybe it wasn't a plastic bag, it was a person holding a plastic bag. And, and, and because of that, you might end up in fatal crashes as we've already seen a couple of them over the years. So, so that is the problem. The problem is we got to have autonomous cars that are able to balance this trade-off between safety and efficiency. And specifically, again, that becomes really important when you are in near accident scenarios and, and, and is crucial to handle well when you're in near accident scenarios. So I'm not claiming we've solved like all the problems here. What I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about two starting works that tries to specifically address near accident scenarios. So my plan for this talk is to start off by talking about some of our work where we are trying to learn policies for autonomous cars in near accident scenarios, specifically using a data-driven approach, using imitation learning and reinforcement learning together to figure out how this autonomous car should drive when you're in near accident settings. And then after that, for the second part of the talk, what I'd like to do is I'd like to focus on not necessarily what the autonomous car should do, but the autonomous car predicting how the other drivers around it are acting when we are in near accident scenarios. And then for that, I'd like to take a more model-based type of approach and, and use ideas from behavioral economics to think about risk a little bit more carefully. Okay. All right, so that's my plan. Let's jump into it. Okay. So when we think about near accident scenarios, one question to ask is, well, how are we defining them? What is special about near accident scenarios? And I think what, one thing that particularly happens in, in many near accident scenarios is this idea of phase transition. So, so the idea of phase transition here is I have an autonomous car, that's my red car coming down this road, and it looks at the environment and the environment actually smoothly changes uh, over time. And, and there, is, there is no big jumps or weird behaviors in the environment. The environment actually like much, much smoothly changes, but the autonomous car needs to have a jump in its actions. For example, if the autonomous car, the red car is coming down the road and the, the environment is occluded and then it gets to an intersection, let's say that this doesn't have uh, any lights. So it's a two way intersection. And, and it might actually, at some point after the collusion, it sees the, the blue car, the environment car. And once it sees that, then the autonomous car to be safe, it, it should slow down. So it should like break really hard. So this breaking, this, this really hard breaking is almost a phase transition in the policy of, of the autonomous car. It was driving normally and it's got a break and then go down to a different, diff, a very different policy based on smooth changes in the environment. So, so that is really the difficult thing that we need to handle and we need to handle well in near accident scenarios. 
So if you think about these phase transitions, these phase transitions actually naturally create a set of, a set of modes in the environment, a set of different modes of driving in the environment. And as much as I hate to discretizing the world, this actually makes sense in this setting. So, so in this setting, um, the, the, this vehicle could continue driving as it was driving and stay in this aggressive mode, could actually have like this braking mode behavior, kind of slowing down, or could maybe swerve and, and go around this vehicle. So there are different policies and almost different homotopy classes that exist here. And this autonomous car could take any of these different policies. And those different policies create a natural set of modes here in, in, when it comes to thinking about this driving behavior. So what we think is when we are in near accident scenarios, we need to handle phase transitions. And what that means is we need to handle how we're switching from one mode to another mode. And, and that problem is much easier than, and then dealing with, let's say, let's say trying to imitate like how humans generally drive in these settings. So the way we approach that is, is we think about this problem of phase transition as optimal switching between these discrete modes that exist. In, in how people actually handle these types of settings. So at the end of the day, what we, what we try to do is we, we, we take a hierarchical approach here where we say each one of these modes are our specific type of driving behavior. And I have very limited data in general for my new accident driving behavior. So I have limited data for each one of these modes, but because I'm learning a specific behavior in each one of these modes, like training a policy for each of these settings is actually not that difficult. I can, I can run a low level imitation learning policy for each one of these mode behaviors for aggressive driving or swerving or slowing down. And then specifically we do that using conditional imitation learning where we collect visual data of how cars drive in, in each one of these settings. And then we have a policy, a low level policy for how the car should behave in each setting. And then at the top level, we have a reinforcement learning agent and all, their, all the, uh, the reinforcement learning agent needs to do is to figure out how it needs to switch between these low level imitation learning policies. So the high level reinforcement learning uh, policy decides on these low level imitation learning policies. And this kind of hierarchical approach tries to handle this problem of phase transition in an efficient and scalable way. Because if you were to apply just reinforcement learning to the full problem, it wouldn't scale. If you were to apply just imitation learning to the full problem, that wouldn't scale and have, its own, have all its own issues. So, so, so this kind of like breaks down the problem in a natural way to, to handle how, how the autonomous car should actually drive when it comes to these types of phase transition behaviors. Yeah. So, so the proposed approach combines reinforcement learning and imitation learning together. And, and if you're interested in details of this, this is actually an RSS paper and, and we're going to talk about it on Tuesday. So I wanna just briefly show one example of how this works in practice. Uh, but for more details, definitely like attend the discussion session. So we tried this out in, in a few different near accident scenarios in, in Carla. And uh, I just want to show you maybe the merge scenario, just one of these scenarios. So, so this is a setting where I have an eco vehicle, the autonomous car, the red car. And what the red car wants to do is it wants to change lanes, go to the right lane because there's an exit coming up and it really needs to change lanes really soon. And, and it can either merge behind the blue car or it can try to like merge in front of the blue car. And depending on the setting, uh, it needs to kind of balance out what would be the thing that makes sense to do in this setting. Okay. So um, I'm just gonna show you some videos of uh, like how this compares with some of the other approaches. So if, from the left, if, if you look at an imitation learning agent that is trained on just the timid data, the car is going to merge behind the blue car all the time. Uh, so that's kind of like what the timid behavior would do, and that's what that data looks like. If you train an imitation learning agent on aggressive driving behavior, the car is always going to cut ahead, and this is getting close to an intersection too, so you might say, well, uh, that could be an aggressive behavior. If you're training it on the combined data, you might get like um, weird like uh, shift type uh, behaviors where the car merges to, to, to um, a different, completely different lane. And finally, taking this hierarchical approach, uh, we would end up getting a behavior where the car does sometimes cut in front of the blue car, depending on what scenario you are in. So this is just a sample video of different runs of, um, of this problem. But looking at it more quantitatively over multiple runs, um, we, we can compare, compare safety and efficiency between this H-rail approach, this hierarchical approach, combining reinforcement learning and imitation learning, 
with some of these other baselines. And it turns out that in terms of safety, this approach actually does fairly well. Of course, it is not going to be as good as the tenant approach, but it is like fairly well, like in terms of balancing safety and efficiency. And again, in terms of efficiency, it is, it is pre pretty efficient. Of course, it's not going to be as efficient as the aggressive approach, which is, which is this line here. Um, but again, like the point is by combining imitation learning and reinforcement learning here, we can better balance between safety and efficiency in a way that handles these phase transitions more, great, more gracefully. We also ran a user study where we showed these different driving behaviors to our users, uh, and then we asked them, well, which one they would actually prefer. Uh, and they all strongly preferred the hierarchical approach compared to some of these other baselines, which was, which was kind of nice. So the key idea of this section of the talk was this idea of integrating RL and uh, imitation learning in a way that we can think about balancing safety and efficiency in near accident scenarios a little bit more carefully, because I think that actually matters when, when we are in near accident settings. And again, as I mentioned, this is, uh, this is joint work with TRI, um, actually with Adrian, who's giving a talk later today. Um, students who are leading the project are Zhang Jia, Erdem, and Woody. So, um, this is a paper on Wednesday, so feel free to join uh, that discussion session if you're interested in more details of, of this project. All right, so, okay, so that was about learning policies uh, for autonomous cars in these settings. But what I'd like to switch to, to now is this idea of still being in near accident scenarios, but thinking about how we can predict human, human driving behavior and taking a more model-based approach as opposed to the previous work where you basically combine RL and IL together. All right, so I think we all agree that if you want to have a robot interacting with a person, that robot needs to predict how humans around it are acting. Or if you have an autonomous car interacting with humans, pedestrians, or human-driven cars, that autonomous car needs to have models of these agents around it. And the question that I think is interesting to ask is, what happens if we go to slightly more safety critical situations? What happens if I have now a person interacting with these robots in a dangerous like factory floor? Or what happens if you are thinking about an autonomous car interacting with people in near accident driving settings? So, so let me motivate this a little bit more by, by an example, by a running example that we can go over. So imagine that we have an autonomous car. Again, it's a red car coming down the road. And what the red car wants to do is it wants to make an unprotected left turn. So it wants to make a left turn at the intersection. And it's coming down the road and there's also this blue car that's coming down from the other side. And at some point the light turns yellow. So when the light turns yellow, a good question that the, this, this vehicle, this autonomous car is, could ask from itself is, if, if is the blue car um, going to uh, stop or not? Like, will the blue car stop or not? So the autonomous car could think about what would be the optimal action here. Like based on, based on the reward values, you can assume, well, the, it, can, it can think about and compute what would be the optimal behavior of the blue car. And actually the optimal behavior of the blue car in this setting is, is to stop because the light is yellow, it's going to turn red, it's got to stop. And because of that, the, the red vehicle should decide and proceed and try to make its left turn. But I think we all have seen cars passing yellow lights or red lights, even though it might not be the optimal behavior based on, based on a reasonable reward function. I, I agree, like one can, one can change the reward function, so passing the yellow light would be the more rewarding thing. But even if it is not the more rewarding thing, I think we have a lot of times seen people taking suboptimal actions and not necessarily maximizing reward functions. And that's exactly, I think, what robots in general need to handle. Robots should recognize the fact that people can behave suboptimally in risky scenarios. So, so far, like the human model that I've been relying on is this human model where we assume that there's a policy for the, for the, for the human that's a maximizer of a reward function. This is the model that I used earlier in the earlier work where the car like nudges in front of other vehicles, changes lanes, right? So this is a model that I assume my humans are actually like acting, acting with. And this assumes there is an optimal action and the human is rational and will take the optimal action. The problem with that is humans are not always rational optimal agents that are optimizing reward functions. And I think in recent years, people are realizing that that is not necessarily true and humans are not going to always act optimally. So, so kind of like a slightly better model than this rational optimal agent model is this other model called the noisily rational model where we assume actions of humans are probabilistic. So at least they're not deterministic. They're not deterministically picking something. 
their actions are probabilistic and probability of these actions is proportional to exponential of some theta parameter times some reward function. And this theta parameter is, is a temperature parameter. It's commonly referred to as a rationality coefficient. And depending on what this parameter is, if you put that equal to infinity, you get your optimal action. If you put that equal to zero, you get random actions. And depending on what you pick, then you get some sort of, some sort of curve here that represents how humans act, okay? So this is a better model, but there is a problem with this model. And the problem is this noisily irrational model of the human still assumes that the most likely action of the human is the optimal action. So, so it doesn't really capture the fact that, hey, there could be scenarios where the most likely thing that people do is not necessarily an optimal action. Maybe the most likely thing they would do is to accelerate and run a yellow light. And, and that is not necessarily the optimal action. So ideally, we would want to be able to capture something like the orange curve using, using some model that, that is able to capture something like the orange curve. And then think about settings where, where we are able to handle uh, most likely action of human being something suboptimal. And we want to do that in a systematic way, right? Like I understand if you change the reward function and sit down and try to do reward design, you could come up with this curve like, and, and make this one the optimal thing. But the thing is reward design is really difficult and, and I, I don't want to spend time on reward design. Instead, I would like to write the reward function that seems the most natural thing to do and then do some set of transformations on the reward function to be able to capture these risky, risky behaviors. So the way we go about this is we use the same model as before. We say, well, probability of actions of humans is proportional to exponential of some theta parameter times some reward. But this reward is going to be a transformed reward of, of our original reward function. We make a set of nonlinear transformations on top of the original reward. And, and these nonlinear transformations is based on ideas from prospect theory and behavioral economics where one can actually capture risk. So just to quickly go over like what these transformations look like, Imagine, well, I have my reward function. It's a sum of products of probabilities of events times rewards of events, maybe passing a red light or not passing a red light. And then if you think about each one of these probabilities and rewards, one can make nonlinear transformations on top of them. So looking at the reward, if this is the true reward, what prospect theory tells us is when, you're, when it comes to risky scenarios, we actually need to make this, this particular nonlinear transformation using a set of hyperparameters. And this transformation is exactly what tells us like the fact that people are, ha are having, a hard having, having a hard time differentiating between high reward scenarios. For example, differentiating between $1 million and $1 million and 10K, right? 10K doesn't have that much value in that setting. But, but if you're trying to differentiate between $1 and 10K, 10K actually has a lot of value. So, so this is actually the exact same idea. And then using this nonlinear transformation, we can, we can basically capture this type, of, um, this type of biases that humans have. Another set of biases that shows up is in, in the probability. So one can make a set of nonlinear transformations also in the probability. And specifically the nonlinear transformation we are making here is by overweighing low probability events and underweighing high probability events. This is again, the same exact transformation that one would do when you're thinking about uh, settings where you buy lottery tickets or when you buy like insurance. Like this is like very low probability events. People tend to overweigh them. And that is why the true probability is kind of like a nonlinear version of what, what you'd think would be the true probability. And then here, like there are a set of hyperparameters. So these hyperparameters could actually be tuned based on the data collected from humans. All right, so, so let me just show you some um, results on this. So we decided to try this out in the near accident driving scenario. And what we wanted to do first was um, to just run a user study to see like how people make decisions here. Like how do actually people make decisions when it comes to these near accident scenarios. And we varied a set of factors. And the main factor that actually made a difference here was risk. So we have high risk scenarios where the light turns red 95% of the times. And we have low risk scenarios when the light turns red only like 5% of the times. And in high risk scenarios, people are more likely to stop. They actually take the optimal action. But it turns out that when you're in low risk scenarios, that is when majority of people are preferring the suboptimal action. They tend to stop, but the optimal action is to accelerate. So, so that's interesting. That tells us that in low risk scenarios, people are not making the optimal action. And what we do here is we try to basically try to le learn the set of hyperparameters based on the data. 
and compare a risk aware model with the noisily rational model. So going back to the same exact scenario, if, in, if you're in the high risk setting, in the high risk set setting, actually there isn't any difference between the risk aware model and what noisily rational model would do. But, but if you're actually in the low risk scenario when people are making these suboptimal decisions, the risk of our model is, is better at capturing, uh, capturing the fact that uh, how, how people would actually drive in these things. Just to extend this, this is not just about driving. One can go beyond driving when it comes to thinking about uh, these types of behaviors. Um, and, and we decided to run an experiment where we have a robot that plans based on these models. So if I have a robot that wants to plan based on these models, uh, the question is like, how would the robot collaborate and coordinate with humans based on the risk of our models? So, so we decided to run an experiment where, where we have this collaborative cup stacking task where we have a human and a robot taking turns and putting cups on top of each other. And, and they have two options. One option is to build an efficient tower, but an unstable tower, something like the Tower of Pisa, where you're putting the cups on top of each other very efficiently, but, but uh, the tower only stays upright like 20% of the times. But if it stays upright, you get a lot of points. You get 105 points, okay? The other option is to go for an inefficient tower, but it's stable. So, so you decide to put the cups on top of each other in the decreasing order of size. So you make sure that it stays stable, but it's very inefficient to do it because you have to think about it. So this tower never falls, but you only get like 20 points because you're guaranteed to make the tower work. So we actually have humans and robots coordinating with each other on this task. And if you think about the reward values, the optimal thing is actually to take risks and go for the Tower of Pisa, try to build that unstable tower. But it turns out that when we have humans interacting with these robots, humans are overly concerned about the Tower of Falling. So this is like a risky scenario for them. And they actually don't want to build the Tower of Pisa. Like humans, like in these settings, actually prefer to, to take the more conservative action, be, be more risk averse. And what ends up happening is that, is that a robot with a noisily rational model of the human doesn't detect that. And because it doesn't detect that, it needs to replan and go and pick up something else and come back around. Here is actually seeing it in action. Like Roberto goes and picks up the orange cup. Robot also goes and picks up the orange cup, but it comes empty handed and it needs to replan and try out again. But if we actually have this robot using a model, a risk aware model of the person, then the robot would realize that the human is going to be overly concerned. So it just takes a complementary action from the beginning and they end up collaborating and co coordinating with each other much better. So I know this example was not about driving, but like similar thing is actually true in driving. Like if you have, again, an autonomous car, they can capture the fact that humans are going to act suboptimally, then that autonomous car can better coordinate and collaborate with that, with that human and predict what that human is going to do in a near accident driving scenario. So, so just to summarize, the key idea here is you're capturing these suboptimalities using a notion of risk and using a notion uh, of, of basically modifying the reward function using nonlinear transformations based on ideas from prospect theory and behavioral economics. And this was actually a work that we presented at HRI this year. And then just to quickly summarize, I think handling near accident scenarios is, is really important and, and we need to start paying attention to that a little bit more because that is where like some of our assumptions actually like fall, uh, fall short. And, and today what I basically talked about is how we can use a learning based approach and data driven approach to think about how cars should drive in these settings and then how we can take a more model based approach to better predict risk and how human driven cars around us actually drive. And going forward, I, I do think um, this idea of modeling humans and, and thinking about interaction a little bit more carefully matters a lot. And, and one step ahead, I think, is thinking about adaptations, thinking about my behavior when I'm driving right next to this autonomous car for the 10th time is going to change. And I'm not gonna, for example, like if I see this car driving, I might just go around it if I bike around it because in the previous settings when I've interacted with this car, I, I, this car was stuck. So because of that, I would decide to go around and maybe do something else. So this idea of adaptation, like everything I've said so far is about building human models, reward functions, policies that are fixed, but humans adapt. And then we actually need to start thinking about how humans adapt in these interactive scenarios. And with that, I'd like to thank you guys and I can take any questions. Great. Well, um... Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dorsa. So um, 
Okay, so as, uh, as a reminder, if you have any questions, um, if you open up the chat, um, it should be at the bottom or maybe the top, depending on your, um, 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 how, uh, uh, how feed loop is working. Um, okay, we've got, we've got one question from Salah here, Dorsa. The mm -hmm. question is, uh, I was wondering how computational complexity is impacted when you consider a distribution over human actions rather than assuming drivers are rational. Is there need for alternative assumptions to make the problem tractable? I think that's a very, yes, great question. So um, I think what Solar is referring to is like when you think about that interaction that I mentioned earlier, I assumed the human is optimizing a reward function. One can have a better model than that, right? Like you might say, well, there's a distribution, the human is following a distribution, it is not necessarily picking the top of that, that, that reward, uh, that, that distribution, the human could take anything from that distribution. And that introduces a lot of computational issues. And actually that is the, the exact reason that in, in the earlier work, you just assume humans are deterministic, right? Like we assume humans are rational and they're deterministic. And they are not. And, and one can take a sampling based approach, for example, to address some of these computational issues, but that doesn't really solve the problem. Like, like that's still going to be computationally really difficult. Um, so the prospect theory approach is actually fair, like very efficient and, and it tries to kind of address that, right? So, so the prospect theory approach just does a transformation on the reward function. Instead of worrying about the distribution, you still like pick the top of that, that, that particular uh, reward function, but making that nonlinear transformation handles the fact that in risky scenarios, people might act differently. I'm not suggesting that answers everything. I think uh, in general, we need to come up with way better computational approaches of handling these behaviors. I think representation learning does play a big role here when we think about interactions. And I think that's actually how people interact with each other. Like when people interact with each other, a lot of times they build representations, much lower dimensional representations with each other. And that is the thing they keep track of instead of full on distributions of their partner's policies. And I think that could be a way forward to make things more computational. Computational. Okay, yeah. okay great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I, I also had a question. Um, oh, and we've got a response from Salah saying that makes sense. Um, oh, and uh, I might ask, uh, I might skip my question because someone else has asked another one. Um, so Eric says, uh, when a robot collaborates with a human, should the robot make a decision and hope that the human would adapt to the action of the robot? Or should the robot always adapt and yield to the human's action? I think that's a very good question. And that's something that we still don't know the answer to it. And it's a difficult question because I think a lot of people have started talking about co-adaptation and the fact that, hey, robots need to adapt to humans too, because otherwise, humans adapt and they start taking advantage of you. But the scales of these actually matter too, right? Like if I'm adapting and you're adapting, then you never get a chance of like getting used to each other. Um, I think, I do think they both need to adapt, right? Like in the case of autonomous driving, when I see autonomous cars around me, like my behavior changes and I adapt to them and the autonomous car can wait for that, but that might actually not be good for it. So over time, it might realize that it should also adapt its reward function. But, but the time scales and frequencies of these actually matter a lot, like for, for, for both of these agents being learning agents. Um, so my answer is they both should adapt. How to do that is still like a very open question. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, we've got time for one more question. And so Ania has asked, uh, also thanks for the great talk. Uh, as you said, we have seen uh, many, many new algorithms and technologies for planning and control of autonomous cars and safety rules somehow play the role of constraints on those algorithms. I'm wondering, do the safety rules and standards for commercial autonomous cars match with those new technologies? How conservative are they in the current state? That's a, yeah, that's also a very good question. Um, I think how you're addressing safety is an important question. And at the moment, um, I'm not that heavily working on some of these issues at the moment. I used to work on them, but uh, based on conversations I've had with people, it seems like safety rules are not too big of a constraint at the moment. Actually, like car companies, like people I know in, in the car companies, they are putting constraints, more constraints on themselves than the actual rules that are out there. There is a big mismatch between those rules and what the technology actually can and cannot do. 
And I do think like car companies, thankfully, are quite careful about um, about being safe and, and satisfying way more constraints than what like NHTSA, for example, tells them. Uh, I do think that mismatch needs to be solved and, 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 and they need to like get closer to each other. Um, yeah, yeah, so, so, so that's one answer. And then the other answer is like, maybe our behavior and our, the way we are treating safety might change over time too. And I might not be as rigid as, as it used to be. Maybe we are not able to give guarantees, but maybe we are able to like self-diagnose and repair if things fail. So I think that could be a different view of safety that, that we'd start looking into more closely. Great. Well, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Delissa, for that really interesting talk. Um, uh, if anyone has any further questions, uh, maybe, uh, Dorsa, if you want to hang around for a few extra minutes, there may be some extra questions for you in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, so thanks very much, Dorsa. And um, so we'll now move on to our second speaker. Uh, so our second speaker is uh, Maxime Dolgov. Um, who did his uh, uh, PhD at the um, Karlsruhe uh, Institute of Technology, uh, where he worked on stochastic control and control of um, Markov Johnson uh, systems. So since 2017, uh, he, uh, he has been with uh, Bosch Corporate Research and works on behavior and motion planning for automated driving. Uh, his research uh, interests are in imitation and reinforcement learning especially in combining classical model-based and uh, modern data-driven approaches. Um, so Maxine, oh yep, looks like you're sharing the screen. Great, the, the floor is all yours. Um, Maxine, uh, you may be muted still. Um, we we can't hear anything. Um, in case you want to. Um, ah, okay. I, I thought I thought I was uh, <laughs> muted by you and you unlocked me. Okay. Uh, now for... it's fine. Now now we can hear you, but you yeah. have to start again. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me uh, to a great workshop. Uh, it's a great opportunity to share with you what I'm working on. And um, well, my talk will be, will be about um, combining classical and uh, data-driven approaches uh, at Bosch Research. So, um, well, when I tell people that I work at Bosch, they usually have uh, coffee machines in mind, or drills, or washing machines. And what many do not know is that um, Bosch is uh, one of the major uh, automotive suppliers in Germany. And um, well, we have a wide range of automotive components ranging from brakes, injection systems to different sensors, um, for example, radars, ultrasonic sensors, different camera configurations. And we also develop software for uh, automotive, uh, automated driving and driver assistance and offer these functionalities to our customers. Also, what uh, many do not know is that Bosch has a long history of uh, working on driver assistance. Um, for example, the anti-lock uh, braking system was invented at Bosch. And um, well, since 2011, we are also working on automated driving. And the most recent projects are, for example, um, the urban automated driving project together with Daimler or the automated valid parking at uh, in Stuttgart. Um, fully automated valid parking. Then uh, we also work on uh, driverless shuttles for um, yeah, mixed um, scenarios where uh, you don't have the structured road, but uh, rather a campus, for example. Um, and since 2018, we also work on development of uh, highway assist system. Um, in uh, my talk, I will be presenting uh, topics from Bosch Research. And um, due to this long history of being an automotive supplier, we have a separation between uh, development of products for our customers at the business unit and doing research um, in uh, corporate research all over the world. So um, the research at Bosch is not only limited to optimized driving. We also work on uh, topics ranging from sensors to uh, metal alloys, ceramics, plastics, through quantum computing, machine learning, to robots and automated driving. And in the field of automated driving, we work on um, perception and um, 
tracking system with uh, yeah, video, LiDAR, radar, um, also on video and LiDAR localization, SLAM, behavior and motion planning, connected driving, and also um, sensing behavior simulation for automated driving. Um, okay, so now um, why um, hybrid approach for AD? We have seen many impressive demonstration of end-to-end -end driving and also many um, learning-based approaches. Um, but if you want to commercialize such a system, you have to um, provide guarantees. So even if your end-to-end -end system is able to uh, generalize over a wide range of scenarios, which is difficult by itself, um, you still need um, yeah, to have some sort of a um, validation uh, being provided for a system. And um, so at Bosch, um, and I myself personally think that uh, this classical uh, divide and conquer approach where we can um, yeah, address one problem at a time, improve one co component at a time and have this iteration loop of um, becoming better and better um, is the way to go for the first uh, generations of automated driving. Um, of course, you could argue uh, why classical approach uh, did not give us fully automated driving yet. So we're still in this phase um, where 2020 is here and we have no automated uh, vehicles yet um, being rolled out uh, for the public. So we have many uh, testing ongoing. Um, but what is starting to get is um, we uh, begin to have this uh, classical pipelines being deployed and being improved one at a time with machine learning. And um, this is also what, what we do at Bosch Research. So we have a classical baseline of a single processing pipeline um, with perception, environmental modeling, over behavior planning, prediction, um, motion planning and motion control. And um, we take one component at a time and try to improve it with data-driven methods in order to get it to the state where we can roll it out in public. And um, today I'm going uh, to talk about uh, having deep learning uh, detectors that estimate uncertainties for classical environmental uh, modeling, um, learn sensor models, how we improve um, prediction by having pedestrian prediction being learned, and also learning sampling distribution for motion planning. <clears throat> okay, so why would you want to combine um, a classical tracking pipeline with a um, learned um, method? Um, well, Kalman filters have been widely used in perception system. Um, they offer a mathematically sound way to incorporate prior knowledge into tracking, such as motion models of uh, tracked objects. For example, you have different behavior for a truck and a, uh, than a bicycle. Um, also, you can incorporate the knowledge about the strength and the weaknesses of your sensors. Um, so for example, um, LiDAR provides you good position estimates. Um, and radar, on the other hand, can measure relative velocities. And uh, what you want to do in this um, classical perception pipeline um, that works very well in, in a scenario is improve it, um, just individual components of it. So, um, for example, um, if you stick uh, with um, with detection, what you want to have is you want to incorporate your um, learn detection, and to this end, you need some sort of a, um, of uncertainty being provided with the detection. Um, the standard engineering approach would be um, to have this, yeah, to assume an uncertainty and then do filtering with it. Or if you have ground truth data, maybe you could uh, tweak the uncertainty. But instead of um, yeah, such an engineering approach, instead of tweaking to um, uh, specific scenarios, what you want to have is um, having an estimate of uncertainty being provided together with your, um, with your detection. And this is... Um, something that we, for example, do uh, with LiDAR detection. Um, you can see here um, our approach uh, developed by Dee Feng and our group. He's a PhD who is together with Uni University of Ulm. And um, he does um, detection of, um, of objects in LiDAR point clouds. Um, 
here are some examples from uh, from a Kitty data set. Here uh, you have the RGB image just for visualization and detection of objects in such a point cloud. And what you can see is um, D developed a model that estimates uncertainty. It's uh, depicted in a log scale. Um, you have low uncertainty here, larger uncertainty here. And if you look at this uh, bounding boxes estimated by our models, you can see that uh, the uncertainty gets larger um, when uh, the vehicles are far away or if you have inclusion so that you don't see the entire bounding box from the side or if you have fewer, um, fewer reflections on the objects. Okay, the approach um, that he used is um, yeah, rather standard in literature. Um, we take our LiDAR bird's eye um, feature maps, feed them through a VGG16 preprocessing network, um, do region proposal uh, ROE uh, pooling, and feed it through a fast RCNN head. And in addition to a standard output where you only have uh, the anchor position regression and the softmax of your bounding boxes, and later um, um, location regression, orientation regression, the softmax of your detection. Um, he added outputs uh, to, yeah, to uh, consider uncertainties: your um, region proposal uncertainty, your localization uncertainty, and um, the orientation uncertainty. Um, in his work, he assumed um, standard Gaussian. Um, uncertainty and um, was able to uh, to learn the result that I showed you. Um, and of course, you could also um, assume non-standard uncertainties and having your um, your model also predict um, the strengths and the weaknesses of your sensors. So again, having um, different uncertainties in different directions of the of your sensor. So, uh, for example, um, the detection of the velocity, if you do it in tracking, uh, could have much larger uncertainty than uh, the position. Okay, if we go further in in our pipeline, um, what you also could improve in environmental modeling with uh, machine learning based methods is um, having sensor, ba uh, sensor models being learned from data. Um, well, Usually, um, what you have, so uh, this is a work done by uh, Yasmin Ebert on uh, deep radar uh, sensor models, and um, it will going to be presented this year in the ITSC. Um, the radar sensor models are quite challenging. Um, so if you have a camera or a LiDAR, you have measurements from the surface of the object. This is um, something that you as a human can grasp and you can tweak your covariances. Um, but the radar, radar is much harder for humans to, to grasp. You have reflections, um, not only from the surface, but from the axis and from the wheels of the vehicle. And also you have uh, the Doppler effect, um, multiple reflections and so on. And uh, this is something that engineers try to come by with Gaussian mixture models, for example. Um, but still, if you use some sort of um, engineered model, you have to address it with uh, prior knowledge. So you have to put into into modeling uh, your experience, where the reflections can occur, how many components of Gaussian mixture you need to add. And in this work, we learned a deep uh, model inspired by the post, uh, point net from um, LiDAR perception. And um, the advantage was not only that we uh, get got better results, but also uh, we have a differentiable model that can be seamlessly integrated with a Kalman filter. Um, after an evaluation in this challenging environment um, on a test track that uh, your standard radar-based automated cruise control in your car um, would not be able to cope with uh, simply because it is tuned to um, curvatures that usually occur in the road and parallel traffic and so on, um, we um, yeah, could get uh, superior results um, with the pretty simple setup. And this is something um, which also showed beneficial in our real world um, evaluation. 
So again, this the thing you have a, a classical baseline, and you improve improve one component at a time. Okay. Um, so next, um, when we get uh, further in our signal processing pipeline, um, we have a uh, problem of uh, prediction. And um, yeah, we heard already from uh, DOSA that uh, humans behave different um, with robots and um, you want to somehow to capture this, um, um, yeah, this behavior of humans. Um, and doing so with classical approaches is pretty hard. Um, pedestrian behavior is yes, influenced by many, um, many um, yeah, contexts. Um, by the context in, uh, in the scene. So for example, if a pedestrian uh, sees something on the other side of the road, he would um, cross it. So you have to infer intent. Also you have um, interactions between pedestrians um, themselves, uh, like this child here, um, which uh, runs on the sidewalk, either on this side or this side of the, of the standing human. And um, pedestrian also, uh, uh, implicitly communicate with each other, which you, which you can hardly capture with classical models. Um, thus, in our um, yeah, improvement of uh, pedestrian prediction, we uh, uh, looked into different models where you uh, go from expert-driven modeling with uh, probabilistic graphical models to more data-driven approaches with um, RNNs. This is uh, work in in progress, so just a small teaser here. Um, what we used in this uh, work was uh, dynamic scene context, so uh, the detections of our uh, bounding uh, of our pedestrians, uh, detections of the cars, semantic uh, information, and also um, post estimation from pedestrian. And um, from our results, we got that probabilistic models allow you to capture, um, yeah, to be pretty robust. But when it comes to uh, performance, um, data-driven approaches are way better, better at the cost, of course, of um, yeah, maybe failing in some scenarios when you, where you want to be uh, good. So um, maybe the way to go is having both of them uh, in your model and uh, switches, switch depending on the context. Okay. Oh. Um, something different um, that we also address further in our signal processing pipeline, um, where it comes to um, motion planning, is learning a sampling distribution for motion planning. Um, okay, so um, when you here we consider a maneuvering example that uh, we use using sampling-based motion planning um, simply because um, you can address non-convex uh, problems like uh, taking the other way of um, of a blocked road um, and this is something that is uh, uh, yeah, difficult to solve with optimization-based approaches um, and you also have uh, nice uh, theoretic results like um, completeness uh, depending on your uh, sampling methods. So there are strong guarantees that uh, yeah, for uh, different sampling strategies, you may have almost uh, surely, uh, you're almost surely being able to find um, a solution. Um, but um, when you take a naive sampling approach, um, you have to do post-processing in order to get smooth trajectories uh, for the controller or um, the naive sampling approach may take too long. Um, and this is something that may be, um, uh, yeah, may pose a problem when you try to roll out the system. And exactly here we can help with uh, machine learning approaches um, where you improve the sampling of new poses um, which you then can add to your uh, search graph and search with classical approach. Kim, uh, this is uh, work done by uh, Holger Banzhaf, who also works at my uh, group. And what uh, Holger did was um, uh, to train a CNN uh, to output a distribution of future um, positions of the robot and also uh, the angle. So, uh, 
by the robot, I mean a vehicle here, um, with a CNN that gets as an input the past trajectory of, of the vehicle, um, the goal, and um, the obstacles uh, and the unknown environment as a group, yeah, as an occupancy grid map. Maybe let's take a look at this video here. On the left uh, side, we uh, have a um, bi-directional RRT star with orientation aware state exploration. Um, and uh, on the right side, we see all models. And if you look closely, um, so the trained model is able to find a solution much faster here in this scenario than um, the classical model. If you look also at the path, um, you can see that um, the maneuver is more human-like uh, than the maneuver which is found by the classical alg algorithm. Um, these are the samplings here, the grid map of the environment and um, the path that is uh, driven by the vehicle is uh, depicted in green and green so here you see different sampling distributions output by the uh, by the cnn in our experiments okay another uh, scenario here um, this scenario is actually uh, pretty good for for a classical approach without a machine learning but nevertheless we um, did not train on this scenario, and still uh, the learned approach was able to output a nice trajectory. So uh, what I want to advocate with the talk is that um, there are components in the system that are reasonable to learn, and then components that are not reasonable to learn. And in this case, um, RT star is already a good um, conventional method that you do not have to um, relearn. You can already benefit from uh, just improving it with machine learning, with little data, uh, with guarantees of your, of your classical system. And this is also something that we uh, got in our results. So um, the CNN guided motion planning um, was able to reduce the computation time significantly. Um, we had faster convergence uh, at a, a lower cost. So if you assign a cost function to, to your motion planning and uh, compare the classical results with the CNN supported results, you get lower costs. And also we didn't lose uh, anything on success rate, even in scenarios that we did not see. So maybe um, let me summarize um, this. So what I want to advocate, and uh, yeah, this is um, also my personal um, opinion, is that um, system-based approach uh, to automated driving will dominate in the first generations. Um, we need to avoid to learn things that are already done well with model-based approaches. Um, and what we do, uh, what we have to do when, when it comes to automated driving is we have to produce robots where we can understand what is going on. Um, maybe we will not get this human-like behavior as advertised or as expected um, by, uh, by people. Um, but um, yeah, we need to, to be performant enough. We need to be predictable and we need to, sa to be safe. And I think we can also expect from humans that uh, they will adapt uh, to, to the robots on the road. Um, and maybe it, it has to be this iterative approach where we do not roll out robots that are capable to deliver human-like driving, but instead we start uh, small have um, specific scenarios where we have automated driving, for example, on a highway, maybe on uh, rural, rural roads um, or suburbs, and then people will start to get used to robots, will learn from it, will adapt their behavior, and um, we will have a much easier challenge to solve. Okay, thank you. Great. Um, 
Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Maxim. Yeah. Um, so again, um, uh, if you've just joined us, um, the way the way this is working is if you have uh, a question, um, it, there is the uh, Zoom chat functionality. So uh, please feel free to write into um, the, um, the group chat, um, and we can all see it. And I will um, I will read it out uh, so everyone can hear. Um, so uh, yeah, actually maybe maybe I can go first. Uh, so 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 Maxim, you, you talked about um, you talked about these architectures that you use for lidar um, and and also and also radar. Have you have you ever kind of uh, combined them both, like in case a vehicle has both of these sensors operating at the same time, um, in a, in a way that could potentially give benefits uh, more than either one of them alone? Um, yeah, well, we have um, currently a project going on that uh, combines them and uh, bring them to the road. Um, the colleagues already um, integrated uh, LiDAR and um, video and radar would be the next step. And um, also we uh, uh, not only have uh, just this classical pipeline, um, we're working on learning the tracking itself as well. Um, and um, this is something um, where you get robust results and you're also able to do ablation studies. Y you can switch one of the sensor modalities off and um, see how well uh, the others still work being in a learned environment or you use your classical models um, as a fallback. This is something that you can only do if you if you have individual components, if you have a framework where you, you can exchange one component at a time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, okay, we've got a new question come in over the chat from um, Salah. Uh, so Salah yep. says, uh, thanks Maxim. Uh, could uh, you clarify how the Kalman filter was integrated with data with the data driven BNN approach. Yeah. Okay. So um, usually, what you what you get from your uh, deep model is a detection of an object, maybe a, a, some sort of regression regression of the state, and then um, the question is uh, how to integrate this detection into a common filter. You need a you need a model of your. Uh, of your target, you need to do a measurement association. So if you have um, multiple tracks and you want to uh, know from which of the tracks the detection comes from, you um, you need to do uh, some sort of data association. And um, the common filter um, uses uh, this update loop um, where you iterate between update and a prediction. Mm -hmm. And um, in classical approaches, um, you have some sort of a sensor model that uh, gives you, um, yeah, that um, gives you the update uh, metrics, the measurement metrics, and you also um, have a model of your noise, uh, depending on the object, um, that uh, helps you evaluate who you trust more, the measurement uh, or the prediction model. And um, in this approach, um, with uh, with LiDAR, we focused on um, having this uncertainty being provided by the model as well. So um, you would still uh, have a measurement model that is engineered and from for LiDAR detection, um, it's just uh, the position of a bounding box in, in its simplest case and the size of the object. Um, but then uh, you want to, to be able um, yeah, to assess, um, do you trust uh, the LiDAR detection more or do you trust your prediction more? And here is where um, the uncertainty measure helps. Um, so if you uh, look at this slide, you have uh, quite good estimates in a reasonable range from your vehicle. You would trust the LiDAR detection. And as soon as it comes um, to cases where you have occlusions or the vehicle is too far away, you would start uh, to trust your model more. Um, but it's okay because these vehicles are usually far away and uh, do not pose uh, this yeah, uh, threat right now. And they are not that critical for your planning. So, for example, in this detection here, you would uh, assume a model and just uh, um, 
yeah, has still an improvement of your of your detection of your tracking, um, but relying more on on the model that you have and not the measurement itself. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, we've got a, a another question. Um, so, uh, how is the tracking performance in the presence of occlusions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, um, it depends on um, what model do you assume. Um, if you have, um, for example, a constant uh, velocity. Uh, model and uh, the behavior um, of the vehicle matches uh, your model assumptions. You have pretty good uh, tracking, um, and uh, if you uh, if your behavior the behavior of the object doesn't match uh, the model, you um, get yeah, worse tracking. Um, but usually, it doesn't matter if you have objects that are too far away. And um, near your vehicle where, uh, where the b tracking is critical, you usually have um, additional sensors that can help, for example, a radar sensor that may not only be able to see uh, the vehicle in front of you, but uh, can see uh, yeah, some sort uh, through it um, due to reflections from, from the ground. And... Um, well, um, this work here uh, was especially targeted towards um, having this um, um, the model, uh, the detection uncertainty being output. Um, we didn't analyze uh, its influence on the um, on the tracking performance, um, but um, in our current um, integration project that we also will publish soon. Um, we have scenarios where traffic is pretty good. Okay, so I, I cannot provide uh, specific numbers, but um, the model itself is uh, critical and uh, you can see it with humans as well. So um, humans have really good models when it comes uh, to occlusions to objects. And this is something where we can uh, get to by um, yeah, also learning prediction models for the common filters. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again. Um, all right. If is uh, if there's any more questions, um, feel free to type them in into the um, text box, uh, the the chat in the next uh, minute or two. Um, we're we're running a few minutes ahead of schedule, so um, we've still got um, we've still got a bit of. And then in a few minutes, we'll um, move on to the contributed uh, talks section. So we have uh, four contributed talks coming up. Um, so the way the way this works is uh, everyone has provided a three minute video, uh, which I will play from um, uh, my machine here. And then the author will uh, 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 the author will be um, present here to answer any of your questions um, live, uh, which is again just through the, um, the chat functionality. Um, Cillian, if you're if you're online uh, now, we could even begin a few minutes uh, early. Oh, okay. It looks like, so we've got a few more questions coming in. Um, yep. uh, so Kevin asks, uh, could you provide some examples of where you would favor keeping the model based components as opposed to trying to improve them with a data driven approach? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Um, well, if you design a robot that you want to commercialize, you would uh, probably have a, a very performant uh, 
performance layer, uh, which is for good scenarios, and uh, have multiple safety layers. And um, I would prefer to have uh, some of these uh, safety layers being based on um, on classical approaches, um, with maybe uh, yeah triggering conditions that are um, set to um, yeah, to very close ranges where you um, have little time to react, where um, maybe an, yeah, um, pretty hard braking is, is acceptable. Um, and um, well, trying, of course, to avoid uh, this situation with classical approaches, um, um, with um, uh, approaches that are data-driven, but um, still have yeah, classical approaches in the loop. Okay, great. Um, yeah. And there is a there's a question from um, Igor. Uh, uh, what do you mm -hmm. think the role of radar uh, is in autonomous driving? Uh, how can it how can it be better integrated with existing perception approaches? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for asking. So. Um, um, Many uh, classical driver assistance systems like um, automated cru cruise control are based uh, usually on radar. And uh, we have seen that um, current um, yeah, approaches in, in literature and also what you, um, what you also get to see are heavily based uh, on LiDAR or video. Um, but I think radar adds a functionality that uh, complements the weaknesses of, of the other two sensor modalities. Um, so with the radar, uh, you can see in the dark uh, where what is or in the fog uh, that is pretty uh, difficult to use with um, with video, or you have the advantage over standard uh, reflection-based lidar, not. Uh, and not the wave modulated lidar, where you have um, velocity of the object being measured as well. And um, in order to better uh, to being uh, better uh, to be able to better integrate with, with classical approaches, I think you have to improve the radar as well. Um, so when when people think about radar, they have uh, usually a single reflections in mind, and um, we are in radar development already at the point uh, where we can do, um, yeah, um, uh, where we have multiple detections per object. And this is something that is still uh, hard to model. So uh, standard approaches um, do a mean of this uh, reflections so or take the one um, that is uh, closest. And what we use for, what we need for a better integration um, radar models where we explicitly can uh, do extended object tracking with radar. And as soon as we have these models, as soon as we have uh, such an extended object uh, tracking based on radar available, radar will be uh, maybe on, on par with LiDAR and um, video as an additional sensor modality that you can heavily rely on in automated driving. Great, okay, thank you. Um, okay, that's um, that's uh, that's uh, that's time. And so, uh, yeah, thanks thanks very much, um, Maxime, for uh, joining us and giving up such an interesting talk. Thank you talk. for the invitation. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Maxime, uh, if you uh, you should be able to stop uh, stop sharing your screen, and then um, and then I will I will be able to start. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, so here we have um, so here we have a talk by Cillian um, uh, Browett on autonomous driving with interpretable goal recognition and Monte Carlo treated. Talk. I'm going to present our. My name is Cillian Browett, and in this talk, I'm going to present our interpretable planning and prediction method for autonomous vehicles. 
Prediction is an important but difficult problem. Accurate prediction can dramatically improve the performance of autonomous vehicles, but the predictions must be fast to compute, are based on limited amounts of information, and the actions of different road users can be highly coupled and interactive. Ideally, we want planning and prediction to be interpretable, and our system achieves this through rationality principles. Take the example shown in this slide. Our car, the blue car, aims to enter the junction and turn left. However, there is an oncoming vehicle coming from the right. By observing the vehicle coming from the left, and the fact that the vehicle coming from the right has stopped to give way to this vehicle, we can infer that the vehicle on the right is trying to turn to the north. Given this knowledge, we can predict that the vehicle will not cross our path and we can safely enter the junction. Here is an overview of our system. For both planning and prediction, we assume that agents use a predefined set of manoeuvres and macro actions. In our prediction module, we first use a classifier to infer a distribution over possible current manoeuvres for each vehicle. We then use inverse planning to infer distributions over possible goals, and for each goal we generate a set of possible trajectories. For the planning module, we use Monte Carlo Tree Search to compute a plan for our vehicle. Monte Carlo Tree Search is an iterative statistical planning method, and during each iteration, for each other vehicle, we sample a current manoeuvre, goal, and trajectory from the distributions inferred by the prediction module. This slide shows another example of our system in action. In this scenario, our goal is to merge into traffic. As we observe the vehicle coming from the south slowing down, the probability of it turning right rises. As the vehicle stops, this reveals a stop and go, which rises in probability over time, until we can safely merge. This plot shows the probability we assign to the correct goal for some of the vehicles in our scenarios. As you can see, the probability rises over time as we gather more and more observations. We compared our method to several baselines which use simpler prediction methods. One of these methods made map predictions where we only consider the most likely goal for each vehicle. Another method simply predicted that other vehicles would continue following their current lane at their current velocity. Another gave similar predictions but used the average velocity over the previous two seconds. We also use a conservative method where our vehicle always waits until oncoming vehicles have passed. As you can see here, our method completes the scenario in the same time or faster than most of the baselines. One baseline that sometimes achieved a lower time than our full method was map predictions, where we only consider the most probable goal for each vehicle. This extra certainty allows our vehicle to reach the goal more quickly on average, but can lead to dangerous behaviour as it does not consider all possibilities. Even in the cases where our full methods achieve the same time as other baselines, it still has the advantage of being able to explain its predictions. Great. Well, thank you, um, Cillian. Um, if there's any questions, um, please, um, please let, let us know. Um, well, to, to kick things off, uh, yeah, I have a, I have a question, Colin. Um, how does the time complexity work with these uh, candidate goals? Uh, is, is the runtime, does it scale uh, linearly with respect to the number of goals and also the number of other vehicles? And, and if the situation is very complex, would there be a way to maybe make it sublinear? Um... It is linear complexity in the number of vehicles and number of goals, but um, it is that complexity is parallelizable. So um, we can we independently make predictions for different vehicles. So if if there are a lot of vehicles and a lot of possible goals, although it's it's linear, yeah, it's still parallelizable. So it could be feasible to compute. That makes, that makes sense. Um, and actually, another question I had is, so uh, I thought the merge scenario was interesting where you, you introduce a static goal to where the car um, is so that we can consider that maybe that car has stopped and, and it's letting us in. Um, do you think maybe there could be some interesting extensions to this work uh, for um, non-ego goals? For, like maybe, for example, dynamic goals where that, that that human driver will never come to a stop, but they'll slow, they'll at least slow down for us um, to allow us to merge, but they'll they'll never actually stop, um, for example. Yeah, we could definitely extend to more goals like that. 
in the scenario there, it was um, just a stop and go because it was merging a junction. But say when we want to switch lane and merge into moving traffic, a car could have a goal where their goal is for you to be in front of them. So in a way, our goal is their goal. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Um, if um, if anyone has any uh, further questions for uh, Cillian, um, please just uh, type them into the chat. And and Cillian, if you wanna if you wanna just uh, keep an eye on that chat, um, maybe you can answer them from there. Okay, great. Uh, so next we're going to move on to. Hello, everyone. So next, we're we'll going to move on to a talk by Daniel Traman. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this presentation. In this video, we are going to present our paper on the challenges of safe and scalable reinforcement learning for automated driving at intersections. My name is Daniel Kamran, and I wrote this paper in cooperation with Marvin Bosch and Tizian Elgenke. First, I will have a short introduction of myself. I am a PhD student at Institute of Measurement and Control Systems at Kaspuhe Institute of Technology. My research interests are decision making for automated driving, risk aware reinforcement learning, and scalable policies for realistic environments. There are some challenges to drive autonomously at occluded intersections. The number of vehicles and also the number of intersecting lanes can be different. Another important challenge is that some of these vehicles are hidden behind the obstacles, which needs the policy to know information about occluded areas. Our goal is to tackle these challenges by learning a safe and a scalable policy with reinforcement learning for intersections. We represent the state by a matrix containing the ego vehicle state, the relative distance and velocity of all vehicles, and also maximum visibility distance and velocity for all intersecting lanes. In the output of our reinforcement learning agent, we have three actions to control the ego vehicle behavior. These actions are stop, drive slow, and drive fast. We use deep Q networks known as DQN in order to learn the future return for each state and action. However, such implementation needs a big input size for dense traffic, where there are many vehicles at the intersection. Also, the learn policy is very sensitive to the order of vehicles in the state representation, and it may not be generic and scalable for different scenarios. Our proposal to solve this problem is to use deep sets architecture in order to process multiple input elements with same neural networks. We can then apply a permutation invariant operation on all process data to have fixed input for our DQN network. This operation also helps to be independent from the input order in our state representation. Comparing the deep sets DQN and normal DQN in our experiments, we observed that deep set architecture could help to learn a less conservative but still safe policy. Also, the convergence time was shorter and the learn policy was more stable after convergence. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question or feedback about my work, you can contact me through my email address. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so again, if there's any, uh, if there's any um, uh, uh, questions, feel free to type them out in the chat. Um, it looks like you have a question there, Celine, from the previous talk. Uh, maybe to kick things off, I can, I can ask a question, Daniel. Uh, so, so in the, so, so it seems like this deep set architecture helps with the exchangeability of, um, vehicles, um, so like invariance to vehicle order um, and things like that. Um, can it also help with a, a variable number of vehicles um, in case the, the number of them n uh, changes from one scenario to another or the number of lane changes maybe? Yes, exactly. Actually, that's the main motivation that uh, we want to use deep sets for such scenarios. Because as you said, uh, 
for different traffic levels, there may be different number of cars. And also at different intersections, there, there can be different intersecting lanes. So in order to have a generic and scalable policy, uh, it really helps. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and maybe another question is, uh, um, so it looked, it looked like in these deep sets, the lanes and the vehicles were pre-processed separately. Um, do we lose any maybe important information with respect to mm -hmm. a vehicle being in a particular lane, say the lane closest to us or the lane turning right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, actually, that's something that we can do for future work in order to provide a kind of attention from lanes when we want to process vehicles. But yeah, right now, such kind of implementation, it really works. And on the other hand, because we just need to assume the worst case scenario for each lane. I mean, just a scenario that there is one car driving very fast at occluded areas for that lane. And the policy just need to know about that kind of worst case scenario. I mean, just a distance that can be occluded and the policy doesn't know about that car. So by that kind of information, the policy uh, should uh, get all of required information and yeah, we should drive opt optimally. Okay, great. And we've just got a question come in over the chat uh, mm -hmm. um, from Deacon saying, interesting work. This method uses discrete actions. Uh, does the solution violate the kinematics slash dynamics constraints? Well, uh, the methodology that we have is to have some kind of high level actions or to learn some kind of high level actions. So that's right. We have to consider the, the transition changes that we may have for the vehicle because of, yeah, because of changes in the control. Maybe we, have, we don't have a good controller, but we already consider that during training. So the, the decision time is not very small. So the decision time is maybe, for example, half a second, and we hope that mm -hmm. it helps to 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 use that uh, mm -hmm. to 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 solve this problem. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Daniel, we've also got a, a a bunch of questions coming in over the chat, um, but I might need to move on to the next speaker. So mm -hmm. if you want to jump into the chat and answer those questions there, and anyone feel free to keep um, asking Daniel questions in the chat. Yeah. Thank you. So next, we're moving on to a talk by Jack Geary. We present a method for measuring the potential for conflict in a Stackelberg game. We propose a novel reward definition that accounts for the altruistic tendencies of players and minimizes the potential for conflict. In the two-car interactive decision-making problem, each car must choose an action with the best outcome after accounting for the other car's behavior. This can be formalized as a Stackelberg game. In this setting, one car assumes the role of the leader and chooses the action that maximizes their reward. The other car, as the follower, selects their action optimally in respect to the leader's choice. In a Stackelberg game, it is presumed that the identity of the leader and follower are known. This can cause problems as, in many driving scenarios, this is not the case. In the example shown, the blue car must change lanes in order to avoid a stationary obstacle. If the blue car assumes they are the leader, they will conclude that the red car will give way to allow them to complete the merge. However, if the red car assumes the role of leader, they will expect the blue car to stay in their lane until they have passed. This ambiguity results in conflict as the cars have differing beliefs about how the problem is being solved. This naive formulation neglects altruistic tendencies often demonstrated by human drivers. Methods previously proposed in the literature, such as pure altruism or social value orientation, account for this by defining each player's reward as a wages sum of the naive rewards. In our example, if either car is sufficiently altruistic, they will decide on the same solution to the decision-making problem, irrespective of who takes the role of leader or follower, thus resolving the conflict. We propose a metric for determining to what extent a Stackelberg game is susceptible to these conflicts for a given reward definition. This allows us to compare how effectively different reward definitions resolve conflict for a given game matrix. We use the naive game matrix and the reward definition to identify regions in parameter space that result in conflict. The total size of these regions relative to the parameter space defines the incidence of conflict. We call this measure the area of conflict. 
In our example, the constraints divide the parameter space for social value orientation into four equal regions, two of which are in conflict. So the area of conflict is 0.5. Iterated methods are often applied to simulate the reasoning used by humans when solving decision-making tasks. Using similar reasoning, we utilize a novel reward definition and formulate the rewards for each car for a particular action combination as a dynamical system. By identifying the steady state of the system, we arrive at a reward definition that natively accounts for both players' altruism when evaluating the reward. We observe that this reward definition has a minimal area of conflict for the example scenario. This reward definition consistently minimizes the area of conflict for a wide range of naive reward values. In summary, in this work, we presented a metric for measuring the incidence of conflict in two-person Stackelberg games. We proposed a novel method for incorporating the altruistic tendencies of players into the decision-making process and demonstrated that this method minimized the incidence of conflict. Okay, great. Th um, thank you, Jack. Um, again, any questions, just type them into the chat, uh, chat box. Um, uh, maybe to kick things off, Jack, uh, um, uh, does this, so does this assume that human drivers are uh, altruistic? Uh, um, and if that assumption is um, sometimes broken, is there maybe anything we could do about it? Maybe infer how altruistic they are? Um, so we don't, uh, altruism score of zero would correspond to purely egoistic behavior. So that'd just be behavior mm -hmm. that's motivated on their own uh, motivations. Mm -hmm. um, future work we're planning is focusing on estimating uh, the altruism values as we've defined it for altruism and augmented altruism. Um, but there is already work out there by inferring similar parameters in other domains. Okay, great. And um, we've got a question from um, Daniel Camus. Uh, saying so, um, the oh no, hold on, sorry, I think, um, sorry, I, I think I'm reading someone else's question. Um, yeah, if there's any any more questions, feel free to add them to the chat. And and maybe uh, since there's a few speakers here, maybe address um, like everyone's been doing here, address uh, um, address who you're speaking to. Um, okay. I, okay, we um, we might need to move on. So if there's any if there's any more questions for that, uh, Jack, please uh, yeah answer them in the chat. And Jack, if you could hang around and just keep an eye on the chat um, for any questions, that'd be great. Sure, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, and then the um, final talk. Hello, I am presenting a joint work on learning a perception logic network for unsupervised scene condition driving behavior. Human vehicle driving is a complex behavior. People not only follow written traffic rules, but also tend to behave differently in various contexts. Indeed, scene condition driving behavior is subjected to human logic and an unexplored perspective in most deep learning based techniques. Our model consists of three components, a perception network for visual processing, a logic network for developing a strategy using logic variables, and expert models, modules that specialize in different driving strategies. We propose to combine the learned scene factors with a logic network that selects the appropriate driving behavior. We end-to-end -end train the perception and the logic network as retrieving intermediate supervision signals is expensive. Here, we zoom into the design of our logic network. It consists of several gating networks, each of them responsible for learning one scene factor. In particular, we use continuous approximation to the discrete Boolean variables, and to emphasize, there is no direct supervision of scene factors provided during training. Mixture of experts is a commonly used ensemble method for improved accuracy and stable convergence. However, such an architecture suffers from mode collapse as shown in many previous literature. In our case, the logic network either sticks to one expert or equally selects the experts. Thus, it degenerates to the vanilla conditional imitation learning method. We propose a diversity loss to solve mode collapse. Without diversity loss, the output of our logic network looks like the vector drawn on the left. Although we don't have the ground truth label during training, we know the expected distribution of each scene factor and thus can generate a vector that matches the target distribution. This leads to our diversity loss that makes sure the output of our logic network is under the correct distribution. In our experiments, we apply the diversity loss to every node of our logic network. We use the Carlos simulator, which is one of the closest proxies to real-world driving environment, to train and evaluate our model. 
Here, we show our results on two-factor latent logic scenario where the ground truth logic is to drive at normal speed if and only if it is clear and during noontime. We can see that our agent, with both the logic network and all diversity losses, performs its best in terms of the speed accuracy. We also evaluate the scene factor prediction accuracy to check if our logic network learns the correct visual signal that determines the driving behavior. As shown in the table, the diversity loss plays an important role in learning those factors. We show the generalizability of our method by introducing landscape as one additional scene factor besides weather and temporal. The logic role is to drive at normal speed if and only if it is in rural area and is clear weather or during noontime. From the numbers, we can see that our agent performs perfectly under such a complex logic, and the logic network learns the correct scene factors with little supervision. In conclusion, we study how to utilize visual information more wisely in order to improve the accuracy of driving behavior, and unsupervised to capture important logic decisions in images. Our perception logic network with diversity loss produces significantly better results than other baselines and ablated models. Thank you so much. Uh, so, yeah, any questions? Again, feel free to just uh, add them into the chat. Um, maybe I can go first. Um, so, so I guess, uh, like, given these logic gates, um, given that they seem to have uh, semantic meaning, um, do you think there's any extensions to this work you know, in terms of the explainability? of some of these decisions, do you think? Oh, um, looks like, oops. sorry, uh, we're muted. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good question. Like, so the logic variables like may not have semantic meaning when like train like without explicit supervision. But I think like our diversity loss and like the, and our training data makes sure that like the output of the logic network matches the expectation of like how, how many of the data follow like each traffic group. So it makes sure like it focuses on like the, the systematic meaning for states in our like training. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, any more questions for Jerry, just throw them, throw them into the chat and, and Jerry, if you can hang around on the chat to look out for any questions. Um, we're running, a, we're running a couple minutes, uh, uh, over time now. So I might, I might, um, close the questions, uh, and we're going, uh, we're going for a break now. So this is an RSS wide break. Uh, um, a lot of the other workshops are having a break, um, right now as well. Uh, we're going to come back. Uh, I realize everyone's on different time zones, but we're going to come back at 30 minutes past the hour, so in 12 minutes. Um, uh, I um, I just wanted to show you that. Um, so, as a little bit of an experiment, um, uh, so we're currently here in the schedule. Um, we do have a break room, which is in Mozilla Hubs. Um, and so uh, if you want, you could try entering that and we've got all the videos there. Um, if any of the authors of the videos want to go in, they might be able to explain their methods um, better there. Um, there is some instructions. It can be a bit noisy, but there is some instructions to basically um, go close to a video, uh, increase the volume, uh, and then also right click on the video to, to hear that video better. Um, so yeah, feel free to check it out um, anytime during the day, including now. And we, we will meet. We will meet back here in eleven minutes to hear from um, to hear a report from Anka. Okay. Thanks, everyone.
Hello, Professor. Uncle? Hi, Nikki. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you, yeah, yeah, I can see you. Good. I'll try to share my screen. Yeah, you can try. Uh, I think maybe Roland has to stop, but you can you can try. If you cannot, I will stop this. I cannot. Okay, let me. Uh, let me ask him to unstop his. Okay, let me try now. How is this? Looks good, yeah. Do you see my full slide or the presenter uh, view? Tight, uh, no, uh, uh, the whole slide, yeah. The whole slide, not the presenter view. No okay. presenter view, it's perfect. Yeah. Sounds great. I never know which screen is which.
Okay. Um, okay, I think we can start. Um, okay, uh, welcome back everyone. So this is the RS 2020 workshop on interaction data uh, decision making in autonomous driving. So in this section, again, we will have two invited talks and four contributed talks. And the next speaker is uh, Professor Anka Dragan. Anka is an assistant professor at UC Berkeley and she runs the Interact Lab. Her group will focus on uh, designing algorithms to make the robots to learn from human and to better interact with humans. So let's welcome Anka. Thank you very much. Thanks for organizing this. Um, and I'm so bummed that we can't all sit in a room together, but this will have to do. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit today on game theoretic driving. And uh, I started doing research in this era, the, really the intersection of interaction and decision-making for driving. Um, I started doing this back in 2015 with Dorsa um, for her PhD. Uh, when we identified what seemed to be a gap in how academia and to the extent that we knew industry um, as well at the time was formulating the prediction or the forecasting problem in driving. So what we figured is as what people were doing was you collected some data of human driving and if it's a model that tells you what action a human would take in any state or what probability distribution over actions. And you know, this would range from simple things like common filters to planning based methods, to behavior cloning, to, to whatnot. But then, you know, the autonomous car um, here in, in orange, I'm gonna use orange for the autonomous car in this talk. It would use that model to anticipate trajectories that the person would take in a situation and then it would plug that into its planner, which would then figure out how to maximize the robot's reward or minimize the robot's cost, if you're depending on whether you're optimistic or pessimistic. Um, and that, of course, that cost included, depended on this prediction where you think the person was going to go um, because you wanted to, at the very least, stay away from the person. Um, and so um, this seemed like the framework that uh, was kind of the standard. And this seemed odd because just imagine any kind of situation where you have some traffic, right? So say the car needs to go into the left lane to later take a turn. Any prediction algorithm in this case would be able to predict where these folks in the left lane, uh, what they're gonna do, they're gonna keep going straight. So the car can't go in between them. So now the car has two options and they both suck. So one option is to keep going and then miss the turn and reroute. Or the other option is to slow down and wait for a big enough gap in traffic. Um, but of course that makes a lot of people behind it angry. And the thing is if one of us, any one of us would actually be in this situation that the orange car is in, we would not accept being stuck in, with one of these two options. We would invent a third option, right? Which is to nudge ourselves in there because we know that the person behind will see this and will slow down and make a call. So that's how we got started on this notion of having prediction be in the planning loop. Uh, we realized that when we're doing prediction, we're kind of implicitly assuming that the human acts as if they're in isolation, not accounting for the robot. But in reality, of course, people very much take the robot into account. Now, I'm not saying that nobody had ever thought that cars um, and what cars do influences what other people do. Um, obviously, industry at least had to deal with this in some cases, because just imagine I having your autonomous car be in front of the person. If you stick purely to this framework and of prediction and then plan, um, you won't figure out that you it's okay to stop at a red light because if you slow down and you don't think that that has any effect on the human behind you think that the human could going and collide into you so you freak out and say well i can't you know i have to run the red light because i can't actually avoid collisions otherwise and so of course that that that's not how cars would work but the thing is it's part of the law to slow down and not hit the person in front of you and so it's kind of easy to adjust predictions with that uh, without really capturing how the car, the human driver is really responding to what the robot does. And there's no law that says, uh, you know, people will slow down to let you merge in. They don't have to do that. Um, so what gives? So you might think that you can solve this 
by having, and we did uh, back in the day, let's just solve this by having the human uh, prediction somehow be based on what the human predicts the robot will do. So the human prediction, the robot prediction, and then the human would sort of respond to what they think the robot will do, their own prediction of the robot. Um, but unfortunately, that doesn't quite work, right? Because um, here, the if you haven't started changing a lane, the person has no reason to predict that you'll change a lane, which means that the, your prediction of them is still that they're going to just keep going forward. And so you'll never start changing that lane to give the person a reason to slow down, and you'll be stuck in the same sort of thing again. And so the reality is that of course, what the robot plans on doing, so it's actual future actions, not what the human currently predicts that the robot will do. It's actual future actions affect what the person will eventually predict, which then affects what the person will do. And in other words, it's not just the current state and history so far that tells you what people will do. You actually need to account for the robot's uh, future actions and how they will influence the future human actions. And so our first pass at this started from this model that we were using in other settings as well that treats people as planners. So uh, the thought was that you could do some inverse reinforcement learning. You could learn a reward function that explains human driving. And then online, you could make predictions by essentially optimizing that reward function. So if you do that, the, let's say that recovery reward function is UH, you do that, you get your uh, optimal trajectory for the human, UH star, and that's your predicted trajectory. Sometimes you might add some noise around this, you might do it for different goals and have a multimodal distribution. But anyway, something like, something like this. Um, and so we started from such a model and we thought to capture the influence that the robot's future actions will um, have, uh, we could do that by saying that the person's utility also depends on what the robot does. Because, you know, for instance, the person also would like to avoid collisions with the robot. And so much like the robot's utility depends on what the person's trajectory is, um, similarly, the, the human's utility depends on the robot's trajectory. And so our model was we essentially just conditioned the um, the human prediction on the robot's trajectory. So we made it a function of the robot's trajectory, and now we computed the person's optimization sort of in response to that. And now the robot would face this nested optimization problem where it's planning for what to do such that when the person selfishly responds by optimizing their own utility, right, the combo of the robot's trajectory and the human selfish response to that trajectory is a good combo for the robot's utility or for the robot's reward. And so we would solve this uh, problem with projector optimization um, in kind of a receding horizon fashion. Um, and it turns out you can do this because you can use implicit differentiation to differentiate through the person's response, even though that's an arc map. So that's what we did. Long story short, um, now the robot would consider uh, when the robot considers what to do, it kind of has this gradient, right? That tells it how a change in its trajectory, like say if it were to move slightly towards the left, how that would influence the human's trajectory and how maybe the person would slow down a little bit the more the robot goes to the left. So it has that gradient that enables it to figure stuff out. And instead of bailing and merging behind it, you know, it would figure out that it can go in front of the human in some cases and expects that the human would appropriately respond by slowing down in order to maintain a safe distance. So that was back in 2015, 2016, right? Since then, um, I think it, there's been a lot of work that really embraced this notion that there has to be a coupling between a, a prediction or forecasting and, and planning or in control. Um, and I want to call out, there's been great work from, from Rowan with Sergey. There's been some great work from Marco Pavona's group with Ed Schmerling, uh, Max Schwager's group, and, and Daniela Russo's group. What I wanted to do today for the rest of our time together is uh, to share a little bit about how we've been continuing work in this in my lab and sort of give you two examples that I think are very nicely complementary that continue in this line of thought. So when Dorsa finished her PhD, there was uh, there's something that really bugged me still. And it goes back to this example, uh, right, of cutting someone off. So I do this, nudging myself in in heavy traffic. I used to do it all the time. I don't do it now because I'm stuck at home. But I used to do it all the time on the Bay Bridge because traffic is crazy. Um, so, so that's great. But at the same time, when I'm in the gray car and that car behind, you know, sometimes I slow down 
but I don't always slow down. So, you know, what's going on there? And yeah, okay, we had captured this type of phenomenon to a certain extent via this notion of driving style that we had. We said different people have different trade-offs, um, right, that they make between efficiency and safety and such. And the robot, we had the robot essentially estimate this driving style parameters online. So if the person wouldn't slow down, we'd figure this up and figure this out and adapt to that. But here's what bugged me. Sometimes, when I'm in that gray car, in that situation, not only do I not slow down, but I actually accelerate. Like, what's up with that? I accelerate because I know that if I accelerate, I can deter the person from getting into my lane and get them back into their lane. So the thing is that, yes, people think about the robot and they react to what the robot does, but they also know that the robot thinks about them and reacts to them. And that means that they will sometimes try to influence the robot rather than just accept the trajectory that the robot planned and call it a day and react to that. And this is really concerning, right? Because now that can lead to a loss of safety if we're unable to anticipate that, if we're unable to model or capture that. So, um, and of course I could go on. Now the robot should know that the person knows that the robot reacts to them. Um, and then the person knows that the robot knows that the person knows and it's just turtles all the way. So what's happening here is that whenever you have two agents, both making decisions that are incentivized by some utility or some objective, what you have is a general sum game. And it's a dynamic one, meaning if you've mostly heard of games in, in the setting of a one-shot game or a repeated game, that's not really gonna cut it here. This is a dynamic game because the problem is sequential, right? With an action now, I'm influencing what the state looks like later, which influences decisions that will be made later. So um, this mutual influence between the human and the robot is not one shot, it's actually, and it's not even repeated, it's really playing out over, over time sequentially. And so when kind of going back to this notion of influenceable rationality, the person responding to what the robot plans on doing, um, when we model that, we were, uh, basically we messed up the information structure in the game um, in, in two ways. Number one, people don't magically know what the robot plans on doing. So even though they will figure out eventually that the lane change is happening, that's when they'll start responding. They, won't, they don't know now that the robot plans uh, on a lane change. So they don't start responding right now. That's one issue. The other issue is that people don't take the robot's plan as fixed. They know that they can actually change and, and influence the robot. So this other student, Jaime Fisak, he had a lot of experience in game theoretic control. And he took up the challenge of fixing this, of seeing how we could get cars to better approximate the solution to this game in ways that influenceable, influenceable rationality wasn't really cutting it. And so to understand that, just to be clear about what that means, what we want is we want to find a policy for the robot and one for the human that form a Nash equilibrium. So it should be the case for the robot that its policy is optimal if you hold the human's policy fixed. So if this is the space of policies um, for the robot and then on the Y axis, we have the utility to the robot from that policy when combined with the human's policy, it should be that the robot's policy is the global optimum, right? Meaning that the robot has no incentive to change its policy from that if the human doesn't change their policy. And the same should be true for the person. Um, so that's what we want. We want a Nash. So to solve this, we'd have to do something like this. We'd start at the end of the time horizon. We'd initialize the human and robot values to zero. And then we start going back in time. So for every possible state, for every possible robot action, for every possible human action, we'd compute a Q value function based on the reward of that one action, plus the value at the next time step uh, of the resulting state. And this would give us also a distribution over robot action. So if you wanted to account for something like noisiness in the person, you could say, you could use this very standard model that says that people are exponentially more likely um, to, to take actions that have higher Q value. And so then you would have be able to compute um, the robot's Q value by looking in expectation over that distribution um, and looking at the reward the, for the robot from that combo of actions for one time step plus the future value. And uh, we'd be able to then compute the optimal robot action and update the time varying robot value. And finally, update the value to the human. And you know again, do this for backwards in time 
every time for every state, for every action of the robot, for every action of the human. Um, so keep doing this backwards in time until time zero. Um, now, th obviously this is not gonna work in continuous state in action um, like we have for cars. And so Jaime had this pretty simple idea. S what if we solve the game offline in a simplified state in action space where we could actually run this dynamic programming and then online, we'd figure out how to use those resulting value functions to influence or guide the optimizer. So if you're familiar with uh, games in AI, sometimes we refer to this as computing an evaluation function. So it's this thing that you stick at the end of your search tree if you don't wanna go in more depth. And similarly here, we're gonna, um, we're gonna be in continuous land, so we won't have a search tree, but we'll use this as our cost to go for our optimizer. Okay, so, this is our approximation to the game. It consisted of this strategic level where we would solve the game using dynamic programming in a dumbed down, discretized state in action space. And then we'd have a tactical level that actually did the work uh, using model predictive control, using optimization and using influenceable rationality or sort of our, our best kind of guess at capturing this influence. Um, but we would do that for a short time horizon and that would be guided by the strategic level. So the strategic level uh, here, we only cared about the car's position and not orientation. And uh, we assumed that we can directly control velocity. So our dynamics was mega low simplified. And of course, this is an implementation choice, but it's sort of want to do here whatever you can to actually be able to run dynamic programming. And then at the tactical level, we do the same thing as before, the thing that Dorsa did. But now each optimization on the human and on the robot side we use the computed value from the offline dynamic programming as the cost to go. So we let the value function kind of guide these optimizer using the higher level strategic information. And I'll share with you that from a practical standpoint, this wasn't just cool because it captured the game, but I guess one thing that we noticed was that um, it, it was a great way, as you might expect, to alleviate the, the optimizer's myopia. Like we could never plan for a long enough time horizon. And, and also we were computing, we were using local optimizers, right? So we computed local optima. And these issues, this, we were running in these, into these issues. Like we, the car wouldn't be able to figure out an overtake because the horizon wasn't long enough to figure out that it could actually get back into this lane and that would work out for it. And, and so we also got a lot of benefits from using this value function, just from alleviating these issues on, on the optimizer itself, besides the guiding from this like strategic interaction level. So I just wanted to make that point. And even if you don't want to solve a game, this, you know, this seems like a useful thing to do. Um, so now some beautiful strategies kind of emerge. So you have the car in the back, um, so there's a computed solution here. You, the car figures out that it can go and kind of deter the person to go out of the way um, and change lanes to the right so that it can keep going. And if they do that, that's great. But if they don't, that's also okay. So what happens is the car kind of attempts this, the person is not reacting, and then the car um, ends up doing an overtake. And the heat map you see here, that's the value function for the robot. And then this is a really, I think the coolest example. So here on the, let's focus on the left first. So on the left, what happens is the car, there's some these obstacles coming up and I'll play, I'll go back and, and play this again, if I can, maybe not. Um, so the car does this overtake expecting that the person would slow down and the person does slow down. And then on the right, it's really interesting. So here on the right, Let me do that again. So let's focus on the right-hand side now. The car goes, it does this, it tries to do this thing, but the human actually accelerates to deter the car and the car has to slow down and go behind. So I love seeing like now this, when we got these sort of results, it actually felt to me like, you know, coordination and negotiation uh, was happening and these planners were able to handle that. So um, anyway, so that was Jaime's story. And again, the idea here was that we could get close to solving the game if we, if we approximated the heck out of it offline and then guide it, use that to guide the online solution. And then the last story that um, I wanted to share with you was David. So David Friedrich Kahl, he's actually a student with Claire Tolling, but we were collaborating on this project together. 
And um, he took a very different, and I'd say complementary approach. So remember that what we wanted to find in these general sum games was a Nash. And um, when I say a Nash, right, what I define is a global Nash equilibrium and we're in continuous spaces, high dimensional problems. So of course the global Nash is out of reach and the, the hierarchical approximation was one way to get towards some version of that. But David thought, what if we went about it a different way? What if we, from the get-go, stopped asking for a global Nash because we know we're not gonna get that and understood that all we might hope for is a local Nash. So a local Nash works similarly to the global. A local Nash um, here, the policy only needs to be best in a local neighborhood as opposed to global. So going in with this mindset, David had this really clever idea. And the idea is honestly so obvious in hindsight that I thought for sure someone had, must have thought about this. Uh, we didn't find a paper um, and so we wrote one, but you know, who knows, it might be out there. But here's the idea. Um, so David's observation starts with this analogy to single player problems. So this is your standard optimization here that you want to do single player, no issues. Um, and, uh, you know, so far we've talked about kind of gradient based methods. That's what we were using to solve these problems. Like, for instance, when we we're doing prediction of the human's trajectory for influenceable rationality, we we're using gradient, um, gradient based methods, quasi, quasi Newton methods. So we're using the gradient to approximate a Hessian. But there's this very widely adopted technique in the driving domain, um, which is uh, ILQR, Iterative Linear Quadratic Regulator. So the way this works, if you don't know about it, uh, and I'm sure most of you do, um, you, you end up with, you start with some initial policy, you get a trajectory by rolling that out, you linearize the dynamics, quadraticize the cost, and lo and behold, now you have a wonderful problem with the quadratic cost and linear dynamics, which we know how to solve very well. And so you'd use that to update your strategy and do that iteratively. So the observation in, uh, in, in LQR is that, uh, well, if I have linear quadratic problems, that's really easy. So let's just use that, leverage that easiness and iteratively, iteratively approximate uh, the problem as an LQR. And David noticed, hmm, this is true for linear quadratic games as well. Linear quadratic games are easy. The world is beautiful when you have quadratic costs and linear dynamics, even in games, it turns out. And so the idea was, let's iteratively approximate the problem as an LQ game. And so we do what we do in ILQR, except that you get to this point where, oops, whoops, my animations are a little messed up, sorry about that. So you still linearize dynamics, but now you quadraticize the costs because you have multiple, you solve the LQ game and you update your strategy. And so um, uh, real quick, I don't wanna take up too much more time. So if I have my current trajectory, and this, can, this generalizes nicely to many different players, not just two. So you have your trajectory, you, um, uh, you just linearize your dynamics, around the current trajectory, you, whoops, you quadraticize your cost. And then to compute the LQ game solution, you just have coupled Riccati equations, which you can solve. And uh, the thing that I wanted to point out is, whoops, going back here. The thing that I want to point out is the runtime, which is really exciting. So at every step, the runtime is cubic in the dimensionality of the state space and in the number of players, which is, you know, not great, but pretty good considering that you're solving a game. And so here's an example um, that we tried out. So this was a three player general sum game where we had a pedestrian and two cars. The, so the total, the, the state space is 14 dimensional here. And um, let's see, there were basically people wanted to avoid collisions and people wanted to stay in their lanes. So here's kind of the solution unfolded and you'll, you'll see some interesting things happen here. Like if you look on the left, the green car initially slows down and turns slightly to allow the pedestrian to cross. And in the meanwhile, the red car sort of quickly accelerates in front of the green car and then it decelerates and uh, uh, kind of turns to give the pedestrian extra clearance. And you kind of see this type of interaction unfolding. And again, solving this game from scratch, 
would take us under a quarter of a second on a very standard laptop. And then we also tried this with real people because real people are obviously gonna, well, real, I should say, uh, you know, kind of authors or people very close to authors are not quite real people. But the point is that even, even people in the know deviate from these strategies computed, right? Obviously the way we move is not gonna be exactly the solution to this, uh, to the game. Or it's not, definitely not in the way we compute it um, with our approximation. So the robot, what does that mean? It means that the robot has to recompute a solution at every step. So here we wanted to just demonstrate this as a, as a proof of concept uh, of this mode of operation. So you have a robot, we have mocap, everyone's moving slowly, sorry about that. It's not really up to scale, but uh, essentially the, the, what's happening here is that we're resolving the game every quarter second and each invocation converges under 50 milliseconds. And the idea is that by formulating the problem as a game, now the robot will anticipate the human's collision avoiding behavior. And then because we're solving this receding horizon, horizon invocation, it can handle the human, you know, the humans kind of inevitably deviate from the, these perfectly crafted strategies. Okay, so that's what I wanted to share in game theoretic driving. This is just an, a quick update on what's been happening recently in my lab on continuing on this notion of coupling prediction and planning and really treating them as as one entity um, in terms of kind of looking forward of course there are there are many things to be sorted out and one thing that i'm particularly curious about is how you can kind of merge these two approaches the jaime approaches the david approach together to get sort of the best of these of these two worlds i think they're very compatible um, so that's one and then of course uh you know finding ways to to really deal with partial information in that is another thing that's very much on my mind. I'll kind of go in a little bit beyond what we were able to previously do when we were doing some info gathering to figure out, you know, is this person aggressive or defensive? What's their driving style? Um, and then of course, fixing these models, which I think Dorsa also talked about in, in, in the morning. Um, uh, you know, people aren't really all that rational, but it turns out they have these systematic biases that we can actually um, hope to, um, at least devise models that are a little bit more flexible in allowing for that. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening and I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, um, thank you very much, Professor Anka Gagan. So we got some questions. Um, just before I read out the questions, just to, as a reminder, if you have any questions, please send them over the chat. So uh, the first question for um, Anka is, um, how does the runtime scale with number of uh, interacting agents? And there are many, is there any approximations if we wish to scale the situations with many players? Yeah, so uh, with, with David's approach, it's cubic in the number of agents. And so, I mean, that's not amazing, but that's, that's pretty great. Um, back with Dorsa's approach, uh, you, would, you would sort of do it independently per agent, or ex I should say, if you want to scale Dorsey's approach to multiple agents, you do this, uh, this um, thing where whatever you're using to deal with, with non-influenceable predictions, whether you're doing it per agent, right, which is then linear, or whether you're doing some sort of joint optimization, for instance, so sometimes people do that, they kind of treat all agents as collaborative collaborating with each other and planning in that space. Now you just modify that to depend on the, on the robot's action. So I think that's, you know, that has the advantage of, of it's fairly straightforward to scale, but it, it unfortunately has this kind of broken information structure, which got us very far, but it, you know, had some, some issues to iron out. So, but with David's approach, it's actually, um, that's, that that is really nicely scalable. L2 games are actually pretty nice to solve even with multiple players. I see, cool. Yeah, and um, then we got a second question from Jack. So um, how difficult would the reward function used to be learned and uh, particularly in practice? For example, um, how much do the method performance rely on, on unknown or why define interacting components to the reward? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So. Um, there's, there 
are approaches that do sort of instead of inverse reinforcement learning, or really I, I'd call that inverse optimal control. Instead of that, mm -hmm. it's like an inverse game <laughs> approach. So actually, takes into account the fact that the players are solving a game. Um, the but but I feel like in general that's an area that's highly underexplored. And so, for instance, with Dorsa, um, we kind of cheated and and we would solve the IRL by kind of giving the person access to, to the, the, you know, you collect some data and just from that data, you don't have a plan, right? But you can sort of use what actually ended up happening as the plan and then run the IRL based on that, for instance, is one thing you could do. And, you know, it's, it, it's certainly not ideal. I think it's just, you can get away with stuff like that until you don't. And I think that's kind of the lesson with all of this, right? You can get away with predictions that don't get influenced by your robot until you don't. You can get away with IRL methods that don't fully capture that until you don't. The other thing, um, sorry, go on a rant, but something that is very related to this question that is really hard to do as well is running IRL properly when what you're gonna do is model predictive control. So, you know, the fact that, that these things are not plans that you stick with, but you replan at every step, right? Um, you, when we run IRL, we always kind of pretend like that's going to be, that, that that's what we're, we're actually going to do. But you don't see the person's plans. You just see, right, the first step of each plan. And we kind of assumed that that was the plan from the get-go. But of course it wasn't because it gets recomputed at every step. So that's very, really, sorry to hijack the question, but I was very related to that question. And I think those two are very important issues in running inverse reinforcement learning right now. I think people should work on that. I'd love to see work on that. Okay, cool. And uh, yeah, we have two more questions. So uh, the third one is from Lion Paul. So he is asking like in the game theory approach, is there any a way to straightforward, like a straightforward way to add extra constraints? Like for example, the pedestrian had the right way to cross the crosswalk. Are these types of relationships enabled? Yeah, so so about that, I mean, my, my method of choice would be to actually add it as, um, as a signal in the utility. Now the utility, um, when you're doing dynamic programming, you don't care if the utility is differentiable or not. When you're doing optimization, you know, you might wanna have something differentiable. And so hard constraints might be a little more tricky to, tricky to capture, um, but certainly there's work. So there's work in, in um, ILQR with constraints, obviously. Um, and and uh, I, I don't think it'd be too much of a mathematical endeavor to, to try to um, scale that work to the ILQ game setting. Um, but I will say that, I don't know, hard, you know, hard constraints like the pedestrian will cross. Um, you might not wanna do that just because just because that's the rule doesn't mean that people actually follow it. So that's why I actually prefer the approach that puts it as kind of as part of the utility and not necessarily linear. I'm not trying to advocate for linear trade-offs because they're total garbage, but, but somehow incorporates it as this is a criterion that influences what's going to happen, but doesn't dictate or strictly enforce what's going to happen because you'll see cars going in front of, of people and people going when they don't have right away and so on. Okay, yeah. Um, and then the last question is from Rohan. So he's asking, how could the game theory approach to be evaluated and tested in real scenarios, not only in simulation and indoor like uh, robot environment? Yeah, so you have to understand that I run a lab, I don't have a, a car. So our best proxy for, you know, real people, real robot is in, in, in an indoor environment. Um, I think that, that uh, I, the, the goal of these two approximations that I presented was very much that you can actually run them in the wild. So I think that, you know, with Jaime's approach, remember that you're doing something offline that then is very cheap. You just have a table that you're indexing in online and um, that, that drive, and otherwise you're doing a pretty standard optimization. You could do nested, by the way, just a kind of a quick thing there. Jaime discovered that once you have this value that's kind of telling you what to do at the strategic level and influencing your optimizer, 
there's not so much benefit of doing the full nested optimization like in Dorsa's meta at the tactical level. You could get away with coordinate ascent. So that's what we ended up using in the paper. So coordinate ascent, it is not a great name for this, but it's you, you know, you you take a step on the robot's trajectory, take a step on the human's trajectory, each solving their own optimization problem, sort of in parallel like that. Um, and that's really cheap, right? And now you have the value that you're indexing in. And so th this is actually very much something that you can do in real time. And similar for David with ILQ Games, I already talked a little bit. I gave some numbers of what it takes on, you know, with, with some, David's pretty good at C++. Actually, I wouldn't say that his grad student code. He's very, he's legit, um, but he's, he's done much more than I could have ever done, even in grad school, let alone now. But, um, but still, you know, the, the, it was, you know, just run it on a standard laptop and you can solve this every, every, with his code, we were solving it in 50 milliseconds every time we were resolving it. Like, if that's not real time, I don't know what else to give you. So that that's where we, that's where will be very cool. So uh, I think we're still like five minutes ahead of schedule. So I kind of got one more question for you. Um, so yeah, just combining your uh, work and uh, what those are presented in morning. So mm -hmm. um, what's your view? Like uh, like people right now have. Uh, two kind of two groups. One is using uh, game theory, the other is um, doing more like end-to-end -end learning, deep learning methods. So yeah. what's your like comments, like in terms of combining both or like, a, yeah, which way should we go? Which yeah, way can you go? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, who the heck knows, but let me, I, I'll, I'll just, I'll muse on the topic. Um, so I think, I think that, you kind of need both approaches from just from the perspective that when you do things more, let me call it more imitation learning style, policy learning style, you'll end up with these gaps um, because you're using such a hyper expressive function class, right? You end up inevitably with not being able to really extrapolate past the data you have. So I will, I would default to such a method when it's very close to the data, right? And then I would trust something that's based on, on more, more the planning approach for you know, these situations that are a little bit outside of what we might have seen a lot of examples of. And with the right way to get that combo, right? What does it mean that you're, you're close to the data, right? What does it mean that you're out of distribution? But does it mean that you're experiencing some form of covariate shift? That's something that I, you know, I think that's where a lot of research needs need to go into. But so just from a very high level, I'd say policies that are that are very large deep neural networks are very, very, very expressive. And that's a blessing and a curse because there are just going to be many such policies that are going to be consistent with the data that you're seeing. And only a few of them are going to do outside of that data anything remotely like what a human would do. And so at the very least, you know, you have to be able to, to, uh, to either figure out that you have uncertainty and are confused in those situations, or I think even better, um, in, in such a case, sort of default on, on something that has that structure that's not perfect, that underfits for sure, but that you know can 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 deal with, with those types of things. I wrote a I wrote one paper on this. It's good, it's, it's called uh, it's for HRI. It's on the utility of model-based modeling humans in HRI or something like that. It was a couple of years ago where we talked at more length about these issues. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think that would be all for um, anchor session. So thank you very much for attending and giving the wonderful talk and the discussion. Thank you very much for having me and for organizing this. Yeah, sure. And if you uh, do you mind like unshare, yeah, you already are here, sorry. So, <laughs> so uh, I will go for the next speaker. So our next speaker is Charlie Tang. He's a deep learning researcher, engineer, and entrepreneur. He obtained his PhD in 2015 in machine learning from the University of Toronto. His recent work includes many aspects of deep learning in autonomous systems. So um, Charlie, uh, I will unmute you. So one second. 
Uh, can you unmute yourself right now? Yes. Uh, hi. Can uh, can everyone, everyone hear me? Yeah, it's all yours. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Li Ting. And I also want to thank uh, Rowan and uh, and Igor for um, you know, organizing the workshop. And uh, I'm really excited to speak with you guys today. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, um, I might have to lock back in, apologize uh, real quickly. So give me um, maybe 10 seconds. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, in the meanwhile, like uh, maybe you can, um, if you still have more questions for previous talks, you can still post on the chat. And then we can, because in the afternoon we have a panel session. So we will, uh, we will be still be able to answer some of the questions. Hi Charlie, we can see we can see your screen. You can start right now. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, had a permission issue. So, um, okay, so um, yeah, excellent talk by um, uh, Inka, um, and I want to follow up with uh, continuation on how to do planning um, with these kind of negotiation, and, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, deep reinforcement learning, um, how to make it robust. So. Um, just an overview on a typical sort of autonomous system, autonomous systems uh, um, framework. Um, what typically you'll, you'll have is you'll have a perception stack, um, that module that takes cameras or lidars and, and basically does tracking and detection. Um, and then you'll have um, um, the state of the world basically formulated um, uh, for you and then um, you'll, you'll do predictions and then, and then followed by planning. Um, and then in the end, you have the controls. So that's the typical framework. And um, we're gonna, for, for the sake of this talk, um, we're gonna assume that perception um, is gonna be really good, almost perfect. Um, and we're gonna focus, simply focus on predictions and planning part. So um, the kind of situation we're really interested in is uh, what's known as negotiations. So imagine we're the green vehicle and we're trying to merge onto the highway. Uh, so we have to make sure that the gap is open and we're, um, we can safely and robustly merge onto the highway. So, so this is the kind of problem. And so you, you might ask, well, why, this, why is this hard? Humans does this you know, every single day. Um, why is this hard for a computer uh, algorithms? And the reason is that we must be able to, to act in response to how other actions are, act, I, sorry, agents are reacting to, to our actions. All right, so uh, because our actions can influence the behaviors of other agents on the road, um, one thing we can do is we can have really good predictions. So we have we had a paper last year at the Mirabs on exactly this: how do you do multiple mode, multimodal predictions? And um, this is uh, this is a widely studied um, area. Um, Rowan has uh, also has worked on this in the space um, in the past. And the idea is that if you have really good predictions then you can, you can then formulate this, this entire problem as a search problem, right? You can, you can, you can um, use predictions as the edges in this, uh, the search tree and then find a state that uh, in the future that you think it's, uh, it's gonna be good. So um, low, just a little sort of high level, high level overview on what, how do we do multiple modal, multi multimodal predictions? Um, it's very simple. You're trying to forecast the future trajectories of 
um, yourself and as well as other agents on the, in the environment. Um, but the key here is that you have to watch out for multiple possible future paths. Um, so this, this what's called multimodal predictions and also agent agent interactions, right? So if you look at the, um, this example, how the different interactions of who whom yields to whom really affects the future trajectory um, that you're able to forecast. So these are the key, key problems. Um, in this work, we came up with a sort of uh, end to end framework that took the state of the world at time t as the input and then really used multiple re, um, RNNs to encode the state of the, each agent independently um, before adding context and also then combining the information um, and then forecasted the sort of latent variables, discrete latent variables that can represents different modes such as um, conservative driving behaviors versus aggressive um, or left turn uh, going straight or U-turn. These, these are sort of these latent discrete modes that, um, that we can then estimate the probabilities of um, before then using decoding RNNs uh, to forecast the trajectory of the world um, sort of on Rome into the future. So, so this is the architecture that we used. Um, and this is one of many ways that, uh, that you can use to, you can learn a data-driven prediction um, algorithm directly from just simply pure trajectory data. Um, so, so is that all we need to solve this problem, um, circling back? And the, um, the, the question is, is, is actually, you know, I, I don't think it's the, 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 the full solution. And the reason is because um, the number of possibility will explode exponentially in, in terms of the number of agents you have or the interaction you have in the environment. And you really need really good predictions in order to, to make the system work. And then it has to be computationally feasible, right? So, so we have to make decisions, um, you know, typically something like every 100 milliseconds um, real time. So you know, if it takes a minute, um, you know, 20 seconds to compute a really good solution, we have a large number of leaf nodes, then that's not gonna work. So, so that's all good. Um, um, you know, if you guys are interested in details, if anyone's interested in details, uh, please uh, um, check out the, the archive paper. Um, but for, for this talk, I'm gonna focus on something that's more end-to-end. -end. So combining both the prediction and the uh, planning module uh, and leveraging deep, deep, deep RL, deep reinforcement learning for this. Um, the, uh, at the high level, deep reinforcement learning is able to let us automatically discover policies uh, to do this instead of, uh, instead of hand coding sort of uh, different uh, policy classes such as a lane change or overtake, um, we, we, we just want to let the deep learning, deep reinforcement learning algorithm to, to find out the optimum policy. Um, and so that's the advantage, but the disadvantage is that it requires simulation and then um, as simulation becomes more and more realistic, the hope is that our policy would also become real realistic and not overfit to the simulation. That's the biggest challenge, it would be overfitting. Okay, so um, for those of you who might not be familiar with, uh, with RL, um, I'm gonna give uh, just a brief overview. So with the whole situation framework of reinforcement learning, you have an environment. Um, that's, this could be your simulation or it could be the real world. And then you'll have an agent that lives in the environment that observes certain states and it's able to, uh, it's able to ex execute an action within the environment. And then the environment will provide rewards back to the agent. Uh, what we care about is the, one of the things we care about is the value function, which basically specifies how valuable a particular state is. And we also care about learning a policy function that really is, um, that tells us what sort of actions to take in any particular state. And then if we use, uh, uh, we can use deep, deep neural nets uh, for the policy function. So, so that's the sort of the, the formulation. And um, what we've looked at is a very simple 2D traffic simulation, scenario, 2D scenario simulation. Um, so here you see that uh, we have a very simple um, environment overlaid on a satellite image. And the goal here is that you wanna go from randomly from an A, B or C location, a lane, lane ID to one of the D, D or F uh, destination lane IDs. This is known as a double, double lane, lane change or a zipper merge. And it's one of the, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge because um, cars are trying to merge off the highway at the same time when, um, when other cars are trying to merge on. So, so in our case, our agents are obviously a vehicle. Um, we're gonna use a, um, uh, a standing controller 
as well as a kinematics bicycle model for to simulate the dynamics um, and it gives us a little bit of uh, real, more realism. The action space consists of both steering, acceleration, and uh, turn signals. Um, so here, this, uh, these are some examples of what we can do to simulate different uh, traffic scenarios. You have a roundabout, you have um, a left turn, and then you have uh, different merges. Uh, so it's fairly flexible in, in this regard. Um, the, the way we approach our representation learning is, um, is, is, is this. So we have an environment that has different, uh, different agents and different velocities and different states. Um, we need to convert that into a vectorized representation because neural nets like vectorized representations. So this is known as uh, state encoding. And what we do is we take um, a top-down view um, and render into, into an image. And then we take successive uh, images across times, so in this case, uh, the past four frames. Um, and we treat as an image, so we perform convolution on this. Then we also have the relative distance of the ego vehicle ourselves, the self-driving car, to the other vehicles in the environment. So, so these are low dimensional uh, relative uh, codes. Um, and we feed that into a policy function. So this is how we sort of encode the environment into something that the, the deer nets uh, prefer and can understand. And obviously the advantage of uh, you know, training and simulations that we can parallelize this. Um, so the algorithm we use is a distributed version of uh, PPO um, and then we can create multiple environments um, simultaneously and then they'll learn to, to update the, the same policy function. And th these, are, these are examples of doing training. You see that uh, it makes mistakes and uh, it'll restart the, the environment um, many, many times. Okay, so one of the interesting thing we, uh, we observe after training is that uh, that the policies can learn automatically to use turn signals to induce open a gap. So in this case, in this case, um, in this merge case, you have lots of basically cars, the blue cars, and there really isn't a gap to safely merge on, right? But it has learned that if you use turn signal, um, a gap would open up and it's a good idea to do that. So, so again, this is, uh, this is the power of deep RL, with me, uh, meaning that we didn't have to hand code any of this, uh, these kind of maneuvers or policies such as turning on turn signal um, into the system. It basically automatically discovered that this is a useful thing to do. And that's the advantage of power um, of, of deep RL. Okay, so, so our training setup is, uh, uh, is this. And what you see here is that the initial policy is trained in the midst of the so-called rule-based adaptive cruise control agents that, that are in blue, right? So they're very simple program agents that basically stays in your lane, the simple lane changes, um, not to collide with the person in front and, and so on. So, uh, so after initial training, you'll have, um, so here's something, an edge case um, that's considered to be failure. Uh, what happened is that the blue car sort of tries to merge on the same, um, same middle lane. And then basically this, uh, this causes the RL policy to, uh, to basically go off, um, off the side. And this is, a, this is essentially a, a problem that, um, that simulation would basically, um, a typical sim problem with simulation, which is the reinforcement learning policy train can, can often more fit. Um, and when you, have a, when you have a policy, when you have behavior from other agents that they're slightly different or different than the agent that, agents that are part of your training environment, then that's when potential problem can happen. Um, so, so what we want to do is we want to actually turn to self-play um, to, to help with this, to improve our performance. And the way we do that is, is self-play, and I'll talk about this um, um, in the next slide, but really allows us to learn really interesting behaviors from a, very, from a relatively simple environment. Um, the, the environment is simply just a, essentially a lane graph. Um, so how do we do this? Um, well, so it's very simple at the high level instead of using these programmed AI agents or smart agents, um, we simply replace more agents in the environment with our neural network policy. Um, so, and what you see here is that during a typical training run, a typical episode, we'll sample from, um, from, a, from our existing neural network policy learned and we'll randomly place them um, as sort of other sparring partners, so to speak, within our environment. Um, and, this, and these screenshots are exactly the sort of the input uh, rendered representation that these, uh, these, these, these 
um, our neural network really sees. Okay, so so if we do that, do this, let's look at how training progresses. Um, so what you see here is the the sort of the training curve um, for the first stage where there's, there's no self play. Um, the green is the success rate. So how often do you go from A, B, or C to D, E, or F successfully? And then you have collisions. Uh, in simulation and you have out of bounds, which means that the car went off the, the road. Um, so this is really good. This is what we expect. Um, as the number of parameters gets updated, uh, we'll have uh, better and better um, uh, performance. That's stage one. Uh, for stage two and, and three, what happens is that we injected um, other reinforcement learning agents as part of the environment. Um, so because the, the distribution of the policy changed, um, you'll see a huge drop in performance initially, but they quickly, you know, uh, as we train for a thousand iterations, it'll, it'll go back up. And for stage three, we'll mix in with different, uh, also different set of uh, policy distributions um, for the other agents uh, in the simulation, in the training environment. And same kind of things happen. You'll have different stages um, in performance with, uh, with also jump. Okay, so so that's, um, that's real quite simple. I mean, this self-play thing is being used in AlphaStar um, amongst other sort, of, um, uh, other sort of works from OpenAI, for example. And it's really shown to, to be a, a really good uh, technique for adding diversity right, to, to, the, to the environment. And, and when you have more diversity in your training environment, especially for reinforcement learning, um, you're gonna have more robust policy and it will generalize better. So let's look at some qualitative examples um, of some of the behaviors that are possible that are, you know, that are being learned. Um, so here you're looking at the green vehicle. We're trying to do a, the right lane change and initially it braked because the car in front of it broke um, and then it did a lane change um, and emerged onto yellow. Yellow is the destination lane ID. And here's another example. Uh, this, now we're trying to merge onto the middle lane um, and, uh, and it's, it waits for a bit and then decides, okay, um, I'm gonna overtake because these guys are really slow in the middle. Um, the, blue, the blue cars in this, in this example are the rule-based agents and then the red are other reinforcement learning neural network-based policies. Here's another example. This is a um, similar kind of example, but in this case, uh, if you look really closely, I don't know how, maybe you guys can't really see this, um, but it'll, um, after getting really close to the center lane, it sort of pivots back to the, uh, the, you know, the, the right lane and to uh, automatically give itself a gap, um, a margin. Um, and then finally, this is another example. Um, this is a yielding. So um, this is a, you'll see an emergency kind of break uh, to yield to the car, cutting uh, the green car off. Um, so so again, if you look at these kind of behaviors, um, it's, it's just, it really is hard to hand code um, maneuvers like this um, using traditional logic because people typically have uh, something like uh, going straight, you just keep in the middle of your lane, um, and, then, and then it's a finite state machine where now if you're doing lane change, now you're going to you, you'll, uh, compute a lane change curve. So, the, so, so compared to those kind of robotics approaches, um, the reinforcement learning, learning policies are just more smooth. Um, it's really hard to sort of quantize or qualify what they're actually doing, except that it's trying to maximize the, the uh, the reward that we give it. And the reward in this case would be, um, you get a positive reward for completing the maneuver, uh, going to the correct destination, um, you get a negative reward for collisions and, uh, and also going out of bounds. Um, and then you'll have some velocity sort of um, rewards for going at a reasonable speed and so on. So is this perfect? Well, it's not perfect. Um, so if you look at the left example, this is the emerging break example, this is kind of interesting. So. What happened is that uh, the green vehicle went through this kind of emergency to deceleration, um, and um, and but it also, also noticed that it turned its wheel uh, around. So maybe it found that this is a good way to increase the the braking um, distance or or um, you know make it easier to brake. I'm not sure, but this is the interesting kind of thing that the policy ever learned. Uh, we also have some rear end collisions um, that happens. Um, rarely, but it does happen. And so in these cases, the car tries to brake, but it's not, it's not able to brake hard enough or um, avoid a collision. So this is, so I think the, these are the key challenge in the future is how do you make it more robust? How do you make collisions, uh, basically eliminate all collisions? Um, and, um, 
and we can look quantitatively. So the result of the simulate the self play is that we are able to improve performance from essentially 63% um, with a simple program policy all the way up to 98.2%. Um, and then these different populations are um, sort of mixture of diff different agent types um, that we use for different stages, right? So if you look at the stages, stage zero, one, two, three, so for stage two, uh, we're essentially using um, uh, training with population three. And then population three is a mixture between um, these programmed IDM agents, intelligent driving model agents, a mixture of R agents, mix mixture of uh, uh, the first stage self play agent. So you can, there's different ways you can play with the mixture uh, to synthesize the population of uh, training agents that, that you wanted to, to learn from. Um, okay, so, um, you know, for more details, um, you guys can feel free to check out the, the paper on archive. Um, but in summary, we've shown that self play is really useful, um, but there is still sort of ways to, to, to go in terms of making it more, again, making it more robust um, and safe. So, Continue on, I wanna uh, talk more about a, a different sort of uh, different work, but continuation on how to make it robust. Um, this is, so this, in this example here, it's really sort of uh, characterize what we mean by robust. Um, so the fact that we don't really know what the other vehicle, in this case, the, the, the gray vehicle in front of us is really thinking about, um, is, is, is really leads to inherent uncertainty or stochasticity in the, uh, in the future of what the future uh, value of, of the state. Right, so the person in front of us could be, they could be aggressive, they, they could yield to us, or they could not let us uh, make the turn. So we don't really know. And the question is, in the face of this uncertainty, how are we able to make robust um, decisions and safe decisions? Um, and so for this, we introduce something called, what we call worst cases policy gradients. Um, and the idea here is that because there's inherent uncertainty in the environment, uh, what we want to do is we want to model the, the entire return, not as a single scalar, but as a distribution. Okay, so we're still, still going to use something like actor critic. This is a standard um, reinforcement learning uh, technique uh, in the space. But the critic, instead of outputting a single a Q value, which is a scalar, is going to learn to, to model the entire distribution. And then we're going to optimize for risk sensitive criteria. In this case, uh, we'll talk about the, uh, the criteria um, in the next slide. Uh, but this really is a modification um, so that we can actually have better generalization, better robustness. So how do we actually do this? Okay, so, so in this case, the environment here will be the entire environment of the state. Um, and then our green kind of green sort of uh, trajectory could be action. The action could be just simply step on the gas and, and turn the wheel, um, or it could be a trajectory, right? So, so, that, so that could be, um, so any of those things could be an action. And now if you look at, what standard RL is doing, or even distribution RL, is that it's trying to maximize the, the red bar. So the red bar indicates the Q function. The Q is the expected um, future return. And so it's trying to adjust the policy so that we can push the red bar to the right. Um, now, um, in contrast with worst cases policy gradient, what, what we're proposing is that we're proposing to optimize not for the, the entire expectation of the entire distribution, but rather the expectation only up to the alpha percentile of, of the distribution, right? So we're, we're saying that we, we don't care about the average uh, you know, expected return. We care about what the, uh, what the best return would be under the worst possible scenarios, right? So the future return is a scalar value. Uh, the worst case scenario is where the future return is, is negative. In this case, a collision or near, near miss. Um, so that's essentially the main difference. Now, if we do that, um, what that really means is that we would prefer the policy theta one over policy theta two, okay? Even though if theta one has a lower expectation, that's a yellow. Uh, and the reason is because it has a lower variance, right? So it has a higher conditional value at risk. That's what CVAR means. Um, so, so that's what we're essentially optimizing for. Now, how do we actually do this? Um, so, so again, uh, the first thing is that the return is not a, it's not a, it's not a scalar anymore. The return is actually a distribution. So it's a random variable that's called Z. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to make our critic, uh, to model both the mean and the variance, um, over the Z. So we're assuming this is a Gaussian distribution. Um, and the reason is that this will lead to a really nice, 
uh, closed form computation uh, for the CVAR. And, um, and because we have distribution, then we have an equivalent distributional Bellman operator, right? So, so instead of the, the normal Bellman operator, Bellman equation um, will have a distributional version of it. And I won't go into too, too much details of the math, but, um, but the update is basically, there's two, two parts to it. The first part is the standard um, the update with the Q, so the Bellman operator that you would use for Q learning. The second part is this epsilon, um, which represents our variance of the Z of the future return. And, um, and the derivation basically shows that we can also relate the variance from state S prime and A prime, which is the future state, um, to our current state S and, S and A. So this is sort of the equivalent uh, backup for the variance uh, for in, in sort of the TD learning sense. And then once we have that, we're going to update the, so this will be the target um, epsilon, target, target uh, distribution over the future. We're going to optimize the, uh, the Washington metric um, from our predicted uh, distribution with the target distribution. So, so this is just, um, um, so, so, we, so now we have a way to update our critic. Um, so with that, how do we update our actor? Um, so what we do is we take our critic um, and we, and given our estimate of the distribution over Z, the future return, um, we can compute our ups, um, this gamma pi value. And this is the, up, the conditional value risk. Uh, and we can compute in closed form because this relates to um, the Q Q CDF and PDF the standard normal distribution. So it's really quick to compute. And, um, and this is highlighted in red. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the, the conditional value risk up uh, gamma pi, and we're going to back propagate it through, the, through our critic and then also through, the, the, through our actor. Um, our overall objective, this is, this, this is the standard policy gradient objective is, is denoted as um, uh, integral over the states and then integral over the different actions weighted by this, uh, this uh, CBAR conditional value risk epsilon pi term um, that substitutes essentially our Q, Q, Q function. And we, we have a theorem in the paper that shows that using sort of a similar uh, approach as a policy gradient theorem, uh, we can turn this into a, um, uh, the gradient to a gradient expectation um, and the gradient of the log of the policy, um, again, weighted by this, uh, this gamma, gamma value. So the one interesting thing here that we have that falls essentially out of the fact that our gamma pi is conditioned by the alpha is this, we have this alpha knob, right? So you can think of this as a scalar that goes from zero to one. Um, and if it approaches zero, the policy itself will become very risk averse. Um, if alpha goes to one, this becomes risk neutral and this uh, essentially would, uh, would, would basically uh, fall into, um, into a uh, standard uh, uh, sort of actor critic DDPG kind of style. And this really gives us a sort of a family of, uh, of policies that, are, uh, that will be risk, um, risk aware. Um, and then, so that's kind of interesting. So, so in the end, in summary, um, worst case policy gradient what we're proposing is a combination of distribution of RL, uh, conditional value at risk, and then the standard uh, deep deterministic policy gradients. It's computationally efficient because we don't have to, um, unlike other sort of papers, there's a few other papers uh, related to optimizing for CVAR. Um, a lot of, some of them require sampling. In this case, we don't, we have a closed form uh, computation. And at the very high level, since instead of having a 1D output for a critic, we have a two dimensional output. Um, and then there's extensions where you can have a mixture of Gaussians or a mixture of other kind of distributions as well. But right now with the simplest um, um, case, it's essentially just one more dimension for, for your critic. Um, and again, this leads to a family of uh, risk sensitive policies. Okay, so, um, so what happens here is that similar environment um, we've put experiment, you know, experiments on uh, that, you, that um, showed earlier. Um, and I wanna show you some experimental results. So, so what you're looking at this plot is basically a plot of the average episodic test reward um, as a function of the alpha knob that I, that I showed earlier, right? So as we turn alpha, um, this way becomes slower, lower, um, the variance decreases as expected and we don't have any collision. So collision would in this case give a negative 50 uh, reward. Um, as you see, it's uh, basically limits uh, collisions, which, which makes sense. Um, what also that leads to is that the average time it takes to finish this episode of making an unplanned left turn um, would be increased because qualitatively, it just wastes longer, waits for a bigger gap before it makes the, makes the maneuver, which makes sense as well. 
And then lastly, the estimated uncertainty also decreases um, as a smaller alpha. So that's how expected. For the merge scenario, it's, um, it's similar kind of trends, um, which uh, makes a lot of sense as well. Okay, so one, one of the interesting things is that because our critic can now estimate uncertainty over the future uh, discounted returns, um, we can actually look at in real life, how real time, how, how what, what, is, what is the known estimate to say, say, right? So in this example, as we approach, as the green car approaches the intersection, you see that the sigma, which is the estimated uncertainty, rises um, and it reaches a peak um, when we're you know, crossing onto oncoming, oncoming vehicle. Um, and then quickly it'll decrease as we sort of, uh, you know, approaches, approaches the, uh, finishes the, uh, the, the maneuver, which also makes sense. Um, here are more examples of under other situations, how, how this does. Um, so again, this all makes sense. This is exactly what we intended the, the framework to, to learn and, and you know, does that. Uh, we also have tried similar examples in Carla, um, similar kinds of uh, left turn scenario and emerge scenario. And, um, in all these cases, you notice that when alpha is uh, is smaller, it takes longer to finish a maneuver. It's more cautious, more conservative. Uh, in fact, in this case, um, there's a actually a collision simulation that actually happened with uh, with alpha. So that to be one. Um, quantitatively, um, what you're looking at here is generalization performance. Okay, so we're we're taking that the top table is the the merge, sorry, the, the left turn, and then the bottom one is the merge. And what we're doing here is we're, for the testing environments, um, we're going to actually add more velocity to the, these different, um, uh, the, the speed of the, the other agents. We're going to spawn them more. Um, that creates a, more vehicles on the road. So basically test out generalization. So these high parameters of the environments have not been used in training. Uh, and what we see is that with standard approaches like DDPG and, and uh, proximal, proximal policy gradients um, optimization, um, and even the distributional RL ones like C51 and D4PG, it's just, it's really, really hard to get the collision rates to zero. Um, it's, it's just, cause they're not, they're not, they're not optimizing for risk aware, risk sensitive criterion. Um, but our, with the uh, worst case policy gradients, we are able to uh, push it close to zero, even though there's still some, uh, some collisions um, when we set alpha to, to be, to be small. Um, so this is, uh, this is, uh, I think this is really um, where, in order for this to be um, on the road, for this to, to go on in real life, uh, we really need to make sure that um, the collision is definitely zero. Um, so again, this is, uh, in summary, um, this is, uh, th I think this is interesting work, but it's uh, far from finished. We really need to ensure robustness, um, not just only in simulation, but in all sorts of different uh, environments and, and potentially one day to, to real world. Um, we need to increase the realism of the simulation, um, and then we need to um, make also make sure that the, the policy is comfort, comfortable and also uh, the trajectory is smooth. Um, so for more information, uh, uh, the, this paper is also on archive. It was published in, in uh, Corel last year. Um, so with that, um, thank you very much. Um, you know, I think uh, people are converging on these kind of very interesting te te techniques uh, with the RL. Um, so, yeah, so thank you and thanks to my collaborators um, and I'm happy to take some questions. Okay, great. Um, I think we got several questions. Okay. So one is, uh, so the first question is, um, are there any traffic so other other traffic participate program to make room when there is a right uh, turning signal uh that's a really good question um uh Dalton. um so uh let's see here let me uh see if i can share my screen again so in order to have stochasticity, this is a really good question. Um, in the in the environment, in this case, um, what happens is that the oncoming vehicle would have a randomly samples from one of three types of modes. Uh, so one is uh, you know be aggressive and don't yield. Um, the second mode is actually yielding, so we'll break um, if it sees a, the green vehicle is trying to make a left turn. 
And the third mode is uh, simply ignore it, uh, ignore the vehicle. So, and because of these three modes that it samples randomly, uh, this really leads to a more, in my opinion, a more realistic simulation of what the actual environment, like in the real world happens, um, are like. And so, and that leads to uncertainty. So to answer your question, um, it's randomly, stochastically picking one of these three modes. Okay, um, so the second question is that um, during the self-play, is it possible for successive generations to keep switching between passive and aggressive behaviors? As they realize they can either take advantage of or take refuge from or previous like from previous generations. Um, okay, so yes, so um, so what happens is that um, in self play, there's many ways to do this, and typically you would keep a population of different agents. So, um, and by population, I mean the the checkpoint weights, um, RL weights. So. Um, so what you can do is, so I don't actually do this now, but uh, as an extension, what you can do is you can actually cluster the, these, these policies according to the kind of behaviors. And then you can make sure that you try to get as diverse, um, diverse sort of set of uh, agent, um, agent policies as possible during training. Um, so uh, in this case, it, it doesn't, um, you know, in this case, this is, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it sort of converge. Um, and so I don't have a definitive uh, uh, sort of thought on how does it either converge or does the policy keep sort of, um, I guess this is the question you're asking, right? Does it, does it goes from uh, oscillate, does not converge. So I think that's, uh, that's really good future work to examine um, what happened. Does it converge to Nash, uh, for example? But this is a general sum game, so um, so I think it's uh, I think we can take inspiration also from the Alpha Star uh, kind of work, uh, where it's just you just have a set of diverse policies that that are there, and then um, so they don't necessarily converge because uh, because these different policies are trained with uh, different training distribution. Okay, um, and then we got a third question is that, um, does the policy from self-play provide any information which, into which aspect of the prediction are important? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so it's, I think it's just, it's, you might be able to just deconstruct or introspect as to what aspect of prediction is, is important, but it's really hard to do. And, um, so, and the reason is because the policy that's being learned is simply gives, gives action, uh, the next, next time step action, and, um, and um, it, it's training the model free kind of sense. Um, so, and, and I think there's another question here I see in the chat, uh, model-based RL. So that's actually really also a good question. So if you do model-based model RL kind of uh, simulation, then potentially the, the longer horizon plan that you come up with might have better correlation or uh, maybe tell you which aspect of prediction is important. Um, but right now it's, it's hard to, to really see which aspect of prediction just because you're, they operate very differently. Um, with predictions, um, again, you ha it has to be interactive predictions, right? It has to, you have to predict how others will react to your actions. Um, so so I, I think it's, a, it's interesting, but it's not, uh, it's not really apparent to me um, what aspect of predictions is important. Now, we do have, um, you know, in, in we, we do have attention-based encodings. Um, and what that does is that tells you which agents are relevant because if you use attention, uh, you can actually tell uh, that as part of the encoding process, which other agents or cars on the road is not really relevant for, for my predictions or for my actions. So, and, and that's what you expect in terms of the distance to the ego um, or self-driving car uh, really is inversely proportional to how important they are. Okay, I think uh, following that question, also there's one more, like, uh, do you have any insights into how the learned agents are predicting the world or like, just as like, purely reactive? So yes, so right now with the self-play, it's, um, it's purely reactive. Um, and um, so, but the, the thing is, I'm always surprised by how 
interesting behaviors can learn just from a reactive policy. Um, and it has to really has to do with distillation of the, the you know, examples into a reactive policy. Um, so I think, I think moving forward, I think, um, I think one of the few examples that you see from the collisions uh, could be helped by using a uh, model-based sort of policy. Um, so with the model-based policy, if you think about it, it's basically saying that if my assumption is right, right, if I'm assuming that the vehicle in front of me would have constant deceleration or constant uh, velocity, then with model-based like MPC or ILQR, um, you're guaranteed not to collide, right? If it's, if it's within the, the reason of my deceleration um, of my car. So that's what you get. Um, so that's the advantage of guaranteeing uh, non-collision in these kind of uh, scenarios. The disadvantage is that if you're in a dense merge scenario, right, if you want to squeeze into uh, a, a close gap, right, if you want to induce open a gap, um, then model base is not going to help you that much because you, you have to be able to, um, because your assumption of constant velocity, your constant acceleration, your constant steering just goes out the window. Um, and I think that's where model free comes in. Um, so I think as, human, as a human driver, I suspect we, we have a mix of both things. Um, if we're just cruising on a highway or, or freeway, um, we're probably in the model free kind of mode. But now if we're trying to make a you know, sharp turn onto a busy you know, major road, and at least for me, I see myself trying to anticipate or visualize how um, the, in the, the future, and that will be considered to be model-based planning. So I think the question is, how do you combine the two um, to achieve more robustness. I think that's a, to me, that's a good future, future direction. Great. Um, thank you, Charlie. So I think uh, due to the time limit, we have to go. Do you mind like replying in the chat? Sure, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you guys again. Thanks so much. Um, and then you can unstop share your screen. So next, uh, we will, so next we will go to the contributor talks. Uh, I will share my screen and then play the pre-recorded videos. I'm Rohan Chandra, and I'll be talking. Yeah, the first one is from Rohan. Um, his topic is uh, behavior modeling for social aware autonomous driving using computational graph theory. Talking about behavior modeling for socially aware autonomous driving using computational graph theory. The key idea is to use the concept of vertex centrality, which is fundamental in graph theory that models relative behavior between vertices. The vertex centrality is a real life function that describes the importance of a vertex with respect to its connected neighbors. It has been used previously in several important algorithms, such as Google's PageRank algorithm, as well as the Edo algorithm to rank chess players. In our application, we model traffic through a graph and apply vertex centrality to measure the behaviors of the vehicles which represent the vertices of the graph. An example of the centrality is the closed centrality, which effectively measures how central a vertex is placed within a graph. In our application, we use this closed centrality to model certain behaviors like over, over, overtaking, lane changing, and zigzagging through traffic by noting the closeness centrality of these vehicles, which would be high towards the center of the graph and low towards the edge of the graph. The main advantages of using centrality is that it is invariant to sensor noise, it is deterministic, and that the centrality values of human drivers are explicitly observable. We begin by obtaining the positions of all the vehicles using sensors and form traffic graphs at every time step. We can then measure the closest degree as well as the eigenvector centralities for every vehicle. We perform polynomial regression to generate univariate polynomials of centrality as functions of time. We can then measure the likelihood and intensity of, of several driving styles by analyzing the first and second order derivatives of the centrality polynomials. We now present some results. In the first video, we model overtaking and weaving of the green vehicle 
by noting that the closed majority is high when it is in the center of the road, but as it moves towards the side of the road, the closed majority will reduce. We additionally model the overspeeding nature of this green vehicle. As it overspeeds through traffic, we note that the degree centrality monotonically increases. Finally, we show several real world results on real world traffic data sets. If you'd like to learn more about our work, please visit the following website. I'm Eric, and I'm going to discuss. Okay, uh, do you have questions for? For Rohan? I'm going to Um, If uh, I actually got one question, um, so I'm sorry, I have to unmute. Hello, Rohan, are you here? Um, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, uh, yeah actually, um, I have one question. So uh, when you are uh, formulating the graph, so which um, which agent are you considering? considering? Like, uh, for example, in, in a scenario, we have 10 agents. Are you considering all of them, or you pick several of them to consider? Uh, yes, I'm, I consider all the agents uh, and uh, form the traffic graph with all the agents. And then uh, depending on which centrality you use, you can either choose to um, process all of those agents or you could uh, choose a neighborhood and uh, restrict the agents to that neighborhood. So for example, the, the for the closeness uh, centrality, you need to consider all the agents in that particular traffic graph. And um, if you're doing the degree centrality, then you consider neighborhood. Okay. Cool. Um, and we got one uh, question from the audience. So. Yeah, I see the question. So how yeah. is centrality okay. used within a larger right. system, right? Yes. So that, that is that is a good question, and that is so that is the second half of the problem. The first problem is how you model and uh, define uh, driving behavior because, you know, driving behavior is very, uh, there's no formal definition to behavior, you know. So the first part of our work is to actually model the behaviors. And now the second part of the problem which I'm working on is once you have predicted, once you have modeled or recognized or interpreted a behavior, which, is, which, which could be a driving style, such as overspeeding, overtaking, um, zigzagging through traffic and so on, how do you use those, those recognitions and interpretations to do planning and prediction? So yeah, that is the next work and I'm currently working on that. And I'm, yeah, so that's how I'm, how I'm approaching that problem is I'm essentially extending the, uh, the, uh, the mathematical part of the thing. So I'm, uh, it is, I'm essentially trying to reduce the decision-making part to solving the system of polynomial equations. And uh, that's still a work in progress, so I can't really expand on much over here because I still haven't figured the complete things out. But uh, I'm planning to to work on this more, and uh, um, I, I'll, I'll keep everything everyone updated as as things will move on later on. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Um, so we will move to the next invited uh, next uh, contribute talks. So that's from Eric Dong. Everyone, I'm Eric. I'm going to discuss about predicting agent trajectories and estimating their motion patterns. Our paper is inspired by the simulation theory, which specifies that a person infers intention and predicts future action of other people by simulating their behavior based on his or her own experience. Based on this idea, our method predicts an agent trajectory by training a motion planner to simulate the behavior and response of an agent to the environment. 
we have a planner that takes an observed trajectory as input and predicts a future trajectory as output. This planner simulates the agent's response to the environment by sampling from a learner that models the agent's behavior. The planner can be any motion planning algorithm, and the learner can be any model that represents the behavior of the agent. To test our method, we use the rapidly exploring random tree star algorithm to simulate the agent's planning behavior. We have RT star samples from LSM MBN model, which is short for long short term memory mixture density network that represent the agent's planning behavior. The trajectory planned by RT star becomes a predicted trajectory of the agent. We test our model with other baseline methods. We can see that traditional methods such as curve fitting and even long short term memory occasionally can fail to model an agent's response to the environment. Our model the LSM and the NRT star on the bottom right accurately models the agent's behavior in the environment. We test all methods using 100 different trajectories. The results of the traditional methods are presented on the left of each metric, and the results of our method are presented on the right. You can see that our method performs similarly to the traditional methods. However, with our T star as our planner, we ensure that all trajectories stay within the drivable area. From our results, we conclude that a planner such as LSIM MBN RT star can be trained to predict agents' future trajectories by simulating their response to the environment. Thank you for listening. Okay, um, Eric, you can unmute yourself. Okay, great. Um, yeah, actually, uh, I also got a question. So can you comment a little bit more on the generalization ability of this approach? Like I see in the example you use uh, like a merging or highway, uh, is it's okay to generalize to like, for example, intersections or other scenarios like that? Um, yeah, so I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Um, I think this approach can be generalized to a lot of situations um, because effectively um, our experiment is just showing one and like just a small group algorithms, but effectively you can model the agent's behavior based on different like environmental factors. So if you provide a lot of information, say if you are in intersection and then you train how the, the agent may plan on the intersections, then you can also uh, model their behavior that way using a path learning behavior. Um, on a larger context, it doesn't necessarily apply to autonomous vehicle. Um, you can also use it for uh, robots in the you know, indoor and or in a room location as well. Um, so as long as you have the training data or if you have a way to train a path learning algorithm and also provide some environmental context to help the algorithm predict the trajectory of the agent more accurately. So um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, hopefully in the future we can see more like uh, scenarios using this kind of approach. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, then next one we'll go for the third Hello, talk. Uh, the third talk is from Kyla. Um, his topic is uh, Palm, Palm DP autonomous vehicle visibility reason. Famous Kyle, right? Today I'm going to talk about PalmDP Autonomous Vehicle Visibility Reasoning. Consider this autonomous vehicle at a T-intersection. It can't necessarily see to the left and right due to a physical object being in the way, like a fence. Now we have multiple distinct problems here, some involving multiple vehicles, multiple pedestrians. However, these can happen at the same time. We don't know what we're going to encounter before we drive. And any solution we create has to be done with constrained computational resources. So our solution is to decompose what would otherwise be a rather large problem into small tractable ones and fuse their solutions online to reduce long-term autonomy. We use PomDPs as our primary decision-making model. And in what we call Modia, multiple online decision components with interacting actions, we have a set of these DPs. Each DP describes a very particular solution, such as D1 
dealing with one vehicle on the left at a T intersection. Online, when we detect them, we instantiate them as decision components. Each decision component then recommends an action, and any conflicts among these recommendations are resolved by an executor. Looking back at the T intersection, its PubDB has the state of the autonomous vehicle's location, the time, the other vehicle's location, and a notion of gap. Our actions are to stop, edge slowly forward, or to go. Each of these DCs then recommends actions at particular points along the route. These are called arbitration points. And if there are any conflicts among these recommendations, the executor resolves them, such as stop is preferred to edge is preferred to go. Visually, it looks like this. We have our arbitration points. And importantly, we instantiate virtual vehicles just out of view. And these virtual vehicles are treated as DCs in their own right. All the DCs then recommend their actions at particular arbitration points, and the executor applies its function. Here's Modia running on an actual AV prototype. We can analyze its behavior by comparing it with two baselines. The red stops at the stop line and then goes. The blue stops at the stop line and then edges. And green is Modia. And we see Modia stops at the stop line, edges slowly forward for visibility. And as it increases its confidence that there are no other vehicles, it can confidently go forward. So in conclusion, Modia is a scalable framework for real world robot reasoning. It has these three components, DPs, DCs, and an executor. And we have successfully deployed it on a fully operational AV prototype, bringing PomDPs into the real world. Thank you for your Thank you very much. Um, Kyla, can you? Yeah, OK, sure, great. I saw you on unmute on yourself. Um, yeah, I found this is a very interesting idea. Um, so, but can you comment a little more on the optimality of the solution, which is obtained by the recommendation from the recommendations? Yeah, for sure. So um, because we're decomposing it in the sense of each individual um, PomDP, you can take suboptimal actions. And actually, we can evaluate what that would be by looking at um, you know, just running the math for changing your actions, say, if you always took the edge action. Um, so there's a relationship between Modia and what happens with a constrained PomDP in that you're essentially subject to constraints from multiple different objectives um, and your policy changes accordingly. Okay, and so is there a way to like somehow like um, constrain or quantify this kind of subtimal optimality? Uh, yeah, so uh, in a previous paper, we looked at minimizing a notion of regret. Um, but because this is the core assumption is that you don't know what you're going to encounter a priori uh, because you're actually you know, driving the actual robot around. So, um, so because of that, you can't like a priori determine what the regret would be, but you can prove that at any given time you minimize one step regret among the models. Uh, and so that's what we did. Okay, great. Um, thank you very much. Cool. Um, thank you. Yeah. Okay, let's go for the last contribute talks. Hi, this is John. Um, this is from um, Omar Sahi. Um, his topic is about uh, tackling existing probabilities of objects with motion planning of auto automated urban driving. My PhD student working on motion planning for automated vehicles in Karlsruhe, Germany. Today I will present you my paper on taking existence probabilities of objects with motion planning for automated urban driving. To ease understanding, I will start with the basics. On this slide on the right side, you see a street. On its left, a part-time diagram is plotted. Cartesian coordinates are mapped to the part time diagram. The depicted blue vehicle is the ego vehicle. The future motion of the blue vehicle can be obtained by solving an optimization problem over the planning horizon. The first part of the motion under taken is taken from the previous solution. This resembles some time periods slightly lo longer than the computation time. The motion until here is fixed for temporal consistency. Now, see that there is a vehicle in the front to highlight the main contribution of this work. We will predict its motion deterministically here. Given some cost function and constraints, we can solve the optimization problem 
propane and motion. State of the art motion planners consider uncertainty in cause and uncertainty in prediction, which includes uncertainties in route, maneuver intention, and motion profile. However, there is a further type of uncertainty, which is uncertainty in existence. There are some works which cover uncertainties after the field of view, but there is no work that tackles quantum detections. State of the art planners choose between homotopy classes. They decide to pass, ignoring the potential existence of the quantum object, or they act conservatively and yield to it. Our motion planner considers the urgency to react to a potential quantum by executing an undecided motion. The key point in planning an undecided motion is to modify the optimization parameter vector so that it accounts for the both maneuver options. Here you see the pinned part, the shared part until the next planning time step, and the distinct maneuver options. The distinct ones will be replanned in the next time step. To handle existence probabilities, we weight the cost terms of individual maneuvers. We calculate the weights by considering the existence probability of the object and the detection probabilities of the detector. In some cases, even though the existence probability might be very low, the existence might set and shade over time. To guarantee safety, we apply a constraint that ensures the vehicle to come to a safe stop after executing the neutral motion. To sum up, we present a method that allows the planner to tolerate faults arising from perception and prediction. We tackle the existence uncertainties from the motion planning perspective for the first time. Our future work focuses on increasing scalability and robustness of the approach. After that, we will integrate the plenary non automated Okay, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Sahil. You have unmuted yourself. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, very nice um, work um, to dealing with the uncertainties. Um, I have a little bit more uh, questions regarding the safety constraints. So you separate uh, the planning horizon into like a determinist one and, and future ones considered uncertainties. So um, how about the safety constraints? Do you need to consider all the safety constraints under different homotopies? Yeah, uh, in that you see, in fact, all the safety constraints. I uh, I didn't present that in the paper, uh, in the presentation, but you can find them in the paper as well. But the crucial one is the replanning. So we plan, we make um, a receding horizon planning. And in that we, um, the key difference is in which time steps we constrain the safety constraints. The rest is, as we presented in our IV 2018 paper, uh, handled with soft constraints. Okay, great. So you are like treating the constraints as soft constraints, um, not hard constraints, is that it? Um, no, not exactly. So you are um, making a replanning. So what you have to do is you have to ensure that your motion, which will be fixed in the next planning time step, uh, satisfies all the constraints. Even uh, the scene in Eden, the current situation evolved so that um, in so that it's how can I say the worst um, case for the automated vehicle. If you can guarantee the safety uh, for the next so to say replanning time, the rest will be discarded. It will be replanned during the next uh, replanning time step. So you can uh, treat them with, the, with a soft constraint. Okay, great. Um, that answers my question perfect. Um, yeah, um, I think that will be, thank you very much, Sahi, um, for participating in the workshop. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, I think that will be all for this morning session. Um, again, uh, I think we are a little bit several minutes ahead of the schedule. So uh, I think right now we are going to enter the break session, uh, the break, and we will return on, we will return on 2 p.m. Uh, for another, uh, for another two invited talks and contribute talks. Um, yeah, that will be all for this morning section. See you later.
Hey, Igor. Okay, hey. So, Alyssa, you are unmuted. I, you can also start sharing sharing the screen. Everyone, welcome back to our afternoon session. Um, so, it's uh, that does sharing work for you? Yeah, perfect. So, yeah, I will totally. briefly introduce you, and then we can get started. So, welcome back to our afternoon session. It's my great pleasure to introduce Alyssa Pearson. Alyssa Pearson is usually my office mate. But in this special circumstances, we mostly see each other via Zoom. And Alyssa is a research scientist at CSAIL. And before joining us, she was uh, working uh, on her PhD at BU and Stanford. And now she is working on actually exactly what the title of the talk is, on modeling social aware and risk aware autonomy. Um, and it's really super cool work. So I look, I look very much forward to your talk. And I, I can also announce people who are interested in her work, you can check her out at uh, MIT and soon you can check her work out at BU. Alyssa will be joining the Department of Mechanical Engineering at BU in January. January is correct, right? That's okay. correct. Yeah, in January. So yeah, we look forward to your talk. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Igor. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, it's been a great day so far in the workshop, listening to a lot of interesting and fascinating talks. And so I, I hope you find my work interesting as well. Uh, so for my talk today, I thought I'd talk a little bit about some of the different types of techniques we're using to model both socially aware and risk aware autonomy within our lab. So as Igor mentioned, my name is Alyssa Pearson. I'm a research scientist at MIT CSAIL. And specifically, I'm working in the distributed robotics lab. And so when we think about socially aware autonomy and robotics, there's a lot of different domains that we can think about. And I tend to think about these different problems as both scaling in the complexity of interactions, as well as the complexity of the environment. And so we can think about the autonomous robots that work in a warehouse without human supervision or you know, in close proximity, but not directly around other humans. We can increase that complexity to think about the robots that work in agricultural monitoring, um, different types of drones for crop monitoring, or maybe thinking about the types of robotics used for herding animals where we're starting to deal with much more complex interactions. But really what we're all interested in here today is the most complex environment and type of interaction, and that is autonomous driving with humans. And so when we think about trying to design this socially aware autonomy, I like to think about it as breaking down into three big questions. First, how do we understand the actions of others? And how can we respond in a predictable manner? And finally, how do we interact with those unknown agents? And that third question, that unknown agent interaction I'll be talking about as I also transition into the risk aware autonomy in the later part of my talk. But to begin with, with socially aware autonomy, our work uh, looks at a lot of this modeling in both the controls and game theoretic space, as well as how we can model these dynamic interactions. And you have heard a lot about other approaches, especially in the keynotes today, as well as the fascinating spotlight talks. And in particular, what we're going to be looking at is how we can use tools from game theory and tools from Lyapunov-like control theory to guarantee performance of these different systems under varying social models that we can prescribe to them. And so starting off, one big question we've looked at is looking at these social dilemmas in driving. And what do I mean by a social dilemma? Well, social dilemmas are when the collective interests within a group are at odds with the individual interests of any given agent in the system. So let's take this example. You've got an autonomous vehicle in blue that needs to make an unprotected left turn, and there's a human driver in the oncoming lane of traffic. How does the autonomous vehicle know what the human will do? Will the human slow down and yield, allowing that autonomous vehicle to make the left turn first? Or should the autonomous vehicle wait for the human driver to pass before attempting this merge? And this is fundamentally important to safety and scalability in these systems. 
we see already that in some of these deployments of autonomous driving all right now, these autonomous cars aren't necessarily acting in an understandable way and a predictable way for these human drivers. And as a result, are getting into accidents that we don't typically see in sort of the human to human driving space. And so our approach to look at this uh, was to look at tools from behavioral uh, and social psychology. So specifically, we're going to use something known as the social value orientation, which is a metric that weights the kind of social preferences of an individual agent against another agent. We're going to integrate that into a best response game, which hopefully by now you're very familiar with after the wonderful uh, talks by Dorsa and Anka earlier today. And then finally, we're going to learn the rewards of the system calibrated specifically on the NGSIM data set. And so when we go back to this social dilemma, we propose that it's the social value orientation that can help us resolve this conflict. And this, if we can understand the SVO, or if we can predict the SVO of these other vehicles, then we can better predict which outcome the system will have. So what is SVO? Well, the classic experiment in social psychology is to say, split $100 with a stranger. Now, you may decide that you don't need the money and you're going to give the stranger the full $100 and you keep none of it. In this case, the reward to the other person is the full reward and the reward to self is zero to you. And that would be an altruistic decision. And we're going to represent that reward to self as the and versus the reward to other as this angular notation phi. You might say, well, I'm going to keep $50 and give $50 away. And in that case, that's a pro-social decision. That angular you know, um, pi over four represents the equal reward to self and the reward to others. And finally, you might say, I don't know them. They're a stranger. I'm going to keep the full $100 and give none to the stranger. And that would be an egoistic decision. Now, we can then take this in our work and we're looking at how we can take this social value orientation, all of these social preferences and map it down into the autonomous driving space. And so now we're going to look at what defines an altruistic driving decision and what defines an egoistic driving decision. And in fact, we're even going to see a little bit later that there's uh, a notion of competitive decisions. Now a competitive decision in the previous analogy of sharing hundred dollars is where you take a full reward to yourself as well as look for a slightly decreasing reward to another person. So in that example, it would be as if you kept the $100 and then also managed to steal $5 from the, the stranger. And so what we propose is that an altruistic decision on the human, if the human has an altruistic SVO preference, then that's going to be the indication that the human will yield for the autonomous vehicle to make the turn. And conversely, if the human has an egoistic social preference, then the autonomous vehicle should wait because the human driver will not yield for that autonomous vehicle. And so within our work, we've actually looked at how we can validate this within human driving data. So we've looked specifically at the NGSIM data set and where we have different cars merging on the highway driving. So this is purely human drivers right now. We're not looking at autonomous vehicles just yet. And we're looking at how these SVO preferences evolve over the course of interactions. And what we've found is that by integrating SVO into our prediction model of how the humans behave, we can improve our trajectory predictions by 25%. And in this video on the right, uh, what we're seeing here is we're seeing these SVO predictions occur during a merge onto the highway. So we've got the purple car merging onto the highway with the green car. And what we can see is that during the merge, the purple car actually becomes a little bit more competitive to nudge in and to get into that lane. And that the green car actually, to allow room for that merge to happen, becomes a little bit more pro-social, allows the purple car to slide in before then becoming uh, more egoistic in preference and closing that gap for any other cars. And overall, as we look at trends in the data set, we found that merging vehicles are more competitive than non-merging vehicles, which is a nice result because this is an intuitive explanation and 
sort of what we as human drivers would expect that to make a merge in dense traffic, you need to be a little bit competitive to actually nudge in and, and change lanes. And so now I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the underlying model and how we can then take this behavioral model and apply it to autonomous driving. So what we're going to do is define the system and define all the agents of the system as having utility maximizing policies. So going back to dynamic programming and optical control, what a utility maximizing po policy says that every agent in the system has some individual reward it can get for any action that it can take. And over time, it's going to make a series of actions and collect a series of rewards. And so that utility is going to be that summation of all those rewards over some time horizon that it's making decisions. And we can look forward in time and we can find the control policy that maximizes those rewards over that time horizon. Now, how do, how do we integrate SVO into this? Well, instead of looking at individual rewards, we're going to look at a joint reward policy weighted by SVO. So instead of using just the single reward in the policy, we're going to assume that the agents also have some awareness of how the other agents might act or be rewarded in the system. And we can still look at that uh, utility over the time horizon and so sum up all those rewards again, but here that individual ma maximization policy, uh, individually maximizing policy is going to be dependent upon an individual's SVO preference and how much they care about the reward that other agents are getting relative to the reward that they're getting. And so an egoistic agent, which would have that uh, SVO preference of uh, you know, a zero angle, is effectively going to be the same as an individualistic agent. It's not going to account for the other agent's reward at all in its decision making. And so it, its optimal control path might not change when other agents are in the system. So if there's a point of potential conflict down the road, it may choose to not yield because it doesn't want to slow down or take any decrease of reward for this other agent. But that altruistic agent is, on the other hand, going to account only for the reward of the other agent. So in this little cartoon, once it, find, once it predicts that another agent might want to you know, go the same way it wants to go, it may completely change its path. And so we can apply this, this, this policy for an autonomous vehicle making a left turn here in some simulations. And what we see is that this vehicle is predicting the SVOs of the other cars oncoming. And we've got two egoistic cars in blue followed by an altruistic car in pink. And by predicting the SVO of those egoistic cars, it's predicting that those cars are not going to slow down and take any decrease of reward for it to make that turn, whereas that altruistic car is going to make that turn. And why we think this is really exciting is that now we see that the altruistic car is slowing down just enough to make a wide enough gap for that car. So that altruistic car knows that the AV autonomous vehicle wants to make the left turn and it doesn't completely stop. It doesn't freeze, but it slows down just enough to make a gap. And the autonomous vehicle by using this SVO model is equipped with just enough decision-making to recognize that small social cue and make that turn. Similarly, we can look at this in merging scenarios where if the autonomous vehicle is trying to merge and it's all egoistic drivers, it will need to wait until the other cars pass to merge into a lane. But when we have pro-social cars, these pro-social cars will first create a gap for the autonomous vehicle. And the autonomous vehicle, by predicting that these cars are pro-social, will recognize that cue and recognize that it's safe to go ahead and slide in. And so these are some of the ways in which we're thinking about how to apply uh, social value orientation to autonomous driving, but there's a lot more to autonomous navigation than just these merges and turns. And another area we're looking at is how do we look at SVO more generally in distributed and cluttered navigation? So now we're looking a little bit more broadly at applications like delivery drones, uh, warehouse robotics and personal mobility uh, robots where you're going to be operating in more cluttered environments, less structure, and having far more interactions with the group. Is there a way that we can still take some of these tools from 
social psychology and apply them into this navigation. And so what we propose is that we can fundamentally encode some of these cooperation preferences into a geometric encoding by creating this weighted buffered Voronoi cell. And with this geometric encoding, we define that selfish agents will have larger relative cells. And conversely, the more altruistic agents will have lower relative cells. And so when agents are moving throughout a space and trying to predict what is a safe region to maneuver to, uh, these slight social preferences will be enough to yield the semi-cooperative um, selfish versus non-selfish behavior. And so now I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. So for a brief introduction, uh, for those don't, that don't know, a Voronoi cell is defined at all points Q within a cell that are closer to a robot PI in purple than a robot PJ. So here I've shaded the Voronoi cell of the purple agent. And you can see that there's this nice geometric decomposition of space. And then, uh, a few years back, um, actually some of my former colleagues out of Max Schwager's lab started looking at this idea of a buffered Voronoi cell. And we can think of buffered Voronoi cells as social distancing for robots. And so what buffered Voronoi cells do is they add a weighting factor into the definition of the Voronoi cell. So now the, the cell is defined as all points in the cell closer to a robot accounting for this weighting factor that creates a gap between the different cells. And this creates a safety radius. So that weighting is defined by the radius of the robots to guarantee that wherever those robots are within their cell, they're not going to collide with any other robots in, in the space. And this is common in distributed collision avoidance where we can look at robots and say, okay, divide up the, the area of the environment and start planning paths within your cell. And if you always plan actions within your cell and everyone else plans to also stay within their Voronoi cell, you get these nice collision avoidance guarantees um, as the agents move throughout the space uh, while still maintaining distributed behavior because agents are only using local information to make these decisions. And so when we looked at this, we'd like to say, okay, well, is there a way to have prioritized collision avoidance? You know, what if each agent isn't acting cooperatively in an equal fashion to all the other agents? What happens when we have egoistic agents versus the pro-social agents? How can we modify these boundaries to account for an egoistic agent wanting a larger portion of the environment? And here, that larger portion of the environment means it has a priority to navigate to points in that environment. And so, what we're going to do is we're going to use that same notion of SVO to create these asymmetric cell weights that give these larger relative cells to the selfish agents while still maintaining the same sorts of uh, collision avoidance guarantees generated from the original buffered Voronoi cell work. And so when we say that there's relative priority in yielding, what we're looking at underlying here is we're going to start looking at a position swap game. And we look at a position swap game where agents pick another agent in the environment and they have to swap initial and final positions. And we do this because it forces a lot of interactions. So the agents are going to need to um, move in close proximity to other agents as they navigate around. And underlying this, each agent is going to try to drive as close to its goal as it can while staying within itself. And when it gets to the edge of its cell and can't go any further, it's going to explore with a right-hand rule. So it's going to look at points to the right um, to, to explore further. And what we see is that these egoistic agents with their larger cell, they can go further before they have to start exploring and yielding. And so uh, as a result, the egoistic agents will be less likely to yield than the altruistic and pro-social agents. And so I don't have time to go into all the details of how we do this, but we can take that same weighted, uh, uh, we can take the buffered Voronoi cell, and now we're going to add these asymmetric weights in here defined by the social preferences and social value orientation, as well as including the radius to account for the safety. And if you'd like to know more about how we've derived this, 
uh, please see our paper, which was presented in the ICRA proceedings this year. But effectively, I can outline the proof of why this guarantees collision avoidance. So one property of these cells is that they're non-empty. So the agent will always have at least its own position within the cell. The minimum distance between any two points in any two cells is greater than the radius of each of those robots. And the cells are known overlapping. So if a point belongs in one agent's Voronoi cell, it's not going to be in any other agent's cell. And so if agents choose to navigate two points within their cell, then that's how we can guarantee this collision-free navigation overall in a nice, clean way where we're only looking at collision avoidance through geometric methods uh, for defining the region. And what's nice about using these local geometric decisions is that it scales uh, quickly to many agents and we can have highly cluttered environments where you're not worried about, um, you know, each agent only needs local information to make its decisions. And so you're not worried about kind of slowing down by trying to optimize for all these agents. And um, I'll just quickly say that our results showed that indeed, we wanted the selfish agents to take shorter paths and for shorter times. And indeed, that's what we saw is that as agents become more selfish, they do take shorter paths. Uh, but what was sort of interesting is we also looked at a very particular case of the position swap game, which is called the circle swap. And it's thought of as in the multi-robot literature, it's the one where you have the most interactions because agents are pretty much all needing to cross at the center of the circle to get around. And here, uh, what we found was sort of interesting is that the egoistic agents still take shorter paths, but they don't get to their goals first. And it's because that kind of rush to go forward and rush to go uh, quicker through the environment actually ends up um, getting them stuck in gridlock and getting them kind of frozen in the center until the more altruistic and pro-social agents can move around. And so unlike the last example, uh, even though they're still taking shorter paths, they're actually spending more time getting to the goal because they're stuck in gridlock. And so those are a few ways we're thinking about how we can integrate social value orientation into this socially aware planning. And for the last few minutes, I'd like to also talk about the other side of it, the risk aware planning. So a big question is, is well, how do we account for these unknown agents? And really, how do we build safety nets when we're talking about operating in highly cluttered, highly dynamic environments? So how do we account for dense freeway traffic, as well as how do we seamlessly go into urban environments where you have people jaywalking, cars parked um, illegally in lanes, bicycles, pedestrians, and all these dynamic, rich things going on. And ultimately, we'd like to think about how we can define a safety net for these cars. And one way we might think about defining a safety net is you might say, okay, well, I've got the car and I've got all these other agents throughout the environment. And maybe I'll just kind of create a padding. I'll create a, an unknown that represents some uncertainty I have. And the more uncertain you are and the more agents, suddenly you start to over constrain your environment and you can end up where the ego vehicle now no longer can find a path through those cluttered environments. And so instead, we'd like to think of a safety net in a slightly different way. And we think of it as now let's say we know just their, we know both their positions, but we also know something about their current velocity. And we assume that they're kind of going to continue in that uh, direction, you know, for the next, you know, immediate kind of time step or action. Well, then we can create this kind of congestion cost function that takes those position estimates and skews them by the direction of their velocity. And so instead of having these kind of radially symmetrically constrained safety nets, we now have these uh, skewed safety nets that we're going to call um, you know, these, these different, different level sets. And depending on how conservative or aggressive you may wanna be, we can choose a level set of of that cost function and we call it a risk level set as that's a value of or a threshold of the cost function um, to kind of define your conservativeness or aggressiveness. 
And how we've looked at these is we, we think they're extremely useful in a couple ways. And one is that we can use them to observe human driver data. And by quickly calculating these risk level sets, we can start to understand some of the underlying distributions or what are some of these risk tolerances that human drivers have. And furthermore, if we can identify what it means to be low, medium, or high risk, we can then also quickly parse these data sets and find examples of cars doing evasive maneuvers, doing these sort of uh, you know, edge case behaviors that would be hard to necessarily just pick out of a data set um, if you didn't have some way to quickly, quickly understand it. And then we can also take these level sets and we can start to apply them to autonomous vehicle planning. And so we can look at what maybe a low risk car looks like where it takes, it only plans actions within this low risk threshold that it's calculating around these other vehicles. And what we see is if you have a lower risk, then you're going to be a lot more conservative. So here the gray regions indicate all the areas seen as too risky for the car to navigate. And so it keeps its distance from the other cars. It maybe makes a lane change, but doesn't really do a lot of other types of actions. Whereas if we start to increase that risk threshold, now those gray regions that kind of restricted planning space gets a lot smaller and we see a lot more aggressive behavior emerge. We see more lane changes and we see more, um, more of the car moving up against other cars. And so we think this is a useful tool in creating sort of a safety net for both modeling and predicting what other cars might do. It's not a complete solution uh, of the behavioral model, but really, as I said, it's kind of one, one piece in how we might account for the behavior of other agents. And when we thought about this, we thought, well, knowing positions and velocities is a pretty small requirement, but let's make it harder for ourselves. What if we don't even have reliable object tracking? So what happens if we don't have reliable position tracking and velocity estimates? And so, what we looked at here is we looked specifically at our autonomous wheelchair platform as a proxy for a vehicle interacting with pedestrians in an environment. And what we're looking at is, can we have this robot navigate in cluttered environments and can it operate around unknown humans and static and dynamic objects um, while still maintaining uh, safe navigation and keeping the passenger safe? And so to do this, we looked at our similar cost formulation, but instead transformed it into what we call this object list cost uh, variation. And what we propose is the dynamic risk density. So here, instead of having uh, object-based position and velocity, so instead of having tracked objects throughout the environment, instead you have a density, which you can get from your uh, LIDAR, as well as an estimate of the velocity field, which is looking at that how that density field evolves over time. And we can get sort of this density flow throughout the environment to estimate the risk of different actions. And why we're excited about this is because it this safety net becomes agnostic to the type of obstacle. It will keep the passenger safe around both these static obstacles like columns and dynamic obstacles like crowds as well as all the random things that might fool a prediction pipeline. So we don't have to worry about wondering if the person with the suitcase, because they're holding a suitcase, will no longer be detected or, or missed by, by our, our pipeline. And so in this way, we can think of this as a, a new cost map that the robot can use, and it becomes this safety net for autonomous mobility. So it's something that we can by biasing it with this velocity information, we can make it a little bit more agile around all of these unknown elements and certainly build upon with other more complicated tool sets. And so uh, I think I'm almost out of time. So I'll just quickly touch on this, this final piece, which is we also looked in our risk-aware autonomy at how we can navigate these occluded intersections. And so what does it mean for a car trying to make a left turn that it can't see everything 
uh, within the environment. And so here uh, we considered risk as defined by the expected number of incidents that might occur to the vehicle. And so we constructed an additive model where we took into account the traffic density, the physical occlusions, the sensor noise, and the attention limitation of other drivers. And in doing so, we can construct a model for the car to estimate the risk of entering the intersection and the risk of the maneuver. And we can use this not only in an autonomous driving pipeline, but also as a guardian system for a human driver that intervenes if it seems too risky to move into the intersection. And so with that, I'll wrap up my talk. Uh, to quickly summarize, I spoke first about some of our work in socially aware autonomy, specifically on the social behavior for autonomous vehicle side, as well as talking about our work in risk aware autonomy with both risk level sets and the brief overview of the risk metrics for occluded intersections. I wanna thank all of my wonderful uh, PIs and co-authors who helped through all of this and thank you and happy to answer any questions. Alyssa, thanks so much for the talk. Uh, quick update for everyone who has uh, joined later on how the question system works. You can simply ask the questions in the chat and uh, I will post the questions to, to Alyssa. Um, so to, to kick off the question round, uh, let, let me start uh, maybe with the first question. I was always very excited about the work you guys have been doing uh, on SVO. And I was wondering how could you incorporate more complex behavior models than simply these two dimensions? Do you think it is easy to incorporate? Is it meaningful to incorporate? What are your thoughts on more complex behavior? I do. I think while SVO captures a certain element and a nice weighting between this reward to self versus reward to others, it doesn't capture everything and it doesn't necessarily um, seem like it may capture, you know, sort of this idea of risk taking. So how likely are you to tailgate another, another person? I think a multifaceted behavior model would be useful to explore um, in terms of how to integrate it. I think that depends largely on your formulation of agent modeling and you know, whether you have it as a series of parameters um, or if it's more like the weighting factors like we used with the SVO. Okay, cool, thanks. So then I'll start uh, with the questions from the audience. The first question from the audience comes from Jack Geary. Jack is asking, how volatile are SVO values? In the NGSIM analysis, vehicles SVO values changed during observation. The car giving way became altruistic and then egoistic again. Whereas in the simulations, vehicles had fixed SVO values. Does the volatility of these values affect the stability to the ability to plan, anticipate the behavior of vehicles? That's a great question. So we uh, did not, we considered the SVO values as something that could be volatile and um, within allowing them to be dynamic and evolving, what we're effectively uh, choosing in that model is that we're saying that there will be factors that we may not account for that can affect how much you choose to cooperate in a situation. So um, I don't know if you've ever experienced this on the road, but you know, you might see uh, somebody cut you off and for that little bit of time, you're a little bit annoyed that they cut you off. And so maybe you're a little bit more egoistic to prevent being cut off again. In terms of our, um, of how we accounted for that. So we, we did use a few different, we looked at a few different techniques on how to possibly um, smooth that over time. So, uh, you know, how we're estimating the SVO is we're not, you know, it's not a fresh estimate at every point in time that can dramatically change. We are assuming that there's some smooth transition, um, you know, from a prior value. Uh, I think that in terms of the volatility, what that really, what I think there's a lot to explore still is how much SVO is changed by kind of fixed extrinsic events. So the, you know, explicit event of somebody cutting you off versus how much of it 
can be modeled as an intrinsic value as just know that person is always egoistic. Okay, thank you. So the next question we have is from Wen Hao. Wen Hao is asking about the Voronoi work. And uh, his question is, are there any theoretical guarantees that there, are, there is no deadlock freedom for the collision avoidance performance? E.g., would it always yeah. be free of a deadlock or gridlock in other configurations of your example? Yeah, so, uh, so actually, I think it's, um, we do not have any guarantees that it's definitively deadlock free. Uh, to our knowledge, I don't think there's any uh, deadlock free distributed guarantee. So if you're doing a distributed algorithm, um, I'm not aware that anyone has, has uh, resolved that, that problem, at least in, in this particular field of kind of multi-robot systems. What we can do is we can run lots and lots of simulations and look at how it resolves the behavior. And so within our you know, hundreds of simulations, changing a lot of different parameters, we never observed deadlock. And I think that for these convex environments with very similar scales, uh, we think it's fair to extrapolate to that. In terms of other types of environments you may have with non-convexity, such as obstacles, I think that's another Thing to explore, but um, we we do think it extends to environments with obstacles where there are still at least um, direct paths uh, between points. Okay, thank you. So the, we have two more questions. The first one is from David. David is curious about the relationship between altruism and trust. I might he gives an example. He might let a person go if feeling feeling nice, but also if they are exhibiting untrustworthy behavior, for example, driving fast or intoxicated. So what do you think about that? Yeah, so we can, we can sometimes interchange them. Um, we can sometimes think of uh, trust metrics as also this niceness metric. Uh, but I also think that that gets to a great example of talking about other facets of personality and thinking about instead of you know, a two axis value of personality where you have reward to self and reward to other as the SVO, you could have a third dimension here, which is also this, this trust where exactly um, altruism here doesn't necessarily mean that you want to drive close to that other person because of other behaviors. Okay, thanks so much. And another question by Rohan, he's following up on uh, the discussion on SVO sensitivity. Do you feel the sensitivity of SVO to sensor noise would hinder its application in real time applications? That's a really good question. So in our calculations of SVO, we were using just two seconds of trajectory data from the NGSIM data set. So I think that how you, how you implement your SVO prediction certainly will affect the amount of sensitivity and noise. Uh, we felt that it's very promising to look at this trajectory observation because a lot of other types of ambiguities can be kind of uh, resolved away. We're not looking for things like detecting maybe a hand wave or a smile or other types of gestures in the environment. Okay, once again, thanks so much. It was perfect timing. We are just exactly out of time. So thanks again for your fantastic talk and for answering all the questions. Um, I assume you will be around for a while. So if people have more questions, they can probably simply ask in the chat as with the previous speakers. Definitely. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Alyssa, thanks for joining. Um, we are switching now to our next speaker, Adrian Guidon from TRI. Adrian, I will unmute you first and then give you the ability to share screen. Hey everyone. Can you share? That will work. All right, let me try. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. All right. Okay, then, so uh, let me briefly introduce you. 
So first of all, thanks so much uh, also to you for, for joining us in this workshop. Um, Adrian is the machine learning research lead of T the Toyota Research Institute. It's a fascinating position. Uh, as I understand, <laughs> you obtained your PhD from in Paris from INRIA and Microsoft Research Joint Center and started your career first at the Xerox Research Center Europe before you joined TRI well over three years ago in 2017. So you've been one of the very, very early people uh, to be part of that organization. And, uh, Adrian has led a lot of super exciting research work at TRI. So we look very much forward to your talk on the three R's and three P's of autonomous driving, robustness, randomness, and risk in perception, prediction, and planning. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, uh, thank you, Igor, and uh, thank you for uh, the uh, inviting me. Um, yeah, it's going to be a bit of an overview talk, so I hope I get plenty of questions uh, in the end, uh, so we can get a little bit uh, deeper into the details. So, um, but before I start, um, this is always my uh, first slide uh, because that's why I joined TRI. That's why uh, I work um, on what I do. Um, it's the number of traffic fatalities uh, worldwide. Um, it's 1.35 million people that die on the roads every every year. Uh, in the US alone, it's like 37,000 deaths uh, per year. So that's roughly like 100 deaths a day. Um, and so this is this is a big problem, right? This is this number is actually hard to wrap your head around. And although a lot of lives are saved thanks to um, passive and now active safety systems, uh, this is not enough, right? So we believe we must do much more. And, and Toyota is the number one car manufacturer in the world. So there's approximately uh, 100 million Toyota cars uh, on the road today, driven in any condition worldwide. So, so if we can make these cars like turn into robots and, and become smarter and safer, uh, we can have a, a huge impact. Uh, but it's a very hard problem, right? If it was an easy problem and we let 1.35 million people die every year, uh, then there's something wrong with us. Um, and so the reason why it's really hard, like one simple way to see this is that the fatality rate in the US is one death every 100 million miles. Right? There's like something like 3 million uh, like vehicle miles traveled every year, 3 trillion, sorry. So, so what, what's our approach towards um, safe, uh, augmented and eventually autonomous driving? So um, the way I see it, there's basically kind of like three characters. There's like, like every good story has a set of characters. So there's like three types of characters. Uh, first, there's the engineer, uh, which, which to be honest is the main um, role that people play in autonomous driving, uh, which is, you rely on prior knowledge, right? Like on, on things that are known and true. And so in, in the case of autonomous driving, uh, you write programs, right? So as a software engineer or as a, another type of engineer, the machine learning engineer, uh, you label data, right? You label a lot of data and that's how you, you, you train your system, you program your system by, by example. And there are limitations uh, to this approach, which are actually fundamental. You can't work around them if you just strictly stick to the engineer role. Um, and that's because the world is open, right? And so there's a long tail uh, and, and you know, there's a lot of inertia also to uh, develop this prior knowledge and encode this prior knowledge and update this prior knowledge. So like, for instance, one question is how to go beyond uh, the program or, or the data sets uh, that you built. And so just one, one just simple uh, like example of why engineering everything is, is unrealistic. Uh, just look at the average complexity of you know like real world scenes um and this is like taken from our fleet of cars in in tokyo um so so you can clearly see that it's just just too complex to assume it's a closed world right uh and rule-based system or even purely supervised learning is not going to work and and even if we forget the complexity of the data uh the quantity of the data too right there's literally tens of petabytes of data coming out of the toyota sensors every day so it's like 10x youtube so so you, you just cannot simply like wrap your head around all of this. So, so naturally the tendency would be to just throw the baby with the bathwater, just no, no engineering at all, and just, just go the way of a, of a second character, which would be the alchemist. Um, so you try to engineer almost nothing, right? Um, you learn directly from experience, um, possibly in simulation, um, and, and you may be able to do everything that humans can eventually, but, but like the question becomes about what about efficiency, what about safety, and what about actually understanding, because alchemists, they could do stuff. Uh, Newton was an alchemist. A lot of people, a lot of early scientists were alchemists. They could do a lot of stuff, but they didn't really necessarily understand how they could do what they were doing. And so another problem is that if we can simulate everything, haven't actually, we actually solved a, a harder problem. 
so so we believe of course you know like it's never black or white and and you have to be somewhere in the middle and and both sides are needed but not enough so so safe autonomy that's what we fundamentally believe at tri and that's why like john leonard uh always say uh you know research is our middle name um we believe safe autonomy remains unsolved um and and it's still a research problem and so we're we're basically in a third role uh which i, I like this this character much more is, is the scientist um and, and so the way we work is we we develop hypotheses and and on how we believe we can attack uh, this problem um, and and namely for us it's it's how we leverage structure of driving and key inductive biases for for, for generalization. Um, so so what are our hypotheses? Right, the first one is adaptability. Um, and so uh, what we want is eventually to get to an end-to-end -end learnable system uh, because it, the whole system needs to be improving with data with experience. Um, but you can't throw away again the baby with the bathwater and just use a big component or an RNN. Um, and and so so modularity is our second assumption. Like a solution must be modular, and and more specifically than this, the structure of the problem is very clear. Uh, it's what I call this three, three P's, right? It's perception followed by prediction followed by planning, right? Obviously, there's feedback loops and everything, but th th this just tells you how the structure of your 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 system should be. Um, and um, and finally. Um, we also have to kind of have an angle of attack of what are the problems that we believe need to be tackled first. Um, and so we believe that, and that's what these three R's are, and what my talk is going to be about, uh, robustness, randomness, and risk are the three main kind of bottlenecks that, that, that make it still an open research problem. Um, and, so, and so the reason I, I, I thought that this workshop was focuses on inter interactions and decision-making, and that's going to be the, the second two parts of my talk, you cannot, um, I think make progress on interaction and decision making and on the the, the say the further downstream uh, parts of, of an autonomous driving stack if you kind of ignore where where your information comes from and again because this this stuff software is modular uh, things propagate right in, in order and so you have to be aware of the perception stack you have to be aware of the prediction stack you cannot like separation of concern is good uh, but you cannot like all abstractions are leaky basically so you have to be very aware of what's going on uh, so first, I'll start with robustness and perception. And the first way you gain robustness and perception is uh, via data. Um, and the reason for this is because we're just going to make a simplifying assumption, uh, which is that uh, I do not expect a robot to recognize something completely new. So I know humans could do it, and and there are certain considerations. It depends what you define by completely new. But but let, let's you know to make our life I mean, not say easy, but to make our life not completely horrible, uh, we'll just make that assumption. And now, leveraging that assumption, what it means is that when you want to build robustness uh, from a, a data angle, right, you need to see everything, right? So you need to cover your domain, what's, what's typically called ODD, operational design domain um, in autonomous driving. So you need to cover that domain. So you need a data set that has really good coverage because you, you're not expecting to generalize the things you've never seen before. Um, and so that's why these ideas of world-scale fleet learning, right? If you have a lot of cars, uh, like, 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 you know, a lot of Toyotas everywhere in the world, uh, you could potentially say, great, I, I, I will see everything. Uh, it's, it's all the data will see, you know, what I need to react to, right? Um, and um, the sum total of like human experience in a sense. But the problem is that even though these cars, these sensors will perceive that and it will stream and these bits are going to be there, you're not gonna be able to use them with today's technology because like for instance, for deep learning, uh, you need to label everything, every little, pattern, every little category you care about, we need to label it. So obviously this, does, this, this assumption, this approach uh, can only work if it's not supervised. Um, and, and, and so, yeah, there, there's this cool, like Al Yushai for us uh, quotes, that's now a shirt, uh, the revolution will not be supervised is something I, I, really, I really adhere to. And there are other alternatives to, to this approach, but this, this is what the approach we're, we're following. So, so more precisely, how do we tackle this problem of like training on all the data as much as possible? Uh, so self-supervised learning is, is what we've been pushing on uh, very much. And we're here, the, this idea is it's still supervised learning, but the supervision comes for free and it essentially comes from geometry. So we've done a lot of work on that. This has been actually one of the, our major, um, you know, like we struck gold with kind of like this, this direction. Um, and, um, and so we had a couple of papers at Coral at ICRA and, and more recently presented a, an oral at CPR on, on this architecture for depth estimation, where uh, the idea is uh, you want to take a single image and output a point cloud, right? Um, and, um, and so that way you can like really understand the scene in 3D. 
Um, and so what we do is uh, to train this, this deep neural network um, for monocular depth estimation, uh, we basically just train it in a structure for motion setup where we try to predict the next frame from the current frame, um, but, but not by predicting it like blindly predicting pixel values, but by predicting a depth map and predicting the relative uh, ego motion transformation. And from that, then uh, the equations of projective geometry tell us how we can warp uh, one image onto the other. And then if we make a mistake, it may, basically if the pixels don't match, uh, then uh, it's not geometry that's wrong. It's, it's our prediction of the depth that's wrong, meaning our, our weights of the neural nets uh, that's wrong. And so one of the things we propose here is a, is a particular neural network um, that's called PACnet that has specific inductive biases about the structure of, of this inference task. Uh, and namely the fact that we care about details, low level details. And so this proposes like to basically not do downsampling and upsampling, but instead um, use learn compression and uncompression with uh, modules, new, new modules we call uh, packing and unpacking. And this works quite well. Um, so although it's self-supervised, what you see here is you can see that the input image on the upper left, uh, the output depth map uh, on the lower uh, left. And then on the right, what you see is the actual reconstructed point cloud. Um, and uh, we also have basically a way to make the weights of the neural network uh, scalar. So meaning outputting depth in meters um, uh, by basically just constraining the magnitude of the translation that we predict in the pose network um, uh, in relation to speed. And speed is, is very often a signal you get like from an odometer, like with encoders or, or something like that. Um, so self-supervision is one way, right? So again, robustness comes from data, training on as much as possible and, and, and self-supervised learning is one way. Uh, but obviously like semantics, uh, it's, it's a bit harder to see how you would do self-supervision for semantics. Um, and so there's a lot of work on that, but, but one interesting idea would be, well, what if we could just same idea of getting labels for free? What if we could lab auto-label the data? And, um, and one way uh, that's really interesting um, is vision as inverse graphics, right? There's a lot of people, what's called analysis by synthesis. This is very motivated in neuroscience. So people like Josh Tenenbaum, uh, Alan Ewell, um, there's a lot of like really interesting uh, research behind this. Um, and so what we've done is basically look at vision as inverse graphics to try to auto-label the data by using some very recent like um, breakthroughs uh, in differentiable rendering. So we've done a, a couple of, of work on that. Um, I'll just highlight very briefly our work on uh, CPR oral that we presented on auto-labeling for 3D uh, object detection. Um, and we also recently output, um, put an archive, a differentiable uh, survey on differentiable rendering. Um, but, but the high level idea is basically as follows. It's again, it's, a, it's common, the same idea of self-supervised learning, which is, um, you know, we, we basically take a, an image and we learn a black box neural network to de-render it. And once we de-render it, by de-rendering it means like we are outputting parameters like materials or light sources or, or, or other information that allows an actual renderer. So this time, like not a neural network, but an actual rendering algorithm uh, to basically reconstruct the RGB image. And now once we've done that, we can basically just compare back to the input image and see if the rendered image agrees with the input image. And if it doesn't, uh, then it's not because the renderer is wrong, because the renderer is using known laws of physics, physics of lights, et cetera. So, so it's because the neural network weights are wrong. And so, and so that, that's very basically like, and, and so you have to be able to back propagate through the renderer, right? Which is what differentiable rendering has kind of allowed uh, recently. And, um, and then if you can do these kind of things, um, now you can basically take raw sensory information like a, a image uh, or a video or LIDAR, and you can basically de-render it and re-render it. Um, and, and the intermediate representation, the scene parameters are you're actually your labels. So in this case, the scene, uh, the object detections, uh, the, like in 3D, the shape, the texture, or different things. Um, and, and finally, one, one, one thing, one little caveat that I will say about, about data uh, is that I said like more data is better. That's kind of like a little bit dangerous, right? Um, and especially now we know in, in all these like, um, fairness and like very serious issues that machine learning has in the real world, uh, we shouldn't just be blindly believing that more data is better. Um, and so um, in addition to all this like very important like uh, like ethical and sociological considerations because it's not just a technical uh, problem. And so there's a great tutorial at CPR by uh, Tanit Gebru and um, Emily Denton that I really recommend to watch like to broaden your perspective on this. Um, in addition to that, there are also some technical challenges uh, that, that that we have to address. And so 
in particular bias. Um, and so the fact that the in real world, uh, you know, people say most of driving is boring and then you have the very, very long tail. Um, so how to deal with the heavy tail is, is very difficult because um, you really don't know, is that noise? Is that an outlier? Is, or is that a minority example, like a rare example? And so one kind of idea that we've been exploring is, uh, is the idea of regularization um, and especially data dependence regularization, so adaptive regularization. And so it's, it's, a, it's a theoretically motivated idea and we published this last year at Europe's and, and we have follow-up work this year um, where um, basically um, the idea is, is very basic. It, it's, it's just like you want to just regularize more uh, the long tail. And so there's two ways. There's ways with an adaptive margin that we presented in our paper uh, last year. And so it's extensions of the loss, basically. Um, and, um, and more recently, also we're dealing with more complicated um, like um, uh, structure, like statistical structure of the long tail. And, and namely the fact that it's not just imbalanced, like you have like rare examples and you have dominant classes, but also that it's a uh, uh, heteroscedastic in addition to imbalanced, meaning that the labels have varying levels of uncertainty. Um, in addition to, to the label distribution being long tail. Um, so at a robotics conference, uh, I think I have no need to argue about this. Uh, although, um, you know, it's, it's not obvious to everybody, but I think for every robotist, it's obvious. The way you get robustness is redundancy. Uh, so the Byzantine generals problems, all sensors lie. Um, and, so, and so you need to combine radar, LIDAR, cameras, IMU, right? Um, and, and so one of the bottlenecks that like there's many difficulties with that. Uh, obviously, it's an entire field on its own, uh, sensor fusion and everything. Uh, but one of the bottlenecks, uh, I think in particular for autonomous driving that we've been tackling is 3D detection with cameras. Um, and that's because if you look at like kitty leaderboards or any kind of like, you know, experience you might have with this, uh, detecting 3D objects with LiDAR is just so much more accurate uh, right now uh, than with, with cameras. Although there's like, like incredible progress recently. Um, and so our approach on, on trying to kind of like make cameras a first class citizen um, so that we can really have like redundancy uh, and not just like trust the, trust the LiDAR for the 3D detection and then the vision for something else um, is cross sensor auto labeling, right? So in doing 2D to 3D associations. And again, here there's a lot of geometry uh, that you can use uh, from, from computer vision. And then um, also self and semi-supervised learning is, uh, is another big, uh, big area. Um, on the on the last robustness, something that might not be mentioned too often is efficiency. So uh, when you have many sensors in complex online fusion, uh, there's a lot of deployment challenges, right? So uh, so we we deploy in a prototype car, like a level four vehicle that we drive on on public roads, and we have like all these kind of like physical robot testing, and uh, and you know going from crazy research idea uh, idea that works uh, in a data set to idea that works in a car, um, you you have a lot of headaches. Um, and so um, actually efficiency is core to robustness, right? You might have the fanciest algorithm that's super safe, that's super nice, but if it doesn't run in real time, you can't use it. Um, and so we've done a lot of work on uh, efficiency too. Uh, so a lot of it is actually like on the engineering side. So I said like we're a scientist hat, but obviously we have also an engineer hat. And so hardware optimization is very important. Um, and that's actually kind of relates to the algorithm itself. Uh, it's not just like once you have the algorithm, just optimize it um, and sharing computations, uh, very important. And so we had recently a paper where we showed like a 440% improvement in runtime while maintaining accuracy, state-of-the-art accuracy for uh, panoptic segmentation as a recent paper at, at CPR, uh, as a role again, a, a couple of weeks ago. So just to conclude on the perception side of thing, um, the way we get robustness and the way we are tackling this robustness uh, problem is uh, data redundancy and efficiency. Um, so now in terms of, of prediction, um, uh, which I think that we're moving a little bit more towards the topic of, of this workshop, but like pay attention that whenever I talk about prediction, I always make assumptions about perception and its robustness. So it's leaking into. Um, so that's why it's kind of important to understand uh, the perception side uh, first. Um, so why do I mention randomness and prediction? Well, the first source of, of uh, randomness in, in prediction is human intent, uh, right? Because it's like human robot interaction, right? For like, we're not talking about deploying robots in robot only environments here, right? Autonomous driving for a long, long time, people will drive and robots will drive and will coexist. Um, and so, um, and even like pedestrians, etc. So, So human intent is a major source of randomness in prediction. And um, and so it's, it's latent, um, Right, so human intent is latent, but yet it governs the action. So it's in the brain, right? So it's like you don't know what your, you know, neighbor 
it wants to do, right? Or that pedestrian on the street wants to, you can infer it, right? And that's the approach we're trying to do is like, we're trying to infer latent intent from interactions and context, right? Uh, because nobody's telling you like, like it, it's obviously someone's signaling you what it wants to do, it's easy, but if it's someone is not, you, you still got to predict uh, or try to make a good job at this. So we recently presented a paper at uh, ICRA, uh, that's also accepted at uh, RAL called Spatial Temporal Relationship uh, Prediction for Pedestrian Intent Prediction, which is a joint work with Stanford. And uh, we released a data set, um, uh, which you can download at this address, uh, called STIP, Stanford TRI Intent Prediction data set. And um, the idea of, of, of this work was to study the question of, can we predict the intent, uh, future intent of a pedestrian? So it's not the intent of drivers, but it's intent of a pedestrian, specifically in a situation where we care about the most is like, is the pedestrian going to cross the street or not, right? Um, and, and, you know, like right away is not, um, you know, given it's taken in a sense though. So like pedestrians can take right away and just jaywalk and cross the street um, and you, you just got to stop for them. So, um, so one way that we propose to lever leverage the special temporal context for this task is to um, is to basically um, model the full scene graph. So like again, like we built on top of perception, right? So again, this modularity assumptions. We we run perception. Perception enables us to parse the scene, and then from uh, this scene parsing, we can build a scene graph, right? And uh, in, in that case, that scene graph, because we're focused on answering a question about the pedestrian, it's basically a star shaped graph where where the pedestrian is at the center and it's connected to uh, its neighbors. And, um, and then uh, it's also connected in time uh, and in two ways. One is, is, is connected through itself. So the same, the node, the pedestrian itself is tracked through time. So it's connected through time. And also um, we're basically, because there always can be a varying number of interactions, right? So one of the problems of interactions is that um, you have a very, varying number, number of interacting agents in the scene. So uh, we can summarize, uh, not, not just like model interactions of individual neighbors, but also summarize uh, the whole context uh, in a node uh, by pooling features basically. Um, and so then we, we have the spatial temporal graph, right? Um, and and uh, using the spatial temporal graph um, and, um, and LSTMs basically to kind of like propagate information in time and using graph convolutions to pool the different features and interactions uh, and represent basically the edges, the influence of the different uh, interacting agents. Uh, we can basically then have like um, per, uh, per timestamp like embeddings uh, of both the pedestrian and basically the overall context. And then we can uh, use that to do a future prediction of, of the action of the pedestrian. And we can answer the question, is the pedestrian going to cross in one second or like a few seconds? Um, one other interesting approach, um, like just to, like flipping the problem on its head, is that um, very often actually th that problem is not necessarily so well posed. Like, is the pedestrian going to cross in one second and three seconds? So it's a more like trajectory forecasting related question. But in case of intent, we might be just caring about like a specific region in space, let's say in front of the car. And is someone going to cross now? Because that's what you want, right? For decision making, you you might be making that query of like, I want to go there. I want to know if if I I can basically. And so here you want to know if someone's going to cross or not. And so you can basically just like build a scene graph where the same thing, star shape graph, but this time it's like centered on uh, the eagle car. That's the region in front of the eagle car, or maybe even like in the region on the map if you're if you're using a map. And so you can use the same approach. Um, Another source of randomness and prediction, um, it, it relates to the fact that uh, like the future is, is, is partly unpredictable uh, because it's contingent, right? So, so anything like many things could happen, right? So many things could happen and therefore uh, you, you must, like a good prediction must be multimodal, right? It must predict multiple possibilities, right? Um, and so, uh, and more than that, right? Because uh, you know, uh, Wolfram Borgart, so my, my boss at, at, at TRI uh, wrote the probabilistic robotics Bible, uh, tell me very often, like, you know, uh, everything is a distribution, right? Uh, so, so, so you have to predict the distribution um, over plausible futures. If you predict it over possible futures, that's called a map. <laughs> Uh, but so you really have to predict it over plausible futures, right? So what might happen, what is likely to happen. Um, and I, I, lo I love this quote by, uh, by William Gibson, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So, so that's what you can hope to get is like, is like really represents faithfully kind of like modes of the distribution uh, to, to make, to predict what's plausible. There's a lot of work on this. Um, and, and some of these are, are my favorite works, uh, favorite recent works uh, from other folks and, and not, not from my lab. 
Um, so there's a work by, uh, you know, uh, Rowan and, 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 and his friends at Berkeley. Uh, there's work by Alex Kendall at, uh, at Wave, also that's really good. And work by um, collaborators at, uh, at Stanford. So uh, Boris uh, and, and Marco uh, called Trajectron and Trajectron++. Plus Plus. Um, and, and this work in particular is going to come again a bit later. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of this work because um, it's, again, the leveraging this idea of graph neural networks and, um, and really model spatial temporal graphs uh, and really handles uh, the multimodality in its prediction using a conditional ver uh, version of encoder um, and, and modeling basically like different possibilities using a categorical latent variable. Um, it's also, I, I really like it because it's, it's, it's uh, plausibility rooted in dynamics, right? So, so like this, this work is like in Marco, Marco Pavone, <laughs> like a control uh, guru. Uh, so, so, you know, um, knowing about the dynamics of the system enables you to also like constrain vastly, uh, your, your predictions, uh, which is good. Um, so it's not just dynamics though. So plausibility and multimodality do not just emerge from dynamics, but also from, um, planning and, and, and social behavior. And so if you combine these two first things that I said, like two different sources of randomness in, in prediction, like multimodality and intent, um, you can actually use like something that mimics the human decision-making process. And so we recently, um, just very, very recently, like super hot off the press, got a paper accepted as normal at ECCV, where it's a collaboration uh, between uh, Berkeley and, and Stanford and us, um, you know, led by a uh, former intern of mine, uh, Katakia Mangalam. And, and so here, uh, the idea is, is actually very, um, very simple, is uh, we first learn a distribution over plausible destinations. Right, so 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 humans, we, we we want to go somewhere, right? So intention should be like, I want to go somewhere, um, and and not like just, I'm not thinking about just my next step. And so uh, first, we should predict where would the human would like to go, and and so we're learning a distribution of plausible destinations. Uh, from that, we can then condition the trajectory for casting on sampled endpoints, right? So plausible endpoints, plausible futures, um, and and then we can plan. Uh, following social norms, because once you condition on the goal, it's basically like, I want to get there and I just don't want to bump into people, respect people's private space, et cetera. So you can really rely on, 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 on social uh, norms uh, for, for, the, for this part of the planning. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'll skip over the details for this, but the paper is on archive, so you can check it out. Uh, but overall, it's, it's, it's similar to Trajectron++ plus plus ideas. It's relying on uh, encoder, decoders, convolutional autoencoders, um, and, um, and in addition to it, it's relying on this notion of social pooling and in particular is using ideas from like another uh, paper um, uh, from FAIR on non-local neural networks to basically have non-local attention to pool the different features uh, to model the interactions um, so that you can jointly really like forecast uh, the trajectories and reason jointly uh, over the different uh, agents. Uh, one of the cool things about this work is, um, uh, so I'll skip the details of the architecture uh, because I think it will take too much time to, to talk about, um, but uh, we have a bunch of other tricks in the paper too, um, but this idea of conditioning on the endpoints, uh, it's actually extremely powerful because what we found is that on these data sets like uh, Stanford drone data set and UTI-GCY data sets which are very, very uh, heavily um, investigated data sets in this like trajectory forecasting community, we got massive improvements, like uh, like relative improvements of almost 20% on SDD and, and like 40% on ETH and ECY. Um, so there's some really, really um, kind of like important conclusions from, from this work and I encourage you to have a look at the paper. Uh, and finally, the last point I will touch on briefly on the randomness and prediction is uncertainty. So obviously I talked about multimodality, I talked about intent, talked about like randomness. When you talk about randomness, you should talk about uncertainty. So again, every state is a distribution. Um, and, so, and so in a modular system in particular, it's actually really challenging because uh, uncertainty propagates throughout, right? So like you have, uh, not throwout, sorry for the typo. Um, so you really have like one, every system produces like processes and produces its own uncertainty. Uh, and this is very difficult to propagate throughout. So that's why there's a lot of really, really cool research on this. Uh, some of it, um, you know, from uh, our friends and colleagues at MIT and at TRI uh, in the Cambridge office. Um, and uh, we have also some collaboration with uh, Jen Bogue at, 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 uh, at Stanford. And there's really cool work by Yaringal, uh, David Escaramuza. And I'm also a big fan of this very recent ICML paper uh, from uh, one of the co-organizers of the workshop, Rowan. Um, uh, where really this question of uncertainty is, is, is really central and it's not really easy to deal with. Um, so 
to conclude this second part, uh, randomness and prediction really stems from um, human intent, which is latent, uh, multimodality, so the, the fact that the future is contingent, um, and uncertainty, right? Uh, especially in a modular system, it propagates and it and it, it, it aggregates. Um, and so finally, uh, this last piece of the stack, right? After perception and prediction, now you get to planning. Uh, this bottleneck, I think, in planning that's really difficult and that we've been trying to have a look at, um, especially with uh, collaborators at Stanford, like Max Schrager's lab and, and Marco Pavone's lab, is risk awareness. Um, so, so first of all, when you think about planning and you think uh, like like one approach that I'm a big fan of is imitation. And, and so the reason is because you, you get trillions of kilometers per year driven. So that's demonstrations is a massive, massive, massive source of supervision and of data and of information of how humans drive, whether good or bad, right? So it's not just a problem of like, oh, I just need good, I mean, you know when there's an accident or something like this, but like good or bad demonstrations, a lot of it happens. Uh, so you have access to a lot of that. So, so how do you leverage it, right? And, and so like imitation learning is, is, is really like simple. Like there's like very basic forms like behavior cloning, which are like, you know, dates back from Dean Palmer Law and the end of the, end of the 80s at CMU. And, and really like it's simple, it's scalable uh, and it can be trained influence. So it seems like to have this derata that we care about. And, and so we did like a paper last year at ICCV uh, where we tried to push the boundaries on this thing. Like, well, you know, if that works, why, why bother with all the rest, right? Uh, let's just try to push it as far as we go. Um, and, and so we kind of like did um, a bit of what I like to call an open AI story, which is like, oh, bigger models, more data, the, the, you only need a neural network, right? So, um, and it does help, right? Using pre-training. And so we found a lot of like conclusions from image classification actually transferred uh, to this imitation learning and behavior cloning scenario. But uh, there are some limitations, there are some problems, right? And, and so some problems are like data set biases, like I mentioned before, uh, variance is another big problem, right? Because you're, you're again, like learning, assuming everything is IID and everything, but, but it's not, it's obviously not in this case because demonstrations are obviously not IID. And so you have a lot of variance that's due to the curriculum. That's basically the, the you know, I, I like how Botu says, um, you know, nature doesn't shuffle data, so shouldn't we? Uh, so, so we shouldn't either, right? And, and so th there's a lot of variance when you shuffle data that's, that's actually causing problem in these scenarios, which are obviously non-IID. Um, and then you have more fundamental limitations like uncertainty, interpretability, and modularity. So, so one of the things that we've been looking at is again, assuming like modularity is, is a key feature we want, um, there is like really, really interesting work by Vladlin Koltun. Um, uh, and there's this cool paper like titled Does Computer Vision Matter for Action? The answer, uh, yes, obviously. Um, and, so, and so you can get modularity thanks to computer vision, right? You have this intermediate perception that I mentioned before, you get this parsing, you get the scene graph, et cetera. Um, and, but the problem is that realistically, it's like a safe modular system will have false positives. It has to, right? And, and, so, and so the problem is that you have to learn to plan uh, under perception and prediction uncertainty. So the reason being like, if you're just abstracting the, the, your sensors and the intermediate outputs uh, and, and you're forgetting someone, oh, oh, there was a kid here, but it's lost in these abstractions, you're, you're never gonna really recover it, right? I mean, that's why you need redundant, like uh, automatic emergency braking system, et cetera. But as, as much as possible, you don't want any false negatives. So, it, and there's no free learn, so you're gonna bias towards false positives. So how do you, how do you can plan under this and learn to be robust to these kind of errors in the uh, upstream parts of your stack? And so we recently got a paper accepted at IROS. Um, it's not an archive yet, so we'll put it in an archive real soon. It's called Driving Through Ghosts. So where ghosts are these basically false positives, spurious detections, spurious uh, predictions. Um, and, um, and so the idea here is what's really key, I think in this case is that, uh, and something really that like Guy Rossman's co-author here, like really kind of like made me understand is, is like uncertainty is really about representation, right? So how do you represent this uncertainty? So here, one of the cool things we did um, is, is basically just said like, okay, if we do imitation learning, but we do it from a mediated uh, uh, representation uh, from computer vision, um, how can we encode uncertainty? And so one natural simple idea is just to have like a non-parametric probabilistic representation in form of a bird's eye view grid um, and that you, you weight by the uncertainty. And this is a very standard representation, um, like this, this, this non-weighted one in, in, um, in like most autonomous driving kind of like prediction uh, setups um, and planning setups. So we really tried to study if, you know, just incorporating uncertainty in the simple way, non-parametric way uh, would enable us to um, learn like 
demonstrations, basically like from the demonstration, a demonstration will tell you, I go there, but this perception system said, well, I mean, yeah, a human would go there, but there is an obstacle there. So why would the human go through that? And that's a ghost, that, because that's not because the human crashed through an object, it's because that object is spurious. It's a false positive. So, so the hope was that the data, the data would be enough um, if the representation of uncertainty is accurate enough to basically just go uh, learn to ignore those false positives in the downstream uh, part, even though you have an upstream mistake. Um, another uh, area which, if you think about imitation and if you think about uh, planning in, in, in risk-aware way, uh, near accident scenarios are actually a big problem. Um, and the reason are it, it's, it's difficult is because near accidents, it's a phase transition, right? It's like you're driving, everything is fine, and now boom you know, like something's gonna happen. Adrenaline comes, reflexes kick in, and, and you drive completely differently, right? And so these phase transitions, and you're always epsilon away, right? If you imagine like you're, if you're driving past someone, you're like a little bit of a steering angle away from a frontal collision and, and like a really, really bad accident. So these phase transitions, this is really, really difficult, makes the problem like of imitation in near accident scenarios extremely difficult. And so we, we started to study this question with, with uh, Dorsa Sadiq at Stanford, um, and I got a paper that was presented at RSS. I think the presentation is um, is on Wednesday morning. I won't go into too much details. Attend that presentation if you want to know how we do it. But in a nutshell, just to give you the idea, um, we're basically just saying like, well, I mean, there's different ways to drive, right? And there's the phase transition, there's the before and there's the after. And, and so you could potentially learn simple policies via imitation to learn these individual behaviors, right? Um, and then the key problem becomes of when do we use which, right? When do we switch? And so for that, we basically just have a learning, a reinforcement learning algorithm to learn to control which policy it uses. Um, and um, um, so very, very uh, simply, um, that's, that's basically the idea. And, and so what we found in these experiments, we experienced in Kotlin simulation, because obviously you don't want to try experimenting in near accident scenarios in the real world. Uh, so so um, what we found is that these, uh, we also did preference studies to show that the behavior of the resulting uh, hierarchical uh, reinforcement plus imitation learning uh, was more natural and not just yielded less collisions. It was also not just safer, but it was also faster. Um, so uh, because then being, let's say, just conservative where you're safe, but nobody would want to be in that car. Um, safety, obviously, is the number one consideration. Uh, I could, should have started my presentation with this. Uh, safety first, always. Um, and so uh, and so here the problem is that you said the reason I introduced everything before and start to talk about safety now is because you have to understand what what's the problem with safety right um, and so again as I mentioned perception and prediction are robust but never perfect um, and so even perfect even if you let's say okay they're they're imperfect but let's say you have perfect uncertainty estimation you estimate really well the probability that it's a false positive etc um, that's not enough that's still not enough um, and, and and the reason it's not enough is because it doesn't help you with decision making. Like, like a robot has to make safety critical decisions in real time. So even if you say, I'm not too sure there, still, what do you do? Do you just do nothing? That like, you have to make a decision, even in the, in the face of uncertainty that you just made really reliably. Um, and so safe autonomy really requires this risk awareness, right? You have to be willing, like uh, letting robots take reasonable calculated risks, right? And so, and so the key question, because we take risks when you drive and there's no way around it, there's no risk zero. So a robot that operates in the real world has to take risks. So the question is like, what risks? And how can we handle risk computationally, right? Like risk, it's, it shouldn't be luck, right? It shouldn't be like, yeah, let's handle the risks by just trusting the agent to just do what it thinks it should do, right? Um, it should be actually modeled and explicitly reasoned about. So, um, the way we approach this, and, and again, I won't go into too much details, um, and these papers have been accepted at IROS uh, recently, so we'll, same thing, we'll put these uh, uh, online soon, but it's just a sneak peek. Um, I have a recent paper with uh, Marco Pavone's lab and, and Max Schreiger, uh, led by uh, Haruki Nishimura and Boris Ivanovich, where um, we're basically um, looking at risk-sensitive stochastic optimal control. And so really in control literature is, is, is very rich with, with this notions of different ways to model risk. And so one way that is a really interesting and, and kind of simple to understand is this notion of entropic risk. And, and here basically instead of having your cost functional J, right, that you would minimize an expectation, right? So in a, in, you, in a control problem, you would minimize your cost, let's say like your tracking cost plus a collision cost um, and an expectation and with this expectation over J. Um, but that's that's not risk aware, right? And so one way to make this risk aware, make your, your control problem risk aware is to use this reformulation of your objective uh, with this one over sigma log of exp uh, expectation of exponential sigma j, 
And I would say like, well, wait, okay, cool, <laughs> but why? Uh, and the reason is, is very simply, like if you tell extension, if you look at this, it's basically just close to your original risk uh, neutral uh, problem objective, right? Which is this expectation of your cost functional plus sigma over two, the variance of your cost functional. And this is really nice because that, that's, if you look at it this way, now you understand. Sigma is a parameter that determines how much you care about the variability of the cost in addition to the mean, right? And a larger sigma, basically it increases the risk sensitivity. Um, and, and so, and zero is neutral, right? Uh, and negative is risk seeking. So you can control this, you have this knob that you can control. Um, and, and now like basically in, in like fairly technical kind of algorithm, we, we, we basically combine this, this notion of entropic risk with the, the previous uh, stuff I talked about in the prediction. We use learning-based prediction. So Monte Carlo samples according to the trajectory plus plus model, model and model-based control. And model-based control, we use um, something called the risk-sensitive sequential action control uh, framework. Um, there's a complicated algorithm. You can have a look uh, in the paper. I mean, it's uh, involves the mode insertion gradient and like complicated control notions, but uh, I will spare you the details. Uh, we did experiments on real world data and also uh, offline, uh, but also did exper cool experiments in, in, in actual robot. Um, in addition, one of the things we've done with other students of Max Schreiger, uh, Mingyu Wang and Negar Mer is, is we look at like scenarios that we know are difficult, like this game of chicken where you are like merging on ramp merging or like around about. And so we kind of are just kind of a game theoretic element to it. And so I know Wang Kai was talking about these kind of things. Um, and so we also looked at like, um, you know, like game theoretical interactions between risk aware agents um, and, and, you know, how, you know, uh, how, how can we model naturally how risk aware agents would behave. And so uh, approximating a, a, like a feedback, a feedback Nash equilibria. Uh, and so we're looking at a little bit of game theory here. We were kind of like in, interested in showing like the relative risk sensitivity. So these sigma parameters for different agents their relative position is really what governs the, the behaviors. And, and so that, that makes sense, right? If you're willing to take more risk or less risk than someone else, that determines how uh, you're gonna behave. Um, I won't talk about causality too much. I just wanted to say that it's very important. Um, Decision-making needs to go beyond pure data, right? You need to be doing causal inference. Um, and so one way that we've been looking at that is counterfactuals uh, in simulation to find uh, planner bugs and fixes. And we have a couple of papers that recently accepted at IROS and ITSC where we can basically just say like, oh, this was a crash or this was a bad behavior. Can we replay simulation and then uh, counterfactually reason what if a, that agent was going faster or what if uh, um, my, let's say risk sensitivity was different or these kind of things. Um, and so this form of counterfactual reasoning is really important. We're not, ha we have not really done any way to do causal inference at runtime uh, on board, but this is like, at least allows you to basically analyze and investigate uh, problems uh, in, your, in your planning stack. So um, for risk awareness and planning, I, I mentioned three big things, imitation, safety, and causality, which are three big problems we're thinking about. Um, and now to conclude this talk, um, just as a reminder, there's three types of roles you can, you can play, three types of hats. I'm a big fan of the scientist hat. Um, and, uh, but obviously uh, you, you need uh, to be the three of them or work with people uh, that are on each side. Um, and, uh, so far in the talk, uh, we've shown how we take this scientific problem. So again, like safe autonomy is, I think, really a research, open research problem. It's not just an engineering problem, and it's not also like on the full alchemy side. It cannot be. So, so we're taking this really seriously as a scientific problem. And so, uh, robust perception being a key uh, part of our work, actually a significant part of our work. Um, prediction, which we're starting to uh, look into more, and how to address randomness, so the intent, multimodality, uncertainty. Um, and planning and risk aware planning, uh, which uh, I think is, is also something we've been pushing on a lot uh, recently, looking especially at control uh, and, and risk sensitive control. Um, so uh, we are releasing a couple of data sets. We have just released a couple of data sets, TIP and DDAT. I've mentioned DDAT, but it's a big data set for uh, depth prediction um, and uh, also coordinating a couple of workshops at ICML ECV. I encourage you to have a look at if you're interested in this and uh, I want to thank my collaborators. Thank you very much. Adrian, thanks so much for this very interesting talk and uh, thanks for, for pre presenting all, all the super cool works. Um, I, will, I have tons of questions. I, I, I will yield it uh, in the interest of time. I saw Litting had a first question. Who else has questions? We will maybe have time for one more. Just write them in the Zoom group chat. Uh, otherwise, I'm sure you're around at the conference so people can also write you directly. 
uh, or write in the chat directly. So Litting's question was, uh, can you explain more about the representations of the uncertainties for prediction for the imitation module? And how is the performance of such modularized imitative planning and prediction, predict planning and prediction compared to end-to-end -to -end imitation learning for driving? Right. So let me try to get to it. But essentially, it's very, very simple. Um, the okay, this idea. So actually, what this came from is that there is a paper, another paper by Vladimir Koltun, um, called "Learning by Cheating." So, so, so basically, in the previous work, we've done imitation learning, like pixels to steering, basically, right? Um, and this conditional imitation learning framework, and using a much more, many more demonstrations, uh, using uh, like ResNets, etc. Like, great, it works great, but it has these these problems. Um, the next uh, kind of like then Vladimir basically did the paper called "Learning by Cheating." Where he basically crushed us, like like completely crushed our results. And the way he did it is because he used this BV type of representation as input uh, to learn a first policy, like an expert policy, and then distilled that policy uh, into a sensory motor policy from pixels to steering. And and then saying, and of course, like the BV representation that was using was perfect, right? So it's like imagine if you have perfect map, perfect localization, perfect semantic segmentation, detection tracking, and everything. And he was saying, and then I can distill the expert into a sensory motor agent, and then I just have to do tutorial. I was like, okay. Uh, we thought that was like still a very open big problem to do this into real transfer. So we thought like, hey, in the real world, how would we do this in the real world? The only difference in the real world would be that this BV representation would have mistakes, would have errors. And so, and so we would infer that representation from models. And then what we would do is we would just have to have a way to not just, basically, I hate argmax. Argmax should be at the latest stage in your pipeline, right? Uh, and so here, instead of saying I just argmax and I represent like let's say uh, the car as just blue pixels and like ones or ones in a in a in a map, right? And it, so BV representation means like it's a ground plane representation, and you have multiple channels, and each channel represents let's say the presence or absence of something at that location. And so here we just scaled it according to uncertainty, and then learned the policy from that. Uh, but then you would see like something like this, where the car, the demonstration would tell you go there, but then in your BV that says hey there is something there maybe. Um, and so what we found is that scaling by the uncertainty was enough to basically be robust to that noise in the learning from the demonstration. Thanks so much. I will take one more question in the, in the interest of time coming from Andrea. Andrea is asking, when discussing safety, we often worry about worst case tail events, i.e. events that are super unlikely but could happen. However, if a system is always safeguarding against these tail events, it often results in a very conservative autonomous system. How do we know when our autonomous system should worry about these tail events during decision making? Yep, that's a very, very good question. And that's a very, very hard question. Um, one way is to say, like, let's just have a way to react to when these events kind of like materialize. So you have like, basically like again you can have multiple different systems in autonomous stack right one that behaves normally and then one that behaves like oh shit you know kind of a moment uh and so you can actually formalize this and this is what we've done in this work where you actually can say learning to switch uh between these different policies um um and so you can basically be most of the time driving normally and then learning say oh now i need to switch my policy but uh, another way and, and and like principled is is this notion of um, entropic risk and if you look at this entropic risk that i described earlier um Basically, you're still minimizing uh, a loss in expectation. So here, it's not like the worst case scenario, right? Your 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 objective is not a worst case scenario. Your worst case is just a risk aware expectation, if you want. And and the way it is, it's because it's the expectation of your cost. So you still want to optimize an expectation, but you're controlling for how sensitive you are to the variance of your objective, right? Um, and so, and so that's how, like, that's something in between, right? So like the expectation or the risk neutral would be sigma equals zero. The worst case would be like, I just replaced my expectation by, by a max. And then uh, here, this is something a bit more in between where you can have a smooth knob to turn your risk sensitivity. Okay. And um, thanks so much. Um, I think uh, we have to, to end the, the question session for now to in the interest of time. Thanks again for your fantastic talk. It was a pleasure having you in the workshop and uh, thanks for sharing your, your great work. Thank you, Igor. My pleasure was all mine. 
Okay, now we will switch to the last round of contributed talks. And the first talk we're starting with is task and motion pla planning for safe and efficient urban driving by Yan Ding. Um, I will play the, the video and uh, afterwards unmute the speaker for, for a brief round of questions. Hello everyone, my name is Yan Ding. I'm a first year PhD student in computer science from BMD University in New York State. Today I will introduce our work, Task Motion Planning for Safe and Efficient Urban Driving. This work is in collaboration with my lab mates, Xiaohan Zhang, Xinyue Zhang, and my advisor Shi Qi Zhang. Autonomous driving technologies have the greater potential of reshaping urban mobility in people's daily life. Generally, vehicles need to plan at the task level to compute a sequence of symbolic actions towards efficiently fulfilling service requests from people. At the same time, vehicles must plan at the motion level to compute continuous trajectories and desired control signals. This work is motivated by the observation that, that vehicles need to plan at the both task level and motion level. However, the interaction between task level and motion level is less investigated within the autonomous driving community. Now I'm showing you two situations where the left one is a dangerous situation and the right one is the safe to the vehicle for merging lane behavior. The key contribution of the research is that we produce an algorithm that enables autonomous vehicle to evaluate the, the safety level at the wrong time and use this safety level to help the task planner to update its planning. There is a short demonstration. We have implemented an evaluated algorithm using Kala, an autonomous driving platform. The vehicle is tasked with driving from initial location to the goal location. The vehicle starts with plan A, marked by the blue line at the task level. When the vehicle is getting close to the area 1, the safety estimator will report a low safety value. If the vehicle is forced to perform the plan A, there will be a collision in the near future. Using the computed safety level, the task planner will recompute an optimal plan. Here we call it plan B. Plan B is marked by the green line. Different from plan A, plan B suggests that the vehicle going straight and merge left in the area too. It's safe for vehicle to merge land in this position. TMPUD enables the vehicle to avoid unsafe behaviors. We show the top-down view of the color. We evaluate the TMPUD in this scenario for many times. Our developed algorithm have a great performance in terms of safety and efficiency. Thank you for watching the video. If you have any questions, please drop me an email. Okay, are there any questions for Jan now? Please, uh, you can ask uh, in, the, in the group chat and uh, he, he will answer directly, or you can also ask in the via mail. Jan, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, sure. OK, perfect. Yes, yeah, so uh, I have a question for you. Um, how do you choose the notion of what is a task? Uh, is it merely to drive to a, to a goal, or are, are the more complex task specifications possible in your approach? Uh, so, sorry, could you re uh, repeat your question? Yeah. I don't know here clearly. Sure. So what, what is a task for you? Is it only driving to a goal or can you define more, more, complex, uh, more complex specifications of what a task could be? 
So is task only goal following or can it be also something else like, to, like for example, uh, avoid traffic jams or things like that? Oh, uh, sure. Um, uh, our, uh, our objective is to find a road uh, uh, with, the, with the most, uh, with the most uh, shortest lengths. Uh, at the same time, we also want to ensure that um, the, the traffic is very safe for the autonom autonomous vehicle. Uh, there's two objectives uh, in our in our work. One is the efficiency, and one is the uh, safety. There's the two cost to evaluate this uh, these two parameters. Okay. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. That that's perfect. Thanks so much. I, I see no further questions for now. I, again, I, I invite everyone to, to use the chat or to use our, our cool uh, VR room so to, to ask more questions later on. I will, in the interest of time, move on to the next talk, um, okay. which is by Andrea. The title is A Robust Control Framework for Intent-Driven Human Motion Prediction. Hi, my name is Andrea, and today I'll be talking about a robust control framework for intent-driven human motion prediction. Robots are increasingly operating in close physical proximity to people. Here's an example of a pedestrian operating around a ground vehicle in my lab, but we're also seeing these robots in the wild. In scenarios like these, it's critical that autonomous vehicles are able to predict where people will move to plan safe and efficient trajectories. To build such predictive models of people, we can look to the increasing quantity of human data and learn models of human behavior offline. For instance, we can use data to learn what different goals in a room a person might have, as well as how they tend to act given the intent to reach one of these goals. Then the robot can use data online to infer the human's intent via Bayesian inference. When the learned decision-making model is combined with dynamics model, we can generate state predictions forward in time, which the robot collision checks against when motion planning. Unfortunately, these learned models are not always correct. For example, here the human is walking towards a third unmodeled goal that the robot does not know about. When the robot relies on this incorrect model for prediction, it confidently plans on unsafe motion, which results in a collision. To eliminate such safety violations, conservative motion predictors from robust control theory remove the learned decision-making model entirely. Using a conservative set of human actions, these predictors safeguard against all possible human trajectories, which is formally called a forward-reachable set. While surely safe, these predictors often come at the cost of efficiency. In fact, to avoid the human, here the robot has to leave the testbed entirely. In this work, we seek an approach which bridges robust control techniques with intent-driven models to get a predictor which is more robust to misspecified human models, but can still leverage the learned intent to safely reduce conservatism whenever possible. Our key idea is to trust the intent-driven model to tell us only what is completely unlikely. After using the intent-driven model to prune away sufficiently unlikely actions, a robust predictor will safeguard against all sufficiently likely actions equally, much like in the full forward reachable set. To properly restrict the set of feasible human actions over the prediction horizon, we need to take into account how the likelihood of any future human actions depends on the history of actions. The belief precisely encodes this through the Bayesian update. Thus, our predictor explicitly tracks the updated belief as it makes predictions and safeguards against future human actions based on future beliefs. In our running example, since our framework relies only on this set of likely and unlikely actions for predictions, it classifies the human moving straight as a sufficiently probable trajectory, enabling the robot to remain collision free while reaching its goal. Our predictor also helps in a variety of misspecified human model scenarios. For example, when there's an unmodeled obstacle, our predictor once again remains cautiously conservative, but not overly conservative. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Andrea, for, uh, for your talk. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. So I have, I have also a first question. And again, I want to invite everyone to simply ask questions in the, 
Zoom group chat. Uh, my question is, what assumptions do you make about the environment and how can these assumptions be enriched? So how can you make more complex assumptions like, like typical trajectories or uh, that in certain areas, agents might be slower than in other areas? Yeah, great question. So in the examples that I showed here, as you could tell, uh, there weren't any salient obstacles that people had to avoid. Um, although I didn't demonstrate these in these examples, actually adding in obstacles is quite straightforward in these robust control methods that we were using here. Uh, it's sort of a matter of adding in a different constraint set that you're uh, optimizing against when you're when you're safeguarding against certain trajectories. So adding in, for example, you know, lane boundaries or obstacles that the agent might be avoiding um, is relatively straightforward. Now, these other kind of uh, components of, of how an agent might be optimizing their their intent and their motion, like slowing down in certain parts of the environment, that's a little bit harder. And I would classify that as more part of the intent. So for example, that theta component that um, that was you know highlighted in red can't can also be in addition to things like salient goal locations where the person's moving. In general, it can encode things like how a person trades off their uh, preference for moving closer or slower around other people or how you know uh, much they want to like be aggressive or passive when they're a driver. So um, in, in general, the that this this notion of intent can capture these things, which you can learn from that data on offline. Um, however, I actually haven't run specifically examples where that data is encoding more rich notions of intent uh, beyond goals in the examples that I've shown so far. But we're really excited to see how this uh, framework can extend to more richer notions of intent. Okay, thanks so much. Um, there is a question by Ed. Ed is asking. How should a system designer pick a time horizon to balance conservatism while maintaining safety in, FR, in FRS computation? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so we actually had some discussions around how to choose a time horizon. Um, now, one thing that I'm currently investigating, and it's not directly part of this work, but it's ongoing work I'm doing, is um, you can also use reachability as a concept to help you guide a worst case time horizon you might need to be able to accurately estimate a person's intent. And therefore you need to be conservative for admin, you know, in the worst case, this, this length of time. So um, using reachability tools or using these robust control ideas can help us actually find uh, in a somewhat principled way, these, these, um, worst case time horizons for which we need to be conservative in our motion predictors. But that's actually still very much ongoing work. Um, and Ed, I would love to chat more about uh, this with you if you have that time. Okay, thanks so much. Um, yeah, I would say we are moving on to, to the next talk. Um, the next talk is called A squared GNN, Interaction Aware Trajectory Prediction via Graph Double Attention Network. We present interaction of our trajectory prediction via graph double attention network. Accurate trajectory prediction is a prerequisite for safe and high quality decision making and motion planning, especially in highly interactive scenarios. However, interaction modeling is one of the biggest challenges in the multi-vehicle prediction task. Since human behaviors are hard to model and there is no ground truth for the behavior model. Also, we need to deal with flexible number of agents and different scenarios. Our goal is to take a step forward to handle these challenges and provide a generic prediction framework. Here is our problem formulation. The objective is to predict the conditional distribution of the future trajectories of each agent given their history trajectories and the environmental context information. For interaction modeling, it is intuitive to describe the traffic situation with a graph representation. We treat each vehicle as a node and their relation or interactions as edges. 
This graph representation has several good properties. It can encode arbitrary relation among vehicles, and the number of vehicles can be different. Moreover, it can model hair order interaction among vehicles through multiple loops of message passing. We employ a standard encoder-decoder architecture. The inputs of the encoder are history and future embeddings, which are extracted by a deep feature extractor. Then spatial temporal graphs are generated. The graph double attention network is applied to figure out relative importance of each agent at each time step and extract high-level node attributes. These attributes are encoded to a latent space by the encoding function. The decoder takes in a latent variable and history node attributes to generate action hypotheses. The vehicle states are propagated by the bicycle model to guarantee kinematic feasibility. We use the interaction dataset, which includes three highly interactive scenarios. The history and prediction horizons are 2 seconds and 5 seconds. We adopted widely used evaluation metrics, average displacement error and final displacement error. It shows that our method can further reduce the prediction error by a large margin compared with the best baseline method. Here are some visualizations of prediction results. Using context information makes the prediction more compliant to road geometries, and enforcing kinematic constraints makes prediction smoother and more plausible. Please refer to the paper for more details. In a word, we propose a generic framework for multi-agent trajectory prediction using spatial temporal dynamic graph representation for interaction modeling. Feasibility constraints are also enforced by incorporating a kinematic model of vehicles. Thank you. Yashan, thanks so much for this very interesting talk. And uh, again, I want to open this up for questions. Um, let me start. I noticed something uh, when, uh, when looking at your results. Uh, we had the videos in, adva in advance. It was, uh, it was uh, otherwise too, too fast probably to read them. But the numbers were very interesting. So for the very short-term prediction, um, it, the adding context has helped a lot. And the kinematic constraint has helped only a little. But as you go went further to the long term, the role of the kinematic constraint increased. Can you comment a little bit on this? Do you have a, an intuition of which of the additional things that you, that you added, for example, context versus kinematic constraints are important and which mode of operation? OK, thank you for your question. So can you hear me? Yes. OK, OK. So for the kinematic constraints, so the I think the intuition here is that uh, if our scenarios include some curvature curved uh, roads, then uh, sometimes we, we need a more a smoother prediction of the trajectories. And if we, have, if we incorporate some kinematic constraints for the vehicles, then the variance of the prediction hypothesis will be smaller than uh, not incorporating any constraints. So as long as the time goes by, uh, the long-term prediction can, uh, can be benefited from these kind of constraints. And also, uh, if we incorporate some context information, then the model can know that uh, what the scenario will be in the near future. So, for the long-term prediction, the kinematics constraints and the context information will be more important. But for the short-term prediction, uh, it is uh, just uh, like maybe constant velocity, something like uh, those kind of patterns. So did I answer your question? Yes, thanks so much. OK, um, thank you. I actually have many more questions. It's very, very interesting. Um, but okay. uh, in the interest of time, I, I would I would move on to the to the next talk. Um, again, okay, sure. you 
everyone is very welcome to to ask questions in, in the chat. I, I assume all all the authors will be around for the conference or at least for the workshop. Um, so the next talk that we we are we are having is combined learning and optimization for motion trajectory prediction with environment constraints by Weiming Chi. Hi, my name is Wei Ming Xi and I'm from the University of Sydney and I'll be talking about my work on combined learning and optimization for motion trajectory prediction. So the problem that we have is uh, we, we wish to predict trajectories of moving agents in the vicinity and many recent developments uh, on this problem take a learning based approach to make predictions based on training data. So on the other hand, there are also clear constraints due to environmental structure that we can specify. So how do we enforce these constraints? So we propose uh, a combined learning and optimization approach, and we view learning and optimization as complementary for motion prediction. So we have a learning component which allows uh, our trajectories to imitate uh, our training data. On the other hand, we also have an optimization component to allow us to uh, specify constraints. So on the learning component, we represent future trajectories as continuous time uh, functions in the form of uh, weighted sums of basis functions. And we predict distributions of, of future trajectories by assuming that these weights are distributed as a mixture of matrix normal distributions. And then we can use a neural network to estimate the parameters of this distribution. And uh, on the right here, um, you can see uh, distributions of uh, trajectories. You can see that this is also multimodal. So next, we want to optimize these distributions of trajectories. And our goal here is to find this obstacle cost which we define as the probability of collision over uh, an entire distribution of trajectories defined as this integral here. And we can approximate this using quadrature methods and provided uh, occupancy gradients, we can uh, obtain analytical Jacobians and Hessians, making the optimization easier. And here is a case study. So this magenta uh, distribution of trajectories is solely from learning and we can see that it collides uh, with occupied space or well, occupied regions, while the cyan trajectory is uh, from learning and optimization, and we can see that uh, it complies with environmental uh, constraints. And on the on the right here, you can see this: uh, these red trajectories are generated from the non-compliant distribution of trajectories, while the green uh, are generated from the compliant. And in summary, we present a combined learning and optimization framework to predict future motion trajectories. And our future motion trajectories adhere to environmental constraints. I mean, can you hear me? Yep, yep, I can okay. hear you. Awesome. Thanks so much for, for the talk. Um, Again, as you, the reminder, simply write questions in the Zoom group chat. I start with the, with the first question. Um, so I, I really like the approach. I was wondering how easy is it to integrate in this type of approach more complex constraints? Uh, on the one hand, I was thinking of uh, like complex, more complex social modeling. And on the other hand, something like dynamic obstacles or, uh, or like so, some sort of uh, dynamics of the vehicles that are involved? Um, it uh, should be uh, fairly okay as long as you can write it as a cost. Um, I've, I've tried other constraints like velocity constraints. So if you know beforehand that uh, these mm -hmm. moving things that you're trying to predict are below some velocity, you can have constraints on that. Um, so, uh, specifying the constraints as long as you can write it down and um and 
you know, as, as some sort of constraint that you put into an optimization problem. Um, and, and normally the optimization actually uh, works quite well because if you use the prediction as a kind of warm start for the optimization, uh, it, it's uh, the the prediction is actually already quite close to a to to an optima. So uh, so yeah. So it as long as you can write it down as a constraint, um, uh, hopefully you'd be able to use this. We're quickly resolving the sound issue. One second. While we resolve the sound issue, I will first we will first start with the last video, and then get back to to the second to last video. For uh, so the talk that we will be hearing now first is assistive robust reward design by Jerry Chi Yang He. We present assistive robust reward design. Real-world AI systems rely heavily on their reward functions in order to operate correctly. For instance, an autonomous vehicle is guided by a reward function that prescribes good driving behaviors. While the system treats this reward function as set in stone, we seldom write this reward function once and for all. 
In fact, we frequently update this robot function to account for different factors such as safety and efficiency. As we develop and test our systems in more real-world environments, we go back and forth to revise this robot function. Even after the system is deployed, we may still encounter failure cases that needs to be addressed by the change of reward design. This motivates us to rethink the current AI systems for self-driving and other applications. We argue that the AI system should account for the iterative nature of the reward design process rather than treat the currently specified reward as set in stone. Let's break down what this means. First of all, the AI system should realize that the proxy designs from the designers are not golden standards, but only evidences of the true reward function. The AI can then use this reward evidence to compute a belief over the true reward function. The AI system should also realize that there will be future evidences that come in the form of reward revisions. As we know from working in partially observable environments, the fact that the current evidence is not the final one. The possibility of future evidences means that the agent should not just use its current belief, instead it has the opportunity to plan to influence what these future evidences are. This leads to our key insight, which is an assistive reward design system should actively expose the designers to the environments that have the most potential to narrow down what the rewards should be. Ideally, we want to find an edge case, an environment where the current reward design will fail. In such environments, the reward that are likely in the robot's current belief would lead to contradictory behaviors. We formalize this by maximizing the expected information gain. When run on a simulated driving task, our algorithm outperforms passive baselines in finding edge case environments with high regret. When run in an iterative manner, assistive robust reward design effectively speeds up the design process. Harry, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you for this very interesting talk. And uh, sorry for slightly pre-scheduling you earlier. Um, no. So, could you could you maybe briefly comment what would be what how do, what do you see the challenge for deployment of this system to some sort of real world platform for reward designing and if you deploy deploy it on a full scale vehicle. Yeah, actually, that is a direction that we're actively thinking about. I think a couple challenges would include, first of all, uh, we would like to have this simulation environment where we can retrieve and pull up real world scenarios. As you can see in our presentation, these environments that are, we are working on are pretty toy environments. We only have a straight line and a couple simple vehicles. We would really like to scale that up. and. My experience working even in the simple environment make me believe that in very complex environments, this problem of um, reward design will be more severe. And I think that will be interesting. And another, um, I think, challenge currently we're facing is that because we require uh, the spatial inference over possible belief and the computation of running that inference is pretty expensive. And as we scale that up into more real world uh, scenarios we will need more computations. So computationally, how we uh, uh, make more our algorithm more efficient is another uh, challenge. What uh, runtime improvement would you require to to make it real time capable or to make it useful for for deployment? Yes, I can give you an example, uh, which is that um, um, currently. If you remember from the slide that we have the designer look at a couple of environments and then the agent actually proposes an environment where the autonomous vehicle crashes, this environment is found by searching over all the possible environments. So in our case, there are a couple hundred thousand environments and we do not have the, uh, the ability to exhaustively look at all of them. So we do some sampling and and this uh, computation scales linearly with the number of uh, environments out there. And, and I think this is one big bottleneck. 
Um, yes. Because we're doing this uh, inference um, on all of the environments. So we do not, we cannot afford to uh, compute this um, uncertainty and information gain on all of the environments. I think it will be very interesting if we can come up with alternative, say, objectives um, or methods to, uh, to speed that up. OK, thanks so much. Um, I think we are moving now to, to the last, which originally was second to last talk. Also, sorry for the brief noise interruption and uh, switching. Um, was not playing in quick time, so one had to jump in. In this paper, we ask us if we can define a prediction model covering various types of behavioral unknowns for interactive planning. Let's consider the example of an autonomous vehicle having to merge onto a crowded lane. Commonly, two intentions, give way or take way, are defined for such a task. But it remains unclear if this definition is complete. Further, an intent definition only describes what may happen in the intersection, leaving unclear how it physically happens. The intent giving way is possibly realized at different gaps to the leading vehicle, and individual drivers may adapt their behavior over time. Our prediction model avoids the definition of intents and tries to capture both inter-driver and intra-driver continuous behavioral variations. Our approach defines a behavior space, which is then partitioned into equal-sized behavior hypotheses. We assume that all participants act according to a hypothetical policy depending on a participant-specific, physically interpretable behavior state. The behavior space capital B of a participant spans a range of possible behavior states. Using physical interpretability, we can define a full behavior space comprising the individual behavior spaces by looking at the physically realistic situations. For instance, a behavior state modeling the desired gap to the leading vehicle must be between 0 meters and the maximum sensor range. The desired acceleration of another vehicle must be between 0 meters per second squared and the physical acceleration limit. We then partition the behavior space to define the hypothesis set. We solve the problem sample efficiently by integrating robustness-based optimality. To solve the standard stochastic Bayesian game, one can track posterior beliefs over the hypothesis for each other participant and then use a multi-agent Monte Carlo tree search algorithm and sample different hypotheses from the beliefs before each iteration. We integrate the worst-case optimality criterion of robust Markov decision processes into the stochastic Bayesian game. In our paper, we proved that our extension, the robust stochastic by using game reduces the sample complexity exponentially when dealing with continuous behavioral variations within hypothesis. We analyze our approach in a merging scenario where we simulate that the unknown behavior of other participants covers a five-dimensional behavior space based on an adaptive cruise control model. We sample unknown boundaries of behavioral variations for the parameters of the ACC model for each participant in trial. We use lower dimensional behavior spaces for building the hypothesis set defined over the desired velocity, desired time headway or both parameters. We calculate percentages of collisions and successful merging and the average scenario time and show the results for different numbers of iterations for 200 trials. The SPG and RSPG planners achieve near the same performance as a full info planner having access to the true behavior of other participants. The SPG shows some collisions for 50 iterations. This indicates that hypothesis sets over 1D behavior space can be used to cover 5D behavioral variations. Also, the RSPG model better captures worst-case outcomes than SPG. We conclude that the combination of the proposed hypothesis design process and our SPG model is practically applicable. Thank you for your attention. Great. Well, um, thank you to Julian. Um, uh, I'm not sure, Julian, are you here? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if... Um, let me just check. No, I don't think Julian is here. I think we've caught him at a uh, difficult time for, for Europe. Um, but if you, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we've um, linked to Julian's um, web page in the um, schedule. Uh, his name is a hyperlink. So feel free to um, ask him any questions. 
Um, and I think with that, uh, and especially since uh, Julian is, is not around um, uh, and we're running a little bit late, um, uh, we'll, we'll move straight on to uh, our next uh, speaker, uh, who is uh, um, um, uh, Professor um, Cheng Liu Liu, uh, who is an assistant professor at the Robotics uh, Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, her research interests lie in the design and verification of intelligent systems with applications to transportation and manufacturing. Um, she published she published the book uh, Designing Robot Behavior in Human Robot Interactions, uh, which is great for this workshop, <laughs> uh, with um, CRC Press in 2019. Uh, she's the recipient of the 2019 Amazon Research Award, and her talk today is titled uh, Safe Autonomous Driving prediction, planning, and coordination. Um, so thanks so much for joining us uh, today, and we look forward to your talk uh, whenever you're ready to start. Oh, cool. Thanks for unmuting me and thanks for the introduction. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Chang Liu. Today I'm going to talk about safe autonomous driving. Um, so let me go to the full screen. Okay. Can you see my slide? I suppose yes. Okay. So when we talk about safe autonomous driving, what are we looking for? So for example, if the autonomous vehicle uh, bumping into another vehicle in the roundabout, the vehicle should yield, so that's a safe behavior. But the second case, when the another autonomous vehicle goes in, the vehicle yields, that's safe, but actually there's no uh, conflict between the other vehicle and the eagle vehicle. So from an efficiency perspective, this behavior is actually not desired, it's too conservative. And let's look at how human drivers will do. Um, so this is a video I took at a middle-sized intersection in um, Shanghai. Um, there, there's left turn vehicles and uh, straight vehicles. There's no left turn light to regulate the behavior of the light, left turn vehicles, but the human drivers managed to cross each other without colliding with each other, uh, maintaining both the safety and efficiency. So actually when we talk about safe autonomous driving, we're emphasizing that we want to maintain safety but as well as to ensure that the autonomous system can drive efficiently on the road. And uh, this is the emphasis of today's talk. Um, so as we said earlier, that uh, if we want to design the behavior of an autonomous vehicles, we have two design objectives. One is to make their behavior safe and the other is within the safety bound, we want to make their behavior as efficient as possible. And during the design, what are the constraints we have? So the first constraint we have is the computation constraint. Usually those autonomous vehicles will not have super, power, super computation power to reason about all the possible feature, features. Um, so then there's a computation limit to um, ask, we need to make sure that the autonomous vehicle can compute a desired result as soon as possible and generate response in real time under the limited computation power. And then the second constraint is about the uncertainties. Um, there are a lot of uncertainties when the autonomous vehicle drive on public road, it needs to interact with other road participants, including human driver, uh, human driven vehicles, as well as pedestrians. And those uncertainties will complicate the interac uh, interaction um, um, in the autonomous driving, as well as making it hard to achieve safety and efficiency. So the overall research problem um, that we are addressing is how can we design the behavior of autonomous vehicles in those dynamic uncertain environments under those limited co computation capacity in order to maintain safety while ma maximizing efficiency. And before we look at several ways for us to um, do the design, let's first try to understand um, the system or the environment the autonomous vehicles are driving in from a multi-agent perspective. Oops, I don't have my cursor. Okay, so suppose um, our system, um, the autonomous vehicle that we um, designed for is this red vehicle. 
and it is surrounded by many other vehicles, including the yellow one and some um, pedestrians. And uh, all the vehicles and the pedestrians can be viewed as agents and they have their own dynamics. The red vehicle has its sensors to sense the states of the others and then make decisions based on the sensory information. Meanwhile, all the other um, human driven vehicles or autonomous vehicles or pedestrians have their own sensors to sense the, each other and then make corresponding driving decisions or movement decisions. And the design objective for us is to specify the behavior system for the ego vehicle that we care about, that is the red one. And when we talk about a behavior system, what we are um, talk, we, what we are mentioning is that um, mapping from the data received um, from the sensors to the action that will be applied to the physical hardware, that is the vehicle in this case. And usually for this behavior system, we'll first have a logic or policy or control law that maps the um, received data to the action, which minimize a cost function given a model. And we call the cost and the model as the knowledge. So uh, minimizing a cost is actually equivalent to maximizing the reward. Um, these are just um, different fields use different names. Control people tends to use cost and uh, AI people tends to use re reward. Um, but those knowledges, uh, it's difficult to fully specify the knowledges offline and then apply them um, to the online driving because there can be unexpected scenarios. So then we need to enable the learning capacities for the um, autonomous vehicle in order to update either the knowledge or the policy directly based on the real-time driving data. And with that, um, we have characterized the systems that the autonomous, drive, autonomous vehicles lie in. Uh, we always call the behavior system, that is the uh, kind of the controller or decision-making center for the for a single vehicle as the microscopic system. While we call the uh, multi-vehicle system or the transportation system as the macroscopic system, which involves a lot of um, dynamic, physical dynamic systems as, as well as their associated behavior systems. So in today's talk, we are going to first pose the decision-making problem as an optimization, and then talk about how we can ensure um, the, how we can design the behavior of the autonomous vehicle through prediction planning and coordination in order to maximize the efficiency while guarantee safety under the uh, uncertainty of the interaction as well as, as well as the computational limits. So we form the planning problem as the following optimization where where we minimize a cost function for task performance and motion efficiency. Uh, so in this slide, all the um, subscript R refers to the eco vehicle. And uh, the subscript H refers to the surrounding road participants. Um, so for the planning problem for the eco vehicle, uh, we have a bunch of constraints. The first line of constraints correspond to the dynamic and feasibility constraints, which we have um, constraint on the control, constraint on the state, as well as the dynamics as an ODE here. And then the last constraint is interesting. We want, while the autonomous vehicle is driving on public roads, we want it to interact safely with others. So then the last one is the safety constraint during this interaction. XH is the state of all the other road participants. We want the ego robots state to be within a safe set with respect to the state of others. So uh, if we look at the following situation, if the gray part, gray vehicle, is the ego vehicle, the yellow vehicle is, and the surrounding vehicle, we want to make sure the gray vehicle will never um, collide with the others. So this con safety constraint is actually very difficult to deal with because we have model uncertainties and also sensor noises. That means we cannot fully correctly predict the future behaviors of others. And uh, if we want to solve this problem in a long time horizon, the accumulation of the uncertainty will make the behavior of the ego vehicle very conservative. And uh, let's look at one example why this happens. 
So in this example, we want the robot to go to its target uh, while avoiding this human in this confined space. So what the robot will do is first predict the human trajectory together with some uncertainty and then plan its own trajectory as this yellow curve here, and then execute this trajectory while observing the human trajectory as showing the um, black curve here. Then in the next step, the robot repeats the whole process, predict the human trajectory with some uncertainty and then plan its own trajectory and then execute. Um, so the robot can repeat this process again and again. But this actually does not help the robot get any closer to the target as it is almost terrified by the uncertainty um, in the prediction of human behavior. And what is going wrong here? Let's go back to our previous design objectives and constraints. So we have first objective to that is to be op optimal and also efficient. If we want to be optimal, then we need, actually need to do long term horizon. Uh, long time horizon planning, um, because otherwise it is very easy for the uh, robot to be trapped into local optima. But then under computation constraints, if we do long term horizon planning, that means we need long computation time. And uh, since there are uncertainties, long computation time means there will be larger uncertainty accumulation. And uh, since we want to also maintain feasibility, that is the safety of the system then larger uncertainty accumulation requires us to be conservative in our motion planning. And then this directly contradicts with our optimality goal. Okay, but how can we solve this paradox? There are a bunch of ways to solve it. For example, we can release some of the constraints, increase the computation, uh, uh, improve the computation power so that we can compute faster or improve our prediction so that we can have less uncertainties. And also uh, the first approach we'll talk about here is to, instead of addressing this planning problem in a single scheme, we can address the problem in uh, a parallel scheme. That is, we have planners to address different objectives. So in this case, we can have an efficiency controller to address the optimality goal, and then a safety controller to address the uh, feasibility goal. How does it work? The efficiency controller now only considers the rough estimation of the human without uncertainty, while the safety controller will consider all the uncertainties in the short term and do reactive replanning. So using the previous example, um, the human will still um, generate, uh, the robot will still generate a prediction for the human in the efficiency controller. But this time the robot will plan a trajectory without worrying about the like, accumulation of uncertainty in the long term then this long-term trajectory will be sent to the safety controller for monitoring. In the first time step in the safety controller, the uncertainty of the human behavior will be um, predicted. And then um, the short-term safety controller will check whether the long-term plan is safe to be executed or not with respect to the human uncertainty. In this case, it is safe. So then the long-term plan is executed. In the next time step, the long-term plan actually intersect with the uncertainty core. So it's not safe anymore to execute. Then the safety controller generates a detour. Meanwhile, the efficiency controller um, will generate a new prediction of the human uh, and then a new plan for the long-term and overrides the old long-term plan. And then the safety controller will monitor the new long-term plan and uh, it will safely guide the robot towards the target. So this approach is non-conservative as compared to the previous one. It also avoids the local optimal problem that a lot of this uh, reactive or short-term planner may have since we still have a long-term guidance. And uh, in this case, since we have the safety controller, the uncertainty is still addressed, but in the short term. Okay, so that's one way to address this paradox. And uh, later we are going to talk about the other two ways. First is to improve our prediction to reduced uncertainty. And the second is to um, design better algorithms so that we can solve the optimization faster. Okay, so for prediction, um, there are a lot of methods to um, predict surrounding vehicles as also we've seen a lot of methods uh, in the previous sessions. And that a good prediction is, can help us improve the safety level of the autonomous vehicles. And uh, we can learn those prediction models from massive amount of data. But the problem is that it's very hard to make such model account for 
um, heterogeneous behaviors or time varying behaviors. So in a lot of cases, we might have um, different distributions uh, in the occupancy measure, but in the end, while we are do, doing this massive amount of training, we actually average out those distributions. And uh, by doing that, we are actually reducing the accuracy of our prediction. So how can we do, how can we uh, mitigate that? The insight we have is to combine offline learning with online adaptation. And how does it work? So suppose we want to predict a system that has dynamics f, uh, xk plus one equal to fxk. And then we build up prediction model f theta k with parameter theta. And uh, as the ground truth evolves, we cannot observe the true function, but we can observe the state. And uh, every time when we make a prediction, we'll compare it in the next time step with the true measurement and see how, how big is the error. And then use an adaptation algorithm um, to modify the model parameter in the next time step. And then use the new modified model parameter for the new prediction and uh, keep this process again and again. In this way, we can make sure that our uh, mo prediction model is locally overfit to the data so that we can reduce the prediction error. And in terms of the prediction model, which is a function that we use for the prediction, we can use different kinds of functions. For example, here we use a neural network. Uh, but neural network has a bunch of, a lot of um, parameters. It is unnecessary to adapt all of them online. So usually what we do is to regard the first few layers of the network as feature extractors, and then only regard the last few layers as online adaptable parameters, which can help us adapt the high level features to generalize uh, to, uh, to better fit time varying behaviors and individual differences. And even if we don't have real time uh, labeled data, for example, if we want to predict intention, and then it's very hard to have labeled intention in real time for us to adapt the prediction model. Then we can develop multitask model and uh, use the lab, uh, available data, for example, trajectories to adapt um, common parts in this model so that we can generate real time adaptation for those unlabeled data in real time. And uh, also for the adaptation algorithms, there are a bunch of ways to do the real adaptation. Actually, the adaptation is similar to the offline training. So definitely we can use gradient-based method, which is called also called first order method for the adaptation, as well as um, second order method that is least square-based method for adaptation. So although first order method has demonstrated great success in the offline training, actually for online adaptation, we see that least square or second order methods perform much better um, than the first order method. Uh, one reason is that for online adaptation, we want to explore local overfitting. So then the second order method will be more efficient here. And uh, here is some um, data we generate, uh, result we generated for the um, predict, uh, for the adapt adaptable prediction for NGCM dataset. In this case, um, the blue one is the ground truth, and uh, the green one is the offline learning algorithm PS scale that we used to generate the prediction model. And then the red one is PS scale plus our adaptation algorithm. As we can see, um, this adaptable prediction is more accurate and stable than without this adaptation. And for the errors at different time step, we can see we, for the initial predictions, we will have big errors. But after, pre after this adaptation, those errors will be minimized as the time moves. Okay, and uh, here are also two other applications of this kind of adaptable prediction in human uh, motion prediction where similar methods are used as the previous case and uh, we can e efficiently adapt the human uh, upper limb trajectories as well as human intentions. Okay, so that's the prediction side. And then for the um, planning side, in order to overcome the computation limit, we need to develop efficient optimization algorithms. So this is the optimization we introduced earlier. In order to take the advantage of uh, off-the-shelf optimization solvers, we can discretize the problem into a general non-convex optimization. But the problem of using 
off-the-shelf generic solvers is that they usually neglect the unique geometric structures of the problem so that it will require a lot of time to solve this non-convex optimization. Um, the insight we have is that there are unique structures in, in the planning problem for autonomous vehicles, and we can directly leverage this, these features in designing optimization algorithms. For example, in a lot of cases, the non-convexity actually only comes from the constraints. So in this way, we can locally convexify the problem and uh, then only solve the problem in a convex feasible set and then use iterations to minimize the approxi approximation error during the convexification step. And by doing that, we can safely find the uh, optimal, at least a local optimal. And the, this method has guaranteed convergence. Um, but this uh, animation here is just illustrating in a, like a simplified 2D space. What is going on in the trajectory space is like that. Suppose we want to navigate through this um, maze following a reference trajectory, but we want to enlarge the safe margin of this reference trajectory. Then we first need to convexify the whole problem that by generating a convex tube around the reference trajectory. And finally, the um, computed convex tube is like this. Although the projection of this tube to 2D is not a convex region, but in the trajectory space, this is a convex set, and it is easy to solve the trajectory optimization problem in this convex set. And after that, it's um, computation, very computationally efficient for us to get a solution. And uh, we have compared this convex feasible set method with other off-the-shelf methods. It has demonstrated uh, great efficiency compared with others. And uh, for the trajectories generated by CFS, for every iteration, it is um, actually smooth. And it only takes a few iterations, it only takes one iteration to make a reference trajectory. In this case, is the dashed line, which is infeasible, to make an infeasible reference to be feasible, which is this um, light pink curve. And then five iterations to converge to the optimal trajectory while the off-the-shelf interior point method takes a bunch of iterations to make the trajectory feasible and uh, even more iterations to converge to the optimal trajectory. Yeah, we have applied this method to a passenger vehicle interaction case where we allow our passenger to specify a target location. And then just by one click, we can generate a trajectory in real time to drive the vehicle towards the target. And this can be applied to automatic valet parking. OK, so the last thing is about coordination. Um, so if we design the behavior of single vehicle, this actually can also cannot solve all the problems. For example, if the four vehicles here are all autonomous vehicle, and they arrive at the um, uncontrolled intersection at the same time, so there's no priority among those vehicles. If the behavior of those vehicles are designed samely. They will in, inch forward to test the response of others. And if others yell, they will stop. If others don't, they will just go. If all the four vehicles do the same thing, then the whole system may be trapped into this yell stop and then yell stop loop. And in order to solve this problem, we actually need to introduce communication and coordination of those vehicles to allow them to figure out the passing order before they actually get into the intersection, as shown here. And technically how it works. This is by um, building a communication module for all the vehicle, which it can send information and receive information. Um, but we are, not allow we are not requiring all the vehicle to communicate very detailed information. Only high level information is communicated. For example, the time to occupy the conflict zone or the intersection. And the, this communicated information can substitute the prediction module in the in individual vehicles. And uh, we can directly use the community in information as the constraints in our motion planning problem. And after we solve, re uh, after we receive this communication information, then the next step is to do conflict resolution in the decision-making module. Um, it corresponds to solve a conflict graph based on all the information received from others. And if all the agents are using the same conflict resolution re strategy, 
we can form a consensus among all the agents and then the animated situation in the last slide as shown here can happen, which the vehicles can uh, figure out the order to cross the intersection without even stop. Okay, so in a summary, um, this is the slide we see earlier uh, where we have a design objective that is to be efficient and safe. And uh, we have a bunch of design constraints uh, the first is the computation constraint. We cannot have uh, unlimited computation power to reason about all the possible, um, all the possible futures. And also we have a lot of uncertainties during the interaction. Um, so we discussed different approaches to address these problems. The first approach we discussed is the parallel planning approach that is to decouple the planning problem into two planning problems with different sampling frequency. So then we can have the um, plan, uh, planner that has low sampling frequency to address the efficiency, and then a planner with high sampling frequency to address the safety with uncertainty. And then we discussed about the prediction method, especially the adaptable prediction models to reduce the uncertainty in the prediction. And then we discussed about the real-time optimization method to um, make the planning more efficient that also can help reduce the uh, replanning frequency here, or increase the replanning frequency. And uh, lastly, we talk about coordination stuff or conflict resolution mechanism. That is also a way to help reduce the uncertainty through communication. Okay, so I would like to thank all the sponsors for the work that presented here and also all the collaborators and the students who contribute to the work. Um, and that's for my presentation. I'm happy to take questions from here. Great, well, yeah, thank, thank you so much. Um, uh, so uh, if anyone has any questions um, and especially for those that have just joined, um, uh, we're communicating via the Zoom chat. So if you if you have um, any questions, um, feel free to just add them add them into the chat, and um, we'll start um, reading them off from there. Um, so thank you, Professor Penry. Um, okay, so um, we have one question here. The, the local online adaptation is interesting. Which layers of the network are you adapting? Are they also working on multimodal prediction models? Yeah, so for here, um, um, we are adapt. So in this case, for example, we have uh, both prediction for the trajectory and prediction for the intention. And since we don't have ground truth for intention, we only use the ground truth for trajectory to adapt the common encoder. And though we are only adapting the last layer of the encoder, but this means we need to pass the gradient through the decoder and all the way get to the last layer of encoder. Um, for, as for the multimodal predictions, I, I don't think uh, we have any problem applying the adaptation algorithm there because adaptation algorithm is a kind of an optimizer. As long as your uh, multi-model pre multi prediction model can be learned offline using uh, like say stochastic gradient descent, we can then also use uh, stochastic gradient descent for online adaptation. Okay, great. Uh, and we have, uh, so we have a second question here from um, uh, Igor. So the four-way intersection uh, example was cool. <laughs> uh, what are other scenarios in which you envision, uh, in, 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 envision uh, communication to be required? Yeah, I would say in a lot of um, conflict, conflicting scenarios, communication would be very helpful. For example, in the merging case, if um, two vehicles have the same velocity and uh, expect to arrive at a merging point at the same time and there's no explicit priority between the two, then definitely if we can form a communication mechanism to let them negotiate be before they arrive there, it will be very helpful. 
And uh, the negotiation is actually um, kind of a way to move the conflict resolution problem earlier than it occurs in the real physical world. Okay, great. Um, uh, and then we've got a better question from the team. Um, so is adapting the last layer always sufficient to capture the local behavior information? Um, in our experiment, it is. Um, but I think that depends on your model. So for our model, the input is the trajectory and the output is kind of high level features um, so that we can use decoders to generate um, predicted trajectory and the classifier to classify the intention. And uh, in this way, um, uh, lower levels of uh, the first few layers of the network is actually getting low level features and the higher level is getting high level features. And um, for a lot of cases and also for human behaviors, their low level features tend to be similar, but there will be differences and the major differences is always in the high level. So in this way, adapting the last layer or maybe last few layers um, is sufficient in our experiment. But there can maybe other cases, maybe not in the human motion prediction domain that the differences across data is not in a high level feature, but low level feature. And then in this case, you need to adapt the low level, uh, adapt the first few layers of the network instead of the last few layers of the network. Okay, great. And um, I, I, I also had a question. Um, with uh, with uh, one of the, the, the final parts of your talk, you were talking about um, coordination between vehicles uh, uh, through a communication of high level intent uh, as a way to reduce uncertainty. Um, do you think there's any interesting extensions where even though the point is to reduce uncertainty, um, we could still model some uh, uncertainty about you know, I want to turn at this point in time, but I'm not exactly sure when I'm going to get there. And, 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 and basically communicating their own uncertainty to other vehicles um, rather than a, a single, single intention. Yeah, same. Thank you for unmute me. C could you please repeat your question? There's a train. Uh, I didn't hear your question clearly. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah, no, no problem. Um, so the, the question was uh, in the latter part of your talk, you, you were talking about um, we can use coordination and communication between vehicles about their high level intent as a way to reduce uncertainty about what might happen in an intersection. Um, do you think there's any uh, interesting extensions where maybe the vehicles could communicate not only their intent, uh, but maybe uncertainties about when they may get to the intersection in case there's, say, a human, there's, it's a mixed autonomy scenario and there's human drivers where we can't maybe fully predict what they may do. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And that is also one thing we're currently working on because um, there are a lot of limitations of the work I introduced here. Um, it can only work if all the vehicles follow the same rule and all the vehicles are connected to each other. And if there's one human driven vehicle who does not uh, follow the same rule, the, the whole thing will break. Yeah, but that's true. If we can allow the vehicles to, the connected vehicles to communicate more information, we can also tolerate like kind of non-cooperative vehicles in the environment, for example, human-driven vehicles. The point is we then need to divide the intersection or the local transportation system into two groups. The first group is mm -hmm. all the vehicles that can communicate with each other. And then the second group is the vehicles that do not communicate. And it will be very helpful for the first group to share the uncertainty or prediction of others and uh, jointly form a more accurate uh, understanding of others' behavior. And uh, so that they, within the first group, they can figure out a more efficient plan. And uh, in this way, it's actually solving the autonomous driving problem in a higher level where we have 
we combine all the connected vehicles into a large autonomous car. Although physically it's not an autonomous car, but in the planning problem, it, it can be uh, made as a joint decision problem. And then all the others is the surrounding environments, surrounding uh, like uh, participants, road participants that we need to predict for. Uh, does this answer your question? Yes, yes, that's uh, that's great. Um, yes, that's um, that's uh, yeah, that uh, and that is that's all our that's all our questions. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you very much uh, for that talk, and um, we look forward to seeing you at the um, at the panel after our next speaker. Well, cool. thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so our final speaker is Professor Shingbo Lee. Um, if you are there, Professor Shingbo, um, you, you can now start sharing sharing your screen. Um, so, uh, so Professor Shingbo Lee is an associate professor at um, Tsinghua University, uh, leading the Intelligent Driving Lab. Uh, his active interests, uh, research interests, include intelligent vehicles and driver assistance, reinforcement learning and optimal control uh, and distributed control for estimation. He's the author of over 100 peer reviewed journal co and conference papers and is the co-inventor of over 30 patents. Uh, Dr. Lee was the recipient of the Best Paper Award in the 2014 uh, IEEE ITS, uh, the Best Paper Award in the 14th uh, Asian ITS and also serves as the board of directors for the IEEE ITS Society. Uh, so his talk today is titled Distributional Soft Act Critic um, so thank you so much for joining us, and um, we look forward to your talk whenever you're ready. Hi everyone, can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine, and I and oh. we can see and we can see your slides. Okay, thank thank you very much for your introduction, and uh, and also and can you can you see my screen share screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Yep. Okay, so I, I'll start. So thank you very much for inviting me to join this workshop and uh, it's my great honor to be here. So my name is Shenbo and uh, today I want to give you a talk. The name is Distributional Soft Actor Critic for Reducing Overestimation. Basically, it's a theory about uh, reinforcement learning technology. Uh, before my talk, I, I'd like to introduce my lab at Tsinghua University first. So currently I'm leading a lab, the name is Intelligent Driving Lab, short as ID Lab. So we focus on advanced learning and control algorithms in the field of intelligent vehicles and also the driver assistance system design. So in order to get better intelligence, safety and fuel efficiency. So they are my current sponsors, thank them very much. And uh, this is about me. And uh, uh, my research interests include autonomous driving and vehicle automation, optimal control, reinforcement learning, and also distributed sensing learning and control. So, so I also uh, served as the associate editor of IEEE journals and, uh, and also the build of IEEE ITS society. So basically my lab is working on the interplanary uh, research of reinforcement learning and optimal control. So we apply the developed algorithm in decision making and also motion control of such autonomous systems like human machine copilot, autonomous driving systems, and also cooperated automation by the vehicle to vehicle communication. And uh, for the reinforcement learning, this is the major topic today. So we want to see, we focus on the algorithm design part, especially how to combine the model and label data together. And also uh, includes such topics like adversary learning into reinforcement learning and how to apply the parallel computation. So in vehicle size, this is the major topic we are working on. So, and uh, in the past few years, we have involved a few uh, autonomous vehicle prototyping car design, and these are the, they are the photos of them. So very short introduction about my lab. And now I will talk about you know, today's topic. So 
distributional soft active critic algorithm. So I'll start from the motivation. So we all know that autonomous vehicle need very high intelligence, especially in the decision making part. So this is because we have very strong road complexity, traffic dynamics, and also the road users have random behavior. Yes. So we want to know developed uh, intelligence which can conquer those issues. Reinforcement learning technology might be one solution. So this method is a bio-inspired artificial intelligence algorithm. So basically it mimics the human, uh, the, the animal's learning behavior. It can repeat behaviors that result in rewards and avoid behaviors that result in punishment. So in general, so this method can be applied in two, two ways. So one is offline training a policy and then online implement this policy. The second is we do both online training and online implementation. So we will mainly talk about the second part, which is a model free method. So if we look at the details or mathematics of reinforcement learning, it's, it has close relationship with optimal control. So basically, it aims to find an optimal policy that maximizes or minimizes a long-term reward while subjecting the these samples from interacting from the environment. So basically, this is the model free IO. And also, me, it's subject to the descriptive models of the environment. So basically, it's a model bit IO. Model based IO is very like optimal control theory. So, in mathematics, so we can unify the model free and the model based IO into one unified framework. So, this is to minimize this cost while subtracting a few constraints in order to get the optimal policy. Today, there are two ways to solve reinforcement learning. So we call it indirect method and direct method. So indirect method, basically it relies on sufficient and necessary optimality condition. So in continuous times, this condition is described as the Hamiltonian jacobi barham equation or just a barham equation in discrete time domain. So the optimal policy is actually the solution of these AGB or Berma equations. So we all know that we have two ways to solve this equation, either policy iteration or value iteration. The other method, we call it direct solutions. Basically, it search a, permit, a parameterized policy that can maximize or minimize an objective function. So the common method is called gradient descent technology. So, so we can repeat this process until we find the optimal. So the, these are the two ways we saw the reinforcement learning. And uh, this technology has achieved a few success in engineers. For example, here I list some of them, the so working man, assembly tasks, and uh, more advanced work like you know wear clothing and uh, pick up you know, a box uh, pick up pick up some parts in a dynamic platform so and also we can apply it into the field of end-to-end -end autonomous driving so this is the video we have uh, recorded in my lab to use reinforcement learning technology to to do that autonomous driving task. Basically, it works. But we also found a few challenges for this technology in engineers. One major challenge is the value function overestimation. So this is caused by two issues. So for example, the environment randomness or the sensor noise or the value function approximation errors. The occurrently happened outliers or, un, or update errors can cause the error be propagated through the Berman operator, which will cause the overestimated key value network. So finally, we make a very bad policy. So this is the reason. 
And how to conquer this reason has been investigated by many researchers in the past few years. So two, uh, I think the two famous, two famous solution is the double Q line and the clipped Q line. So the double Q line decouples the Q value into two network. So using one, use one network as the target, the other one as the trained value, which can uh, reduce this issue to some extent. And the other method actually solves the overestimation by introducing underestimation. So both of them may suffer from, still suffer from the overestimation issue. And also we want to see so the two methods actually introduce an additional neural network into the learning process, which may add a few uh, computing burden issue to the system. But in our study, my team have, has proposed a new method called distributional soft active critic algorithm. Basically, we combined the distributional idea with the soft active idea together. So in our study, we have found first the distributional return can effectively mitigate the Q value overestimation. This is the first finding. And based on this finding, we developed a distributional soft policy iteration framework, so which embedding the return distribution into the maximum entropy reinforcement learning. The finally, we propose an off-policy active critic algorithm, so-called DSAC, and which can directly learn a continuous return distribution by addressing the exploding or vanishing gradient problem. So this is the main contribution of this study. So I will explain the details in the following slides. So first, the basis of this method maximum entropy reinforcement learning. So we all know that the exploration efficiency is very important for the model-based reinforcement learning. And uh, so one way to increase the exploring efficiency is to use the random policy. And the high simple diversity can help improve the policy performance. So for example, here we have two figures. So the first one has good exploration. The second figure has bad or, or less, le, le, has worse exploration efficiency. But there's always a balance between better exploration and also the policy randomness. How to measure the policy randomness is one way, is one technology we need to use in IO. So, the policy entropy is a good measure of the policy randomness. And we can use this entropy to describe how large the policy is, is random and uh, combine it into the object function to reduce or increase the entropy in order to balance the randomness of policy with the exploring efficiency. So this is a basic idea. And uh, this method is called maximum entropy IO. Basically, so we add a policy entrum term into the objective function or directly into the reward function. And uh, so this reward includes the traditional return function and also a new policy entropy term. So using this way, we can convert the traditional Q value function into a soft version we call the soft Q value function. And also we also have the soft self-consistent condition and also soft Berman operator. So this is the basic idea of the maximum entropy IO. And then my GSAC algorithm actually based on this maximum entropy IO. So now let's talk, talk about you know, the GSAC. So the GSCC need to combine the distributional function into the maximum entropy IO. So first we need to define a distributional function. So what is distributional function? So here is the definition for the 
distribution of uh, function. So basically, we change a uh, fixed value to return into uh, a distribution of function. So it's kind of a new random var variable. And the, the expectation of this variable will become the traditional Q value. So this randomness change is reasonable because of no several reasons. First, the environment might be stochastic, right? And also the policy is stochastic. So in many engineers, uh, we select stochastic policy. And also sometimes we may have stochastic reward function. So anyway, so to define a random variable as a new return is a reasonable choice, which can also help to improve the performance of the learning. After we have the definition of the distributional uh, soft state action return, so we can have a distributional version of the self-consistent operator or the bare map operator. So here we showed the self-consistent operator in a distributional return format. Since we have the distributional Q value, so now we can easily design the reinforcement learning technology by using the policy gradient method. Policy gradient iteration actually have two steps. One is the policy variation. The second is policy improvement. So we can uh, reformulate the two steps by the distributional function and also the soft idea introduced in the maximum entropy IL. So we can also prove that so even though combined with distributional function, so the self-consistent operator is still a gum contraction mapping, so which means it can converge. And also, we can also prove the new policy improvement step is still hold the monotonic uh, increasing behavior, which means the overall algorithm can converge. Okay, so this is the basic idea behind the distributional uh, SEC. So now we want to improve why this method can reduce the overestimation. So let's give a short introduction. So we can roughly uh, derive the overestimation bias in this method if we can assume the policy randomness also and the other randomness uh, Gaussian distribution. So the final result is very interesting. So let's look at this equation. Here, the delta D is the admitted bias of, of the new method. The red delta is the bias of traditional Q value method. And we can see the two method actually has a factor that z squared. So this, this sigma z, sorry, is sigma z squared is the variance of the Q value function. It kind of has the ability to adjust in the update step of Q value. And also if we can select this coefficient always bigger than zero, so we can reduce the Q bias. So this is the idea behind why this new method can reduce the overestimation bias. And now let's look at you know, how to design a method which can combine with the deep neural network. So we can uh, design DSAC in the way of active critic and the critic the critic gradient is, uh, is, is, is to minimize uh, objective function, which can measure the distance between the, uh, new, uh, the new Q value and also the, the target Q value. So the gradient actually has two terms if you look at you know, the details. So we find in this new method, so both the two terms have 
the denominator of sigma theta term. So if, if the algorithm is not well selected or the parameter is not well selected, we may have the explored or vanishing gradient issue. So because sigma theta may go to zero or go to infinite. So this one challenge. So, and in the algorithm design, we need to keep this value into a reasonable range. For example, to clip the covariance or clip the target return. Using this way, we can avoid this issue. And also we can easily derive the actor, actor gradient. So shows in this equation. So basically, so we can convert the DSCC into the traditional active critic framework and to derive the critic gradient and act gradient and using the gradient design technology to update the neural network. And also we can combine it with the parallel updating framework, which can accurately know the training speed of this algorithm. So now let's talk about you know, the experiment ver verification to see the performance of this new algorithm. And here we select five continuous control tasks from Mujuka. So for example, the humanoid, ant, and uh, half theta, and walker, and also inverted double pendulum. So here, the S is the state. The number is the dimension of the state. So we can see uh, the first task has a very high state dimension and also a relative high actual dimension. So uh, we can see these five tasks has a good representative representation. And the selection of the neural network architecture. So we select relative similar neural network for the value approximation and also the policy approximation. So basically it's a five layers neural network, including the input layer and the output layer. So the, there are three hidden layers. So, and also, uh, so the, the, it's, it's a fully connected neural network. So here is the hyperparameters of the DSEC and uh, we can select those parameters very like the traditional SEC algorithm. So now let's look at the policy performance comparison of the DSAC and also other baseline methods. So here we selected six baseline methods, including the base version of SEC, double Q SEC, single Q SEC, TD4, TD3, and also DDPG as the baseline. And the blue, the blue line is the DSAC. So let's look at the first task. So the Y axis is the average return. So X axis is the iteration numbers in milli. And we can see basically the DSAC has the best performance among all the methods in comparison. And uh, we can see this kind of results in all other four tasks. So basically, so DSCC has relatively good policy performance. And if we look at the number of the average return, so we can also see the similar results. And also the variance of DSCC is not bad compared with other methods. And here we give a detailed uh, comparison with the SEC and the policy performance of the SEC performs better than SEC. So you can see almost you know, around 2000 uh, higher score in every return. So which means its performance is better. And now let's look at you know, the, the, the video we have recorded you know, to demonstrate the real behaviors in DSEC and SEC. And this is the humanoid, this is ant, this is the walking man. So uh, 
the behavior is similar, but if you look at you know, the details you will find, GSEC gives a relatively more reasonable working behavior than SEC. So which means this, this is also why its average term is better than SEC. And also let's compare the admission bias. So in the beginning, we, we said that, you know, admission bias is one reason that causes poor policy. So if the new method has a better admission bias, which also can prove that, you know, our analysis is right, is correct. And uh, let's look at this figure. And the zero error is the best line we should have if the admission has no bias, right? If, if the curl is larger than zero, it means we have the over admission. Otherwise, we have under admission. So we can see that all, among all the five algorithms, GSAC has the best, but all more close to the zero line, which means it has the smallest admission bias. So we can also see similar results in all other four tasks, even though some of them, some of them may not that obvious, but basically among all the five tasks, the DSAC has the smallest admission bias. This is why it has better policy. And also the, the, the last slide of this, uh, intro, this talk. So how many neural networks we should have in our algorithm design? So if you look at the traditional DSAC, because it has the double Q learning tips, we need totally have six neural network in our training process. But GSEC can reduce two neural network to the number of four, which means it should have better computing efficiency than SEC or all the algorithm with you know, higher number of neural network because the, the computing of neural network may cost a lot of you know, computing uh, time. So this is also the good side of DSAC. It has better time efficiency. Okay, so here, is, here uh, I list some recent publications in this field, including two papers, and we have put those papers into the archive and also uh, the, 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 the code in GitHub. So if you are interested, you can download it and try it. And also uh, recently I'm writing a new book, Reinforcement Learning and Control. And if you uh, want this book, you can also contact me. So we uh, want to uh, talk more about this book. And uh, thank you very much. My talk will end here. I'd like to take any questions. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Professor Shingo. Um, uh, so, so again, um, for anyone who's uh, just arrived, if you if you had any questions, uh, feel free to just enter them into the Zoom chat, um, and then uh, I will um, repeat them here for um, Professor Shingo to, um, to to be able to answer. Um, so we've got uh, we've got a few minutes before the panel um, starts. The panel is going to be our last event. Um, so we've got uh, we've got one question here. Uh, the first question is, uh, where do you see the application of deep reinforcement learning uh, within driving stacks of autonomous vehicles? So Pare, can you, can you repeat this question? I'm sorry. I... So excuse me. Oh yeah, did, did, should I repeat the question? Yes, yes, please. I oh, cannot yeah. hear it clearly. Sorry about the network. Oh, no, no problem. Um, so the first question is from Igor. Um, and the question is, where do you see the application of deep reinforcement learning within the driving stacks of autonomous vehicles? Oh, I see, okay. Uh, I, 
I, sh I, I should say to apply reinforcement learning technology in autonomous vehicle is a really challenge problem. And uh, there are several reasons. First, what IO technology is a model free based and we need the sampling data to, to train the policy. So how to get the sampling data? So we need to interact with the environment. Mm -hmm. So the interaction with the environment is a major challenge for real autonomous car. And this is one reason. And also we see that reinforcement learning, if, we, if it goes deeper, we need to combine it with neural network. And uh, it's, uh, it has very high computing efficiency requirement on the onboard controller, which may be a you know, bigger challenge than interaction with the environment. And uh, I have seen a few uh, universities and also research institutes working on this topic. Most of them still, working on, work, still work with virtual environment, like the car sim or the Mujuko uh, simulator or, or other simulator like the Prince game. So there's one company in UK. So they are working on reinforcement learning uh, application with the real cars, but the safety is a major challenge for this method. So I would like to see, so reinforcement learning is a good technology. It may succeed in the future for autonomous vehicle, but there are a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, actually, a question that I have is, uh, so uh, I come from, uh, I guess, a reinforcement learning background as well, and, and I, find oh, quite, great. <laughs> I, I find it quite interesting, like the combination of reinforcement learning with autonomous vehicles, but um, what one of the, um, I, I guess, one of the, uh, the clashes I've always found is, um, uh, you know, um, it, because it's such a safety critical system, um, you know, what, what can we say um, with respect to applying reinforcement learning uh, to autonomous vehicles? And is, and is there, uh, is, it, is, it, is it possible to come up with guarantees? Um, and, and sometimes, sometimes I think this is, this is hard, that with say distributional um, soft actor critic, do you think there's, there's a chance we could, we could give uh, maybe more probabilistic uh, guarantees or or confidences about um, the performance, the like the the performance, uh, say with you know reduced biases or 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 things like that to um, uh, um, to 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 kind of make uh, um, some some safety statements uh, in the application of autonomous vehicles. But very good comments. Can, can I give more information about these comments? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd like to repeat this figure again. And uh, so in my idea, I think reinforcement learning may have two kinds of new applications in autonomous vehicle. So one, it can serve as a numerical uh, solver for optimal control problem because we can actually combining, uh, combine the model-based reinforcement learning with optimal control and uh, to solve this problem by a neural network. And uh, using this way, we can kind uh, we can kind of reduce the online computing, computing burden of the optimal control problem. Because for example, MPC is very popular in many control field and we can, if we can, we can put the solution of MPC into a neural network and then, then deploy the neural network in a MCU or FPGE. So we can kind of you know, reduce the computing burden. So the other way to use reinforcement learning is to use its ability to do the exploration or the self-learning ability. So basically this we need to combine with the model free version of, of IO. So we can let the vehicle to do several different you know, behaviors and uh, to, to randomly explore the environment and then get the, the, the uh, get the better and get a better policy. So 
the, the, the either of them need to consider the safety issue. And uh, so for example, we don't want you know, the, the car in the traffic can have collision with other cars or, or, or some static object. So the safety issue is very challenging issue. So there are several methods now in can solve the safety issue problem, but still we have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee. Um, uh, so what, what I'll ask uh, for you to do now is if you could uh, stop sharing your screen, um, at, but, stay, but stay on the Zoom call and, uh, and we'll transition to our final uh, event for the day, which is uh, a panel. Um, so, so the panel today is going to be uh, moderated by uh, Dorsa. Uh, and uh, the way it's going to work is, is we have some offline questions that were pre-compiled, but we're really interested in audience questions as well. And so, uh, and so again, anyone that's uh, signing in um, to this call at the moment, if you have any questions for the panel, um, please enter them into the Zoom chat. Um, and then um, we will be looking at those as the um, uh, as the panel progresses with its uh, discussion. So uh, very happy to have um, a, a Dorsa to um, to moderate the panel. Um, but uh, for those that that have um, arrived midway through, uh, Dorsa is uh, an assistant professor um, in the computer science department and electrical engineering department at Stanford University. Um, her research interests lie at the intersection of robotics and machine learning and control theory. Uh, and her group works on efficient algorithms for safe, reliable, uh, and adaptive human, robot, and generally multi-agent um, interactions. And I think uh, most of our speakers will be at the panel. And so, uh, uh, um, Dorsa, whenever you're um, ready, um, feel free to feel free to take over. We'll, we'll make sure that um, all the participants are unmuted. Hey, everyone. Hello. Hello. Um, Hello. Dorsa is still muted. Dorsa, can you Dorsa, not? Sorry. <laughs> Dorsa, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry Dorsa. yes, yes, yes. There you go. Okay, I was like, I can't <laughs> unmute myself. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Okay, so we have we have I think most of the speakers here. So I think today our in our panel we have Anka Dragon, Charlie Tang, Elisa Pearson, Adrian Gaden, um, Chang Wu Lu, and Sheng Bo Li, who we just heard from. Uh, is everyone here? Can you guys hear me all well? Perfect. All right, so, so I think we have about half an hour, but we can go a little bit over if we, if, if we need to. And, and I was wondering if we could start off the panel with, with a few questions and then we'll open it to the audience and hear from the audience. And, and I, we were thinking the opening question could be something along the lines of, why don't we have autonomous driving yet? And, and um, I know you might be tired of this question. I remember like when I started working on this, like we were thinking you'll have autonomous cars by 2020 and, and we don't really have that yet. But if you were to pick like one major roadblock for not having autonomous cars today yet, what would that be and how would you go about it? And I'll just open this up to, to any of you guys. Did I pick on people? <laughs> do, do, do you want to design someone first, maybe? Because that way it's easier versus waiting politely. Sure, yeah. So, so I had this order on my list. How about we go in generally with this order? Anka, Charlie, Elisa, Adrian, Chang Wu, and Chang Wu. OK, but I don't always want to go first. But I'll go first now <laughs> and give the cop-out answer, which is which is people. People are hard. Like. Uh, uh, I would say that if you know, take a, take a really hard driving environment, like say San Francisco, because that's where I live and what, that's what I'm very familiar with, right? San Francisco downtown, um, and now you know, just you know, imagine that in your head, and then take away the the human driven vehicles, and take away the pedestrians, and take away the cyclists, and take away anyone on a motorcycle. 
And what's left is, is you, that's it done. We're done. You know, some people say, oh, but perception, this and that. And of course, like maybe, you know, snow, this and that, but like, no, 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 we're done. That would be done. Everything would be fine. Right. So I think what's hard about the problem is, is the coordination with people. Mm-hmm. But I'm biased because that's what I work on. <laughs> Can I can I have some some question for uh, some some answer for this question? And uh, so first, I want to say autonomous driving is amazing and it's the future of our road traffic. And uh, for me personally, I really like it. But when we talk about no autonomous vehicle, we need to divide divide it into several levels, like the SAE standard. So we have the level one, level two, until level level five. And for level one and level two, so basically we call it driver assistance system. It's it already commercialized in our market. So if you look at the autopilot of Tesla, you will see it's good. Basically, it's good. Even though, and the manufacturer said, okay, it's a driver assistance system. You cannot use it as a fully autonomous vehicle. But still, I think a lot of people want to try it, and it's very good. But when we talk about you know, high level autonomous vehicle, like the level four or even level five, the level five is our dream. So which means if the people can drive the car to somewhere and the autonomous vehicle must go that place, it's very challenging. So basically we, we think the challenge happens in three layers. First is the environment perception. Second is the decision making. That is the motion control. So envir- environment perception still is not perfect. It, it's very good, and uh, the, but still far from the perfectness. There are several reasons. One is the road users are very complex, and we have different road users. So if, if you come to China, if you drive a car in Beijing, you are saying, oh, that, that's horrible traffic. And, uh, and also the decision making. Decision making uh, is very challenging. And uh, now for the low level autonomous vehicle, we are saying, oh, decision is easy because we can design a road-based decision and uh, it seems we can apply it uh, successfully. So we can let the car, for example, go straight or do lane change overtaking without any problem. But if you want to put the car into the city road conditions, so for example, you have the mixed traffic flow and it should be very challenging. I think robot method does not work, right? We need to apply other methods. For example, reinforcement learning. Even though we haven't seen any success applications of this method, but it's the future of the decision making algorithm design. And the motion control, I think for the normal condition, it's okay and we can apply either PID or model product control method as the motion controller, it works very well. But still, we have a lot of you know, other challenges. For example, how to control a car in the handling limit. So because we know that in the low frequent road, so the car may drift out. And uh, some good drivers can adjust car, but uh, how can a uh, autonomous controller can do that like human driver? It's still a challenge problem for us to do. So some comments about this question. Still, I think we have a lot of work to do and in almost all tasks of autonomous driving. And it's good for researchers and maybe a better idea for the market. I, I agree. Actually, my, my talk was very much about that because I, I think, um, you know, Toyota and Tira in particular, we've been the most pessimistic about this. Uh, we, we started late on the autonomous driving, to be honest, because we thought it was very hard. Then when we started, the first thing we said, it's very hard and probably, you know, there's some Dunning-Kruger effect. Like everybody thinks it's easier than, than it really is. Um, and and it's funny because like now people are saying, yeah, it's actually really harder than we thought. And there was recently an interview with Gil Pratt, our CEO, where people said, hey, this guy, he said it was hard. Yeah, it's really hard. And actually, I agree with, with Anka. Um, I'll, I'll modulate this, though, by saying that I think the whole stack has open research problems, every part. Um, so I talked about the three R's and the three P's. That was my title. And this is like that perception. Perception, sure, is mostly solved, except in the long tail. And we know that it's kind of like 80%, 20% of the time to get to 
<laughs> right? And the follow up. So I think like robust perception, like perception is solved, sure. Robust perception, any condition, hmm, not so sure. Um, random, like prediction, prediction, probably the most open problem, right? And that's where I completely agree with Vanka, the human element, right? It's randomness, contingency, intent, multimodality, uncertainty, you name it. Um, planning too, planning too. I mean, for me, I, I don't know, I work with Udorsa, I work with a lot, a lot of very cool folks at Stanford on control and, you know, coming from the computer vision field and thinking control is solved, you know, some Russian guy in the 60s solved it. Uh, and then learning how wrong I was, uh, as always, <laughs> Benning Kruger again. Um, but in planning, there's just so many open problems, so many, many open problems, right? And, and, and then if you look at everything, and causality, I think, is one of the big ones. I mean, like, you know, safety is, a, is obviously another big one. But in particular, one of the conclusions I wanted to make in my talk about this, of why we're not there yet, is because, because there are problems everywhere and every abstraction is leaky, the whole system is just so far from working together in coordination uh, throughout. So we have like really good demos, like getting to a demo, people have been doing very successfully at this, like even back in 2009, you know, with Google, um, but making a product, uh, even in very restricted settings, it's difficult. So I think it's just much harder than everybody thought. The world is open, so that's hard. Oh, but no, Elon tells us that it's going to be done by the end of this year. So we're, we're actually good. Uh, I, I, wait, are we in 2016? Oh, no, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, also I have to yeah. say on this panel, I'm very much not a Waymo person. I'm very much just my normal UC Berkeley self. So don't take anything that I say as Waymo. <laughs> no, no, but no. It's, it's, it's good. I think optimism is good. You have to be optimistic, right? It's like Feynman, et cetera. Like you have to believe you can solve the problem, right? If you don't believe you can solve the problem, why are you even working on it? But, but going from, I believe I can solve the problem to the problem is solved. Like I'm, I'm this close repeatedly. Uh, there's a bit, of, a bit of a gap that some people are not comfortable with jumping over. So I guess building on that, and, and I want to think a little bit about some of the, some of the different approaches that we discussed today, right? Like we, we heard from, about like game theory ways of looking at driving. We heard Changlu's talk, we heard, we heard Anka's talk. We also heard uh, a lot more about like end-to-end -end types of ways of looking at uh, driving and, and more like reinforcement learning and, and different types of learning paradigms that one can use. And, and I don't want to ask the question of should we go model-based or data-driven, because I don't think that's, a, that's the right question to ask here. But I do want to ask this question that, in general, if you're designing your, your autonomous car like today, how do you think about integrating these different techniques? Like, not, like you might want to use like, a learning-based approach somewhere and, and a model-based approach somewhere else, but, but that introduces a bunch of problems, like as Adrian was saying, right? Like you're, you have these different modules and each one of them have their own issues and then they leak to each other. So how should we go about actually like integrating these different, different types, of, uh, types of approaches? Or, or should we like, I, I will ask that too, should we like take an end-to-end -end approach towards driving or should we take a very specific type of, type of model-based approach towards driving? Um, I was wondering if uh, Changli, do you have any thoughts on that maybe? Can start yeah, with you. yeah. So this is also a question I've like a lot. I've been thinking about for a long time. So in general, I would like to say for the um, like an autonomous system, an autonomous system or autonomous vehicle has uh, full stacks, and uh, if we are getting to the lower level or more physical level, we care more about the safety, and if we go upper level, we care more about the intelligence, and then this gave us a way to kind of leveraging the advantage of learning-based method and the advantage of control-based method because control-based method can usually provide us some sound guarantees against those uncertainties. So usually we tend to use more model-based approach in the low level to make sure that there's kind of a safeguard about the actions finally generated by the vehicle. And if we get into high level, there are a lot of difficult interaction problems to reason about for the autonomous vehicles. And the learning-based approach can help us distinguish those complicated patterns from data and to make sure our um, designed behavior of the vehicle can be uh, as uh, more human-like and uh, more natural and uh, more human-friendly. So this is one way. And also for end-to-end -end approach, I think I, I, although I'm not a big fan of end-to-end -end approach, but there's a lot of current work trying to make end-to-end -end approach more explainable. I think the, the major problem of end-to-end -end approach is that you cannot explain if something goes wrong. But if we can make end-to-end -end approach explainable, I don't see any problem with that. 
Yeah, so that's can my I, take. Can I, can I debate this? Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, so let's see. I mean, I think the issue. I wouldn't. I I think that if you have something that's not explainable, that's not a big deal at all. Like, who cares at the end of the day? Um, like explaining why it fails. I I'd say maybe maybe the thing that's related that 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 can be a problem is in a sense debuggability. So you want a system that you can test out and improve. And when your your main way of doing that is some form of uh, messing with the data, right? And you can't necessarily intervene in, in other ways, that's a problem. But I think that there's also ways to, to address that. What I worry with, so I think, so there's a few things that we should maybe have common ground on when it comes to terminology. So, um, you know, sometimes we make the distinction between end to end and sort of like non data driven. So is, is it like planning based or is it data driven? And to me, that's not really a distinction. It can be both data driven and planning based. And I think it should be both data driven <laughs> and planning based. Um, and, and then there's, there's, you know, sometimes so I heard uh, Lee talk about rule based, right? A control can be rule based. Well, when you write, when you have a policy merge out of doing optimal control, whether it's RL or planning or, or you know, whatever, however you set up, you know, ILQR, it's the car figures out what to do. You're not really providing it rules. Rules would be saying at this intersection, stop in this way and here do this and here do that. So I wanna very much differentiate between approaches that are based on either search or optimization and approaches that are based on rules because we tried rules back in the day and it didn't go very well because of course rules aren't very scalable, right? If you export systems were all about rules. Um, so I think we oftentimes say the you know, traditional stack or rule-based approaches, um, but I wanted to, to, to say, when you, know, when you run MCTS, right? And when you run ILQR, all of those have one thing in common, which is the car is figuring out what to do. Um, and, and so I think, so I, I want to draw that distinction too. So now kind of going back to Dorsa's original question, I'm not sure that it's really like, I wouldn't trust an end-to-end -end system to make high level decision. And I don't even necessarily know what, what that means because if it's end-to-end, -end, then presumably it, it shouldn't, it shouldn't make all, all, the whole decision. But I, but I wouldn't trust it to make end-to-end, -end. I, I wouldn't trust it to make high-level decisions about how to interact with people. I would, I would and, and similarly, I don't necessarily think that uh, like a planning-based approach or a control-based approach is the best one for the low level necessarily all the time. I mean, maybe the way I think about it is how can you, use the data in, in the best way, right? And one approach might be to trust these systems when they're in distribution and then rely on other methods when they're out of distribution, when you're worried about how this thing is gonna generalize. So that's one, one way to kind of slice and dice it. Maybe another way to slice and dice it is um, to say, I'm gonna learn a value function Right. And so that's going to be some do RL, I'm going to do whatever I'm going to do to learn a value function. And that's maybe going to drive me, but I'm going to online do until some horizon, do some form of search, some form of planning, some form of optimization um, so that locally I can, I can make, you know, safe decisions and so on, uh, which is like the alpha go approach. Right. So, so I think that there's a lot of space where you can marry data-driven approaches where the data comes from practice or it comes from imitation from seeing human, human data and marry them with uh, approaches that are either search or, or control or whatever your method of choice is. Yeah, and I also want to clarify the kind of end-to-end -end approach is not excluding all the kind of search and uh, uh, data or like uh, kind of structure within it the kind of end-to-end -end approach I was mentioning is that um, we cannot understand what is going on there. And we can, it's not easy to trickle um, the parts or debugability, trickle the parts to um, better fit our data. And in this way, that is not a desired approach. But if we can build more and more structures inside it, like uh, combining with search and uh, modeling based LQR, LQR stuff, that's definitely a good approach to marry the data-driven and the model-based world. And I think that's why it's so exciting because there's a lot of really cool work on, like a lot of it is optimization, right? When we do these kind of like two separate things, and it, 
and you can backprop through a lot of things. Actually, it turns out right. Yeah. Uh, and so gradient gradient based optimization is the is is the workhorse. So if you are doing an optimi an algorithm, let's say an optimization based algorithm, turns out like you can differentiate through MPC, right? Um, and so you can, uh, I really like this notion of structure, right? You can start to have an end-to-end -end but modular approach where every, you, 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 engineer, you engineer what you know, right? And you learn what you don't. Uh, this is a, a quote stolen from uh, Stefano Soato. I don't know, he maybe stole it from someone else, but I really like that. And so you basically put the structure and then you can backprop, you want the whole system to improve with demonstrations. That's something that I think is really important. Um, but, but if it's just a big CNN, then you have these problems that Changi was talking about. Uh, but it doesn't have to be now because we have the mechanics to basically like back prop through crazy things, ODs, whatever. So, so I just like to add something. I think uh, I think everyone, most everyone in the entire field is. I feel like in the recent years, especially, um, we're sort of converging on this kind of the the thing that Adrian just mentioned. Um, but one thing I think is missing that could be useful as a field in general, um, as a whole, is a really good metric. Um, you know, like something like ImageNet. Um, I feel like everyone has their own sort of way to evaluate, especially for um, different companies, um, different ways to evaluate, such as uh, miles per disengagement or whatever. Um, but it feels like, you know, if the entire field as a researcher, as a sort of industry, um, had a really good metric to really see how well we're doing, right, then you would clearly know where, where's the, the gap, right? Um, so I think that could be something that's, that's, that's going to be very useful. Now, is it going to be, um, would that actually happen? Um, I don't know, right? I mean, a lot of these things are proprietary, um, but I think the latest re push with the, the, you know, the different open data sets um, that are, folks are releasing, I think that's a, that, that's a good trend in the right direction. Any other thoughts? Elisa, do you have any thoughts on learning based versus yeah. Uh, so I think um, one of the things I like to think about with with this design, or, or maybe something that hasn't yet been been said, is also, you know, we, we talk about the design challenges with a single robot, but for autonomous driving, we eventually want to scale this to more than one car. And so, you know, you know, model based planning versus data driven. I think another important question with all of these approaches is how unique is your system to that specific vehicle or that specific environment? Um, and so I think whatever approach we take, we need to be cognizant of, does it transfer? Um, how can we transfer policies? How can we scale our learning approaches that when we have different cars in different places, um, collect and combine and translate the knowledge that they have? in a way that doesn't dilute or break the system. Makes a lot of sense. So, so building upon that, you guys didn't mention this really, but it kind of hints at this issue of safety and explainability. And, and there is a question from the audience and I kind of want to combine that with, with one of the questions that, that we already have. So the question from uh, the audience is from David, uh, David Connor. And what he's asking is, um, could we get away with like, not doing explanations like are regulators and lawyers at some point going to basically make us come up with explanations and and i think the question that i want to add on top of it sorry i'm asking like too many questions like at the same time but the question that i want to add on top of it is is this issue of in general safety and explainability um i think in general there's this question of should we use learning based systems when we are like making safety critical decisions and, and kind of like the bigger question for me is how much should we care about safety? I, I, this, this is the thing that I'm personally wondering like in general, when you think about autonomous driving, <laughs> like I, I personally started like thinking about safety very carefully and trying to like give probably correct guarantees about things. And over time, I'm personally thinking, I'm wondering basically if that is the right way of going about it or how much should we care about safety or are people going to accept these systems that are that might not be explainable or that might not be safe or and how much how much is that how much does that matter how much does that matter and how how much are regulators going to be happy with that how much should we be happy with that as engineers um so yeah general thoughts on safety and explainability so if i can uh maybe jump in first <laughs> uh 
so I think this goes back to what Charlie mentioned before about metrics, where I don't think the systems necessarily need to be explainable, but they need to have demonstrations that are convincing of their capabilities. So, and I think that's analogous to right now, if you look at like airbag safety uh, crash tests, um, manufacturers don't have to explain how their airbags work, but they perform the crash tests and they get a score. And if their systems pass the benchmarks that they have, then they're considered safe. And I think that finding those scenarios and finding those benchmarks to demonstrate a safe autonomous system is a very challenging problem in and of itself. But I think that if we can define that, we won't necessarily need a full explanation. What's particularly challenging- Can, about I, can I add something? So uh, I think you know, uh, people might have wrong understanding about you know, explain, explainability. So I guess most people uh, want explainability. So they want it like we want to you know the LQ method. So which means we want to explain how it works, how the, uh, the what is the mechanism behind you know, each method. But this is actually not, uh, I think, uh, reasonable or, uh, or, or accessible for autonomous vehicles. So let's look at you know, we human brain. So do you think we can explain how a human driver drive a car? So actually we cannot explain it, right? Because you know, our neural network is too complex. We have almost 80 billion neurons in our brain. And how does it work? And uh, what is its driving behavior or what is driving mechanism? We cannot explain it, but yeah, it works. I believe safety is a true issue. So we need to consider safety. And also I think people consider explainability because of safety. So if we can release the safety concern and the exp explainability, I think the, the problem will vanish, will, will disappear. For the safety, I want to give more information. So, first, so if you look at this autonomous vehicle or autonomous driving technology, it's far from the human behavior, you know, safety level. So, as a human, our average you know, collision rate is about one billion uh, driving miles around. We have, I remember, it's twenty, uh, it's two hundred or five hundred, you know, collisions. But if you look at you know the DMV data from California, we see the the best autonomous vehicle now in technology in, in today's market still has far low uh, uh, safety level than human drivers. So which means we need to increase the reliability of all different layers of technology, including environment perception, decision making, and also the motion control. So a, a short conclusion. So I believe explainability is a fake question. So if we can solve the issue of the safety, explainable becomes vanishing. So this is my comments about this question. I think explainability is a kind of a red herring because as, especially as it relates to safety, right? Um, because you, you don't, so what, so there's a, there's a, it's not that we think that planners are safe because we can explain them. Um, it's, it's, we think that planners are safe because if we test them in you know, a million scenarios and they work well, they pass those metrics that Charlie was talking about, then that gives us confidence that they work in other settings. And that, I think that's the challenge with establishing these metrics is that you know, they're, gonna be, they're gonna be tools that can do very well on those metrics, but you can't trust them to actually do well outside of that. There's a, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna clarify. And so, so I, I was basically, yeah, so I completely agree with that, but Think of it as two questions. I think it's a mistake, like putting and piggybacking on, on the on the audience questions. One is about explainability. Can we get away with that? And then the other question is like just purely about safety. Like, yeah. do we care about safety? Why? Why? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> why should we care about safety? Yeah. And this is, I mean, I feel like 
whatever your car does, it will have to be using data. It will have to be based on at the very, you know, if you want to use just pure planning, you're going to need a model of human behavior. And let me tell you, you're not going to write down that model and equations from scratch and go to town, right? You have to involve data for any, for, for us to even imagine that the system will be anywhere close to successful, right? You're going to involve data to at the very least model the world and then maybe leverage that model through planning or through learning or to whatever. Um, so when we talk about safety, whatever guarantees we think we have, they're under whatever assumptions our model is making, but those assumptions are wrong. And so, you know, if you want real safety, then you'd protect against the adversarial environment as control theorists do, but then cars never leave the garage. So the moment you step out into the real world, you, you, you are, you are, you, you, anything that you're saying about safety is under assumptions that, you know, which, and it's very useful, I think, to be able to clarify the, these assumptions, but let's not mistake those assumptions for reality. Let's not mistake the fact that we have safety guarantees under these assumptions that, you know, our cars are gonna, that we have those guarantees for, for the real world, right? They're only gonna be as, as good as the assumptions are. And so I think just because, you know, I was talking about people, and I agree with Adrian that it's, when I say people, I don't just mean prediction, I mean prediction and planning the whole enchilada all together. And I think that because they're involved and because <laughs> we can't have a perfect model of them, right? That we're gonna have to, th that's where the challenge comes. That's where what, that, that's the hard part that we're dealing with. And when it comes to safety, that's, that's that as well. And what worries me just to kind of finish my previous thought, um, you know, we heard from Melissa and from Charlie about, about developing metrics. And I think that I both think that that's useful and I also want to caution against that because I think that you can have, for instance, an end-to-end -end system can go to down to town on that and perform soup could crush that um, if you know about it ahead of time, right? The the worry that we have is what happens in this novel situation that's not part of the data that you've trained on, whether it was you know in your simulator or whatever imitation, whatever your method of choice is. What happens there? These you know I've heard this notion of let's have driving tests for autonomous cars that check safety. And the, the challenge with that is when I administer a driving test to a human, the fact that they detected this stop sign tells me that they'll detect stop signs in other <laughs> situations, right? I cannot trust that of a learned policy that went from pixels to like steering acceleration. I cannot say the same thing about that. And I think there lies the challenge of how to exactly develop these metrics in a way that we actually trust that they're representative of the actual performance of the system. Yeah, and you were mentioning, the question was mentioning lawyers. So beyond the technical questions, there's, and I think this is kind of like the, there's kind of this dawning realization on us uh, in machine learning these days that uh, it's not just a technical angle to the questions, it's also the sociological questions. So I think that question is uh, another side of the human element uh, that Anka is talking about. It, it's really a socio-technical question because what do people really want when they talk about explainability? It's right? something that people like feel. Some people feel really strongly about it and really want to do this. I think they just want understanding, right? And and the reason why they want to understand the system is because they want to delegate some of the decision. I mean, this is the topic of this workshop, right? They want to delegate some decision making to a robot, right? Um, and humans want to stay in the loop. Uh, I, I think like one of the things that you're right that we're working on is called this garden approach, where we're we're not talking about replacing the human, we're talking about augmenting the human. Eventually, we'll have autonomous cars and everything, but in the meantime, there's 1.35 million people that die every day, uh, every year on the road, right? Uh, thank God, not every day. Um, so, 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 how do you kind of it's a human interaction problem, right? Uh, how do you communicate decisions a machine would make to a human? Uh, its approach to risk taking. And, and make the human comfortable with letting the machine do that, potentially over distant time horizons, but potentially in real time, right? And, and, and there's the whole enchilada there, right? There's the UX element, there's the human factors, there's the, and there's the technical logical side of it. And, but there's also like the, the sociological one and the legal one as the question from the, the audience member. And I think that ultimately, like it's accountability you care about, right? And, and who takes responsibility? And when you, you think about human robot interaction, there is a decision that the human would like let the robot do it. And even if it lets the robot do it and it, it thinks the robot communicated clearly, if the robot messes up, the human might still say it's the robot's fault. And so ultimately it boils down, I think, to accountability is, is, is a really big, big question and that permeates the sociological and the technological issues there. So 
so we are running out of time very quickly. So I do want to just have a final final question, a final thought, and I, I would like to hear from everyone uh, about this. So I'll give you guys a little bit to think about it. So I think in general, when we think about autonomous driving and, and how we approach autonomous driving, we do use a lot of tools from robotics and reinforcement learning and machine learning to address problems that exist and, and game theory and control to address problems that exist in autonomous driving. The question I have is what can, what can the field of robotics, we're in a robotics conference now, what can the field of robotics learn from, from what we have done in autonomous driving over the past decade or so? So, so what are the lessons to learn uh, in general for, for robotics based on what we have seen in autonomous driving? Um, I, I think, um, to answer your question, I think the, um, it's a simple um, sentence, but I would say um, one lesson is the unreasonable um, effectiveness of data. Um, I think it's not just for um, self-driving, but I think that would also equally apply to, to sort of robotics applications as well. Um, you know, decades ahead. That's it. I mean, just use more data. And I mean, I think I think a lot of sort of uh, you know, in my experiences, but as also others um, in the past in related fields, is that um, as humans, smart people, educated folks, we like to design our own sort of um, inductive priors, that devices and priors into these these models, but um, a lot of stuff that other people are doing, like for example, opening AI with GPT-3, um, it's just lots of data um, might also figure out something similar. Um, so I think there's still lots of room to grow from that, that aspect, but you know, safety criticalness, um, model-based planning, I think that's something that's um, particular to our application. Also robotics is safety critical is, uh, is a key, key there. So I don't think it's just the same as generating awesome texts and paragraphs and chatbots and things like that, but but I do think that um, that where where you can leverage the data. General final thoughts are okay. It doesn't need to be left. I think I kind of a half answer, which is which is I mean maybe a, a kind of a personal thing for me. So I used to work in algorithms for interaction, but in manipulation, and. And then Dorsa convinced me to get into autonomous driving when I joined Berkeley and we started working on the game theoretic stuff together. And, um, and I, the, the reason I liked it so much is because all of the sudden I didn't have to hypothesize capability, physical functional capability, it was there and it all broke when it came to people. And so, you know, I guess the way I, I maybe say this is, is that a lesson, at least from my very narrow way of looking at the problem, is that you can go very far without taking, without putting the people into the equation. And it might seem to you like you're making great progress. And then you might develop these approaches that when it comes to solving the real problem, which includes the, the darn people, um, are, are just not, are not going to cut it. And so you kind of have to go, go back and then, and then think about how you're going to solve the problem again. Um, so I think that's, that's a lesson, but I loved what you said Dorsa too, about just a very interdisciplinary, like do whatever it takes to solve the problem is something that the driving community I think has really well. First of all, put it in the real world because you never know what's going to happen until you put it in the real world. And I think that's something that roboticists can embrace too. Right. Um, and a lot of them do. And then also just like whatever, whatever tool, that you, you know, whatever combination of tools makes sense, that's what's going to cut it. So it's not, you know, it's not, you know, I do this, so therefore I'm going to try to approach the problem in this way, but really thinking about what the right combo or what the right tool is without being too um, religious about it. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, for me, it's just like, I thought it was a very hard problem. I realized it's harder than I thought. And so I think that's kind of like the conclusion over these past 10 years is that in 2009 or even 2012, people thought they were there. Um, it's just hard. It's just really, really hard. So, and it takes a village, right? So the reason it's hard is because it's a full stack. It's very complex uh, from like, it's not just robotics. It's not just machine learning. You know, it's not a CNN that's gonna solve it. I believe in data, I'm a machine learning guy, but it's everything. And that's, that's the thing I learned the most in the last three years is that I, I just counted actually, I had 62 different collaborators in, in, in like three years, which is nuts. And I realized like, why? Like, am I just a social animal? And it's just no, because 
you know, when you collaborate in computer vision, you collaborate with like, you have a group of people, right? That you collaborate with, right? And you, you have your circle. Um, but when I joined and started in autonomous driving, suddenly my network exploded. And I collaborated with people like like you, with like like robotics, people that had the human interaction experience, people that had like hardware experience, people that had control experience. It's just insane the breadth of technical knowledge that you need to just be, you know, at the current state of the art, which doesn't work, which which is by no means salt. So 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 the current envelope of knowledge you need for autonomous driving is huge, and you need to go even beyond that. So it really takes a village. It's it's a, it's going to be a massive collaborative effort if we're ever going to get to uh, a real real solution uh, to this. Yeah, I totally agree with what has been said before, and also I want to add to one point. I think the autonomous driving is a very um, rich problem, which go beyond technology and which. In order to make it come true, we need to think about more ethics problems, more like economic problems, more um, politics and uh, societal problems. And uh, even, yeah, none of those problems are easy to solve as um, we as researchers developing codes or writing equations. And I think similar stuff can also happen in the robotics field. For example, if we want to bring a humanoid robot into the real world, the same thing can happen. We need to account for a lot of things. But this also gave us an opportunity to like, um, carefully look at the pain point of the market, where is the true needs are, and then modify the problem, and then develop technologies that can solve the pain points. And maybe this way can, it can allow us to avoid some unrealistic assumption or some truly difficult, relax some truly difficult problem using some constraints in the real world. For example, if we have communication, then a lot of prediction problems um, can be solved using communication in the autonomous driving. Yeah, so this actually enriches the problem a lot. And also we can bring this kind of uh, idea into the robotic research. I think, uh... If I can add, so I was, um, so I was a roboticist firmly in the multi-robot camp before jumping into autonomous driving over the past few years. And my background was working with little, you know, $100 three inch wide robots and trying to make a bunch of really stupid robots do smart things. <laughs> and autonomous driving is completely different because you have very, very complex, very, very uh, technically capable, smart hardware. And you just want to do it, make it do just what we think of as like a very stupid thing of just driving down the road. Um, but I think of, of what maybe roboticists can take away from this community is that to, to not be afraid to think of your problem as becoming much more complex than it is to not be afraid instead of just thinking of one tiny example of an environment with a limited number of in interactions and you're a controls person so we're just going to say perception is solved but to really integrate all of that into the solution and also get your software organization in order software management matters especially as your problem scales and the long tail is really long oh yeah long, it's a long road <laughs> <laughs> so I, I probably want to add add some uh, information. First, I think we need to be optimistic about autonomous driving. So so long as we can wait, finally we can get a you know, good autonomous driving system, right? And second, I want to say, so uh, I agree with people said that technology is stupid. And uh, what's the cleverest you know uh, things in this world is weak human brain, right? We need to turn our idea to, to turn our view to our human brain. So how does this brain work? And uh, how can we get a new idea from the brain working mechanism? Maybe it's a good way to, to put new technology into autonomous vehicle and the, this is my advice so. for this topic. All right, thank you so much. All great thoughts, great, great ideas. Um, it was really fun uh, doing this panel with you guys. So I'm going to just now thank you all and switch to uh, Rowan and Igor to take it away. Thank you, Tosh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, thank you for um, what a wonderful panelist panel, and I really enjoyed it a lot. And thank you very much for the, all the panelists for the wonderful discussion. And also thank you very much, Dorsa, for moderating the panel. Um, so that can actually be the perfect ending of this workshop. But just before we go, I would like to announce one last scheduled item, which is a little bit surprising schedule, which is the Best Paper Award. Uh, we have uh, actually accepted many good contributions. Uh, among them, we selected one best paper, uh, which is, uh, let me present it. I think I need to present it to show them, yeah. Um, okay, the best paper is a robust stochastic Bayesian game for behavior space coverage. The authors are Julian Bahad and Alos Connell. Congratulations to the authors. And the prize for the best paper is one Titan RTX. It's sponsored by NVIDIA Corporation. Thank you very much for sponsoring us. And uh, I would like to mention that all the recorded talks in the workshop uh, will be posted online on the workshop website. So please stay tuned and we will post that. Um, so before we go, I would like to again, thank to our, thank all our speakers for your wonderful talks and discussions and thank all the authors for your contribution work. And also thanks for the audience for your participation. So enjoy the rest of the day. Bye.